World's Terminal. Written by Tony Cole. Read by Matthew Graham Johnston. Chapter 1 Nuclear war had long been considered the most menacing and catastrophic threat to humanity. The destructive power of nuclear weapons, with their capacity to annihilate entire cities in the blink of an eye, had cast a shadow over the world for decades. The Cold War era had brought the world to the brink of mutually assured destruction, and even after that tense period had passed, the spectre of nuclear war continued to loom large. The potential for miscalculation, accident, or the actions of rogue states and terrorist organizations made the threat ever-present. The knowledge that a single conflict could escalate into a global catastrophe was a constant reminder of the perilous balance between nations armed with nuclear arsenals. In the mid-Atlantic, on the divided utopian nation of Starnia, the threat of nuclear war was compounded by a brutal civil conflict that had engulfed the region. The authoritarian fascist government, led by a ruthless regime, waged a brutal war against the democratic and socialist-leaning general population. The regime employed torture, suppression of dissent, and propaganda to maintain its grip on power, leading to widespread suffering and unrest. Amidst this turmoil, the democratic nation of Antnia, the largest military power in Utopia, couldn't stand idly by. They recognized the moral imperative to intervene on behalf of the oppressed and to prevent the Stanian government from further consolidating its authoritarian rule. Antnia clandestinely provided support to the rebels, offering training, weaponry, and intelligence. Their involvement turned the tide of the conflict transforming it into a brutal and protracted struggle that neither side could decisively win. As the war ground on and the rebel forces fought tenaciously, the Stanian government grew increasingly desperate and paranoid. They saw the shadow of defeat looming and became convinced that external intervention was thwarting their dominance. This paranoia heightened their sense of vulnerability and raised concerns that they might resort to desperate measures to secure their grip on power. Antnia, fully aware of the stakes, began preparations for the worst-case scenario, the possibility of a desperate Stanian regime unleashing nuclear weapons to ensure their survival. The prospect of nuclear conflict was an ever-looming nightmare, and Antony and Brass knew that they had to be ready to defend freedom and prevent the unimaginable horrors that a nuclear war could unleash on the world. Enter. World's Terminal. Deep within the shroud of secrecy that often surrounded the Antony and military, there existed a covert installation known only to a select few. This hidden fortress of power bore the enigmatic name World's Terminal. Its very existence was a closely guarded secret, concealed from the prying eyes of the international community and even against an agreement made with the oppressive Stanian regime. World's Terminal's clandestine location was a testament to the lengths to which Antnia was willing to go to protect its interests and ensure the survival of democracy. Situated on the remote island of Phoenix, nestled near the southern tip of Stanian soil, this military stronghold remained hidden in plain sight. The island's unassuming appearance masked the incredible significance of what lay beneath its surface. The name World's Terminal held a grim secret, known only to those entrusted with its operation. In the event that the Sternian regime chose to unleash nuclear devastation upon its own people, or, even worse, against the Antnian population, World's Terminal harbored a chilling capability. It possessed ballistic nuclear missiles, poised and ready to launch at a moment's notice. The Hammerstone nuclear missile, a formidable weapon shrouded in both reverence and dread, bore the name of one of Antnia's national heroes and its 14th president, James Frederick Hammerstone. The missile's technical specifications were closely guarded secrets, but it shared some similarities with the Iskander missiles, known for their exceptional speed, precision, and evasive capabilities. This state-of-the-art weapon symbolized both Antnia's determination to protect its democratic values 
and its commitment to ensuring that the spectre of nuclear war remained a nightmare never realized. That being said, while these missiles were not designed for offense, they were designed for a swift and decisive response, a decisive ending. The true terror of World's Terminal lay in the fact that these missiles could reach known Stanian nuclear launch sites within seconds of receiving the order. The installation served as an unyielding deterrent, a stark reminder to the Stanian regime that any aggressive act involving nuclear weapons would bring swift and overwhelming consequences. World's Terminal, shrouded in mystery and concealed in silence, represented the darkest and most guarded secret in the ongoing struggle between democracy and authoritarianism. Its very existence was a sobering reminder of the lengths to which nations would go to protect themselves and ensure the safety of their citizens in a world where the threat of nuclear annihilation always loomed on the horizon. World's Terminal had been meticulously designed to be an impregnable fortress, a bastion of security hidden beneath the waves of secrecy. Its very existence was a well-guarded secret, and entry into the base was a Herculean task for anyone without the highest levels of authorization. The architects of World's Terminal had left no stone unturned in their quest for security. The island of Phoenix, the clandestine base's home, was naturally fortified by the unforgiving terrain that surrounded it. Steep cliffs rose on all sides, except for a very well-guarded small harbour that served as the only point of entry. This harbour was fortified with state-of-the-art surveillance equipment, patrolled by vigilant guards most employed within Antnian special forces, and booby-trapped with hidden underwater defences, making any approach by sea a perilous endeavour. Access to the island by air was equally challenging. The skies above Finis were monitored around the clock, with anti-aircraft defences ready to thwart any unauthorised aircraft. The island's geography and the surrounding ocean currents further discouraged any unsanctioned approach, making it a nearly insurmountable obstacle. World's Terminal's underground facility was a labyrinth of secured chambers and high-tech security measures. Biometric scanners, access codes and retina scans were just a few of the layers of protection guarding the secrets hidden within. Intrusion detection systems were placed throughout the facility, ready to alert security personnel at the slightest sign of unauthorized access. For years, those tasked with maintaining the secrecy of World's Terminal believed it to be impenetrable. The combination of natural barriers, fortified defences and cutting-edge security measures had created a nearly impenetrable fortress, one that seemed impervious to external threats. But one threat remained, the powers of evil and their will to cause havoc. Unforeseen havoc. Corporal Justin Danvers had always been a man of simple pleasures and steadfast loyalties. As he sat in the dimly lit control room of the nuclear warhead facility, his dark, near-greasy undercut and quite boyish facial features often started to dip towards the keyboards as his mind often wandered to the things that meant the most to him. Today, it was ice hockey, the sport that had been his and most other Antonians passion since childhood. In his daydreams, Danvers saw himself gliding gracefully across the ice, donning the familiar blue and yellow jersey of his beloved hometown team, the Dixon Rangers. His heart swelled with pride at the thought of playing for them, and even more so when he imagined donning a green and silver different from his uniform. Wearing the jersey of the Antonian national team, representing his country on the international stage, was every Antnian child's dream. Danvers's fellow technicians, though they understood the importance of his job in this high-stakes environment, couldn't help but feel a sense of empathy. They knew the burden he carried back in the town near the military base, his infant child who couldn't sleep, and a wife who couldn't stop talking about it. So they kind of shrugged and turned their heads. Ice hockey had been more than just a game to Danvers, it was a connection to his rural hometown, where the winters were long and harsh, and the frozen lakes were transformed into makeshift rinks. It was there that he had learned to skate, to handle a puck with finesse, 
and to score goals that made the town cheer as one. But fate had intervened, and a devastating injury had shattered his dreams of a professional career on the ice. His leg had been broken in fourteen places, as he often added, and his aspirations dashed. Yet Danvers had chosen to channel his boundless national pride and his love for his country in a different way, by serving in the military, safeguarding Antnea's interests and protecting its democratic values. As he monitored the controls and alarms, Danvers' thoughts flitted between his day job and his dreams of hockey glory. The tension of his responsibilities weighed heavily on his shoulders, but he remained resolute in his commitment, driven by his love for ice hockey, his roots in a small rural town, and the unshakable national pride that defined his very being. Danvers sunk deeper into his daydream. The world of ice hockey beckoned him with a siren's call, and he found himself transported to a scenario that felt as real as the controls before him were surreal. Danvers stood on the ice of the Utopian Championship's final game. The stakes were monumental, with the pride of his nation hanging in the balance. Five. Five. Against their fierce rivals, Ossington and the game had ventured into three-on-three -three overtime. Every heartbeat thundered in Danvers's chest as he carried the weight of his nation's hopes on his shoulders. The roar of the crowd echoed in his ears, a deafening symphony of anticipation. The icy arena was alive with energy, and he could feel the electric charge in the air. As the seconds ticked away, Danvers seized a fleeting opportunity. As he saw the red jersey of an Ossingtonian approach, he decided to put his name in the headlines. A swift tackle took the red blaze down, and Danvers found himself with possession of the puck. Suddenly, realization struck him. Between him and the goalkeeper was but empty space. Dangle, no dangle. No, not today, he thought to himself. With lightning speed and unwavering precision, he unleashed a shotgun-like slap shot that sent the puck soaring into the net. Time seemed to freeze as the goal light blazed to life, bathing the arena in a fiery red glow. The crowd erupted into ecstatic cheers, their voices merging into a deafening crescendo. The sheer intensity of the moment was overwhelming. Danvers' heart raced, his ears ringing from the euphoria and adulation of the crowd. He had scored the winning goal, and oh, what a goal it was, etching his name in the annals of utopian hockey history. But then, in a jarring instant, reality tore through the fabric of his dream. Justin's eyes snapped open, only to be met with the same red that covered the arena. The same deafening goal horn still blared through the air, but it wasn't a goal horn, no, not at all. All alarms of the control room had gone off. Danvers tried to make sense of the situation, just as the other lightly manned staff on duty at 6pm on a Wednesday night. Red warning lights flashed and klaxons wailed their urgent cries. Danvers's heart raced as he frantically scanned the monitors, searching for the source of the disturbance. No specific button or area on the digital facility map was blinking. They all did. There was one protocol all military personnel, despite nationality, rank, and political stance, followed. Never bother your commanding officer without proper reasoning. But if Danvers ever was sure of his reasoning, it was now. He jumped up from his swivel chair and walked to the table in the middle of the room where a dial phone stood. Old school, but secure. Without a shadow of doubt, Danvers grabbed it and dialed the only number it knew. Colonel Frank Huganaga occupied one of the most powerful positions in the world as the commanding officer of World's Terminal. He, nearly literally, had his hand on a button that could decide the fate of nations in the flip of a switch. His office reflected the disciplined nature this job required, with meticulously organized files and a spotless desk. An antique globe stood on a polished wooden stand, a reminder of the global implications of his role. A crystal decanter of Harwood's Antonian whiskey and a couple of glasses sat on a small table in the corner, a testament to his penchant for a stiff drink when the weight of his responsibilities became too much to bear. A glass was in his hand too, of course. It often was on challenging days, which was most days, 
and that day had been particularly challenging for Colonel Hugenagger. He gazed at his reflection from the glass. Years hadn't done him much good. Hugenagger was a man in his mid-forties, but looked five, if not ten years older. His body was in great condition, but this barely showed on his face. Yet, genetics had given him a few redeeming qualities. Like his father, his hair was light as a cornfield. It framed his rugged features, and a meticulously maintained but genetically achieved luscious moustache added an air of authority and gravitas to his appearance. It didn't help with his struggles, however. He sat at his desk, torn between the stack of expense reports that demanded his attention and the nagging urge to call Derek again. His spouse had fled to the mainland. Officially, Derek was seeking safety from the ever-present threat of the Stanian regime, and the worry for his well-being gnawed at the colonel's conscience. Less officially, seeking safety from Hugenagger's ever-rising frequency of opening, said Decanter. In the midst of this internal struggle, a distant alarm began to wail, faint but unmistakable. It was a sound that Hugenagger had hoped never to hear. His heart sank as he realized that the nightmare scenario they had all feared might have become a horrifying reality. The shrill ringing of the telephone on his desk cut through the air, jolting him from his thoughts. He picked up the receiver, his voice commanding and stern as he prepared for the incoming call. Colonel Hugenagger, came the frantic voice on the other end of the line, a voice that he immediately recognized as Corporal Danvers. The corporal's attempt to maintain composure was palpable, but the urgency in his tone was impossible to miss. Corporal Danvers report, Colonel Hugenagger ordered, his voice unwavering as he demanded information. Sir, something's gone wrong, Danvers said, his words rushed. All the alarms are going off and... Why? I wish I could tell you, sir, but... But what? I don't know, sir, everything's red. Where was the alarm triggered? Everywhere, sir. Hugenagger's mind raced, and he knew that they were facing a crisis of unprecedented proportions. He ended the call quickly as swiftly as it began. As the phone clicked back into its cradle, Colonel Hugenagger allowed himself just a moment to consider the grim possibilities that raced through his mind. The world teetered on the brink, and the consequences of what had just occurred were too dire to fathom. Or they could. It could be a false alarm. Hugenagger had a thought of relief. What was the likelihood of all the alarms going off at once with no clear source? Near zero. A technical glitch, perhaps. Not perhaps. Likely just that. But what if not? With determination in his eyes, Hugenagger picked up the phone. Within a mere minute of the urgent call and order of action from Colonel Hugenagger, the commanding security officer of the shift, and the vice chief of the world's terminal security detail, Captain Sean Rush had rallied his elite team of 16 guards, all seasoned special forces operators, to the armory. The atmosphere was charged with tension as they swiftly geared up, donning their specialized equipment, checking weapons, and ensuring every detail was in place. Standing tall and broad with a beard that bore the unspoken mark of a special operator in the army, Rush secured his trusted HK, 416 assault rifle, with his curly hair flowing. In contrast, his mindset was unwavering. Whatever faced them, he was ready to face it. Yet, while it was perfectly possible the alarms were a malfunction, as Colonel Hugenagger had reasoned, Rush had fears. Dark fears. Captain Rush had spent six tours in the battlefields of Stania, an experience that had etched a deep understanding of the people and the complex dynamics of the region. He knew that beneath the surface, the Stanian people were kind and loving, but their so-called leaders were driven by greed and paranoia. And for that, Rush had no doubt that the Stanian regime was capable of orchestrating a saboteur's attempt, even against the impregnable fortress of World's Terminal. And if one like such was successful, only God themselves knows what would happen next. His unyielding determination to protect his nation and his unwavering commitment to his team greatly surpassed his fears, however, ready to confront whatever threat lurked within their secure sanctuary. Rush looked around the armory and saw the men started to be ready. 
All right, listen up. This is not a drill. I'm not going to tell you that we're under attack, because we don't know if we are, but treat this as if it was so. We start from the missile silos, but I need you to sweep every pantry, doghouse and greenhouse. Island police have been alerted to search the perimeter around the facility, but if we have intruders inside the facility, we've got to find them. Don't shoot to kill, because if we do find someone, I'm sure the colonel's got a crapload of great questions for them, Rush stated, and looked around the room again at the special operators in their all-black gear and rifles. His men looked ready and understanding. He didn't need to ask if they heard or understood him. He trusted them all with his life. All right, let's go. They left the armory, splitting up according to a pre-made and pre-rehearsed sweeping plan. Simultaneously, they swept the facility, starting from the sacred missile silos and ending in the darkest corner of a ground floor broom closet, and found nothing, absolutely nothing. Chapter 2 Van Riek Romeo Archer of the Antnean Army gazed out of the cockpit window of the gunship ADS Cromwell as it approached the shadowy silhouette of the island of Phoenix. The journey had been swift, but the events leading up to it were a whirlwind of confusion and secrecy. Three days earlier, he had been in a far different place. Archer had woken up next to his girlfriend, Halaya, in her cosy downtown Nicholson apartment, their lives filled with plans and dreams. Their near-future plans and dreams mainly consisted of spending Archer's day off from the Department of Defense Technologies by testing lattes before moving on to practicing for a baby neither of them wanted. It had been a simple phone call that had shattered their ambitious plans. Archer's commanding officer, Captain Rogers, had been on the line, his voice tense and clipped. In a matter of minutes, he had delivered the news that Archer's current post was terminated and his services were urgently needed elsewhere. With no explanation, Captain Rogers had swiftly transferred the call to a high-ranking figure, Colonel Huganaga. Archer had heard whispers about the Colonel's involvement with Ant Nia's nuclear defence system, but nothing solid. Just a mysterious and shadowy domain that few understood. As Archer had spoken to Colonel Huganaga, the urgency in the Colonel's voice had been palpable. He had been given orders that left no room for hesitation, no opportunity for questions. Leave immediately. Be here in three days. Here, as in the island of Phoenix, which housed a facility Archer had heard referred to as World's Terminal, whatever the hell ever that was. Now, aboard the ADS Cromwell, as the island loomed closer, Archer couldn't help but wonder about the enigmatic mission that had upended his life in a matter of days. With a whirlwind of thoughts racing through his mind, Archer leaned over the rail of the gunship, gazing down at his reflection in the restless waves that slapped against the hull. His physique, reminiscent of a sprinter, boasted an average height that didn't draw undue attention. The southern Atlantic ocean breeze tousled his curly but short auburn hair, and the wind's touch made his freshly shaved face tingle. Having had to dress in an uncomfortable navy blue suit and shirt out of sheer necessity and no knowledge of expectations, Archer felt out of place, an incongruity in his surroundings. He had no clear idea of what lay ahead and how his current role as a researcher at the Department of Defense Technologies had led him here. As Archer continued to peer at the approaching island of Phoenix, its imposing cliffs jutting out of the ocean like unyielding sentinels, he couldn't help but wonder how he, although certainly armed with specialised knowledge, could contribute to the protection of a place that was already considered impenetrable. Most of his work had revolved around studying and researching ways to protect high-value targets, sure, but beyond that, he was left with mere speculation. Colonel Huganaga, on the other hand, was acutely aware of why he needed Archer's specialised services. Even after Captain Rush's report had indicated no signs of intruders or saboteurs, and technicians, including Corporal Danvers, attributed the alarms to a mere glitch, the Colonel couldn't afford to leave anything to chance. He had a profound understanding of the critical importance of World's Terminal and the devastating consequences of any lapse in security. 
Huganaga's decision to bring in Archer had been a calculated one. He had reached out to his network of peers and colleagues, respected individuals with whom he had crossed paths during his long and storied career. When he posed the question of who would be the best suited specialist to ensure the safety of the world's terminal, there had been a resounding consensus among those he consulted. All had one name at the forefront of their minds, Van Riek Romeo Archer. After said phone calls, Colonel Huganaga had sat in his office, hardwood whiskey in one hand and the file of Van Riek Archer in the other. He had perused its contents multiple times, scrutinizing the reports that spoke of Archer's devil-may-care attitude and the perception that he had been relegated to a pencil-pushing job at the age of. The truth, however, was that Archer had already made significant sacrifices and contributions to his country. The file was a testament to Archer's impressive service record. Medals and commendations, including the prestigious Medal of Valor, adorned his chest, awarded by high-ranking officials who had recognized his exceptional bravery and dedication. Huganagher couldn't care less about whether Archer was a lone wolf. He had been one himself during his own storied career. What mattered most was Archer's unparalleled experience and track record. Four tours in the perilous battlegrounds of Stania, under the ranks of the Long Distance Ranger Detachment, with 24 confirmed kills to his name, had honed Archer into a formidable close combat specialist. Yet, it was a particular mission that had piqued Colonel Huganaga's interest. Archer had once managed to penetrate a thought-impenetrable bedrock-dug Stanian weapons laboratory on the outskirts of Nilberg emerging with the blueprints of a nerve agent that the Stanian regime had been developing. The how and why behind Archer's successful mission, as well as the knowledge of how to prevent such infiltrations in the future, were invaluable pieces of the puzzle. In the context of the potential threat to World's Terminal, this unique expertise could prove to be the linchpin in safeguarding the facility and the global stability it represented. The ADS Cromwell docked by the single pier in Finnis's harbour. The sailors didn't even bother tying it down. One just held it in place with his foot while Archer stepped off with his single suitcase. The sailors saluted him, gave him a nod and went on their way. Just like that, Archer was left alone on the pier. For a brief second, he just took in the air. At least it was fresh. Other than that, his initial impression was far from awe-inspiring. The island appeared to be a humble fishing town, nestled by the tranquil southern Atlantic. Archer grabbed his suitcase and headed towards a small office, more like a vendor stall at the end of the docks. Just then, Archer's first encounter with the island's character came in the form of a stubborn passport inspector. Passport, please? I'm expected. Romeo Archer. Antonian Army. Yes, sir, I'm aware, but I need to see your passport, the inspector said. He offered his thick hand and smiled uninvitingly under his dark moustache. Archer shrugged his shoulders, grabbed his passport from his pocket and handed it over. The inspector grabbed it like it was hot and slammed it on his table. Beyond all expectations, instead of giving it a good stamp and a warm welcome, the man sat on his bottom, turned to his computer and started clicking away. Excuse me, Archer said after a while. As I said, I'm being expected. Just a moment, the inspector said. Archer stared down at his watch, as if it'd make it go faster. But no matter how hard he stared, at the watch or at the man inspecting his passport, the man seemed determined to prolong Archer's torture his scepticism etched on his weathered face. Their standoff persisted, with Archer's patience wearing thin by the minute. He couldn't help but feel unimpressed by the mundane facade of the place, especially considering the cryptic nature of his mission. After what seemed like an eternity, the inspector turned back to Archer and handed him his passport back through the gap in the stall's plexiglass. Here you go, Van Riek Archer. Sorry for the wait. You probably understand why we can't rush things around here, the man said. Archer really didn't know, but something told him he was about to. The man's hospitality did make Archer nearly forgive him for his stalling, but not forget the first impression of the town. 
I've been instructed to give you this, the man said, and reached for something under his desk. For a split second, Archer's lizard brain activated, and he reached for his own pocket. His logical side then stepped in, however, reminding him of how unlikely it was to get shot at the entry stall of a fishing town by a man serving the same interests as yourself. Probably. The man handed Archer a key and a piece of paper. He took a quick glance, a simple address. To Archer's accommodation, he assumed. He didn't know what sort of shack to expect. He could just hope for very few thermites. Bidding farewell to the passport instructor, Archer headed into the town of Finnis, pulling his suitcase behind him. Archer trudged along the uneven and worn rocky pavement of Finnish, pulling his battered suitcase behind him with an exasperated sigh. The rhythmic clinking of the suitcase wheels against the cavities in the road seemed to echo his growing irritation. The sun hung low in the sky, casting long shadows that danced around him as he walked, but it did little to alleviate his sour mood. As he approached the town, Archer couldn't help but feel a sense of disappointment wash over him. Finnis appeared to be a lifeless, lacklustre place, with its faded facades and peeling paint, the closely built buildings, more like fishing shacks, seemingly trapped in a time long past, exuded an air of melancholy that mirrored Archer's own feelings. It was as though the town had been forgotten by the world, left to decay in solitude, but not quite. There was something alarmingly lively about the town. Archer's keen eye quickly picked up on the unusual aspect that set Feeney apart from any other sleepy town he had passed through on his journeys. There was a conspicuous military presence here, and it was impossible to overlook. Off-duty soldiers roamed the streets, easily distinguishable by their well-worn uniforms and the unmistakable aura of discipline that surrounded them. He watched them from the corner of his eye, noting the subtle tension in their postures. They didn't seem like the relaxed, carefree individuals one might expect during off-duty hours. Instead, they moved with a purpose, their eyes constantly scanning their surroundings as if anticipating trouble at any moment. The contrast between the sombre town and the ever-watchful soldiers added an unsettling layer of intrigue to Archer's already weary state of mind. Archer continued to pull his stubborn suitcase along the rocky path, a growing sense of unease gnawing at the edges of his consciousness. Finnis was far from the quaint, quiet town he had expected. Something was amiss here, something hidden beneath the surface of this seemingly ordinary place and Archer couldn't shake the feeling that he had stumbled into a situation far more complicated than he had ever imagined. His keen eye caught a notable sight, a road that stood out starkly from the rest of the town's uneven rocky pavements. This particular road was conspicuously well-maintained, with a smooth surface of asphalt that contrasted sharply with the rough terrain around it. The road, noticeably larger and more substantial than the narrow lanes of the town's small downtown area, appeared to be a path leading out of the heart of Phoenix. Archer couldn't help but be intrigued by this anomaly. He considered that if there was indeed something related to nuclear warfare and the enigmatic task that the respected Colonel Huganaga had summoned him for, it would likely be found at the other end of this road, which seemed to stretch towards the far reaches of the island. The asphalt road beckoned with a promise of answers, leading Archer to wonder what secrets lay beyond the town's facade and where this unexpected path might ultimately lead him. Before setting out to explore the road and what in the blue hell he was there for, Archer knew he had to get himself settled in the town. He continued walking in a direction that felt as though it would lead him toward the address he had been provided even though he had no real sense of where he was going in this unfamiliar place. As he traversed the town streets, Archer couldn't help but feel conspicuous in his fancy suit. The uniformed soldiers and the raggedy villagers, a mix of fishermen and grandmothers, cast curious glances in his direction. It was clear that his attire stood out amidst the more humble surroundings. With each passing moment, Archer became increasingly determined to rid himself of the ill-fitting suit as soon as possible. 
He knew that the first order of business in his new, enigmatic home would be to change into something more practical and inconspicuous, a step that would allow him to blend in with the unfamiliar surroundings and focus on the task at hand. After passing by a rather uninviting church and a sombre but green and grassy cemetery, Archer's journey through the town of Finnis took an unexpected turn. He found himself in a part of town that offered a welcome surprise, a sense of improvement and a slightly more pleasant atmosphere. It was almost like a suburb, with the shacks being a bit larger and painted in brighter, more cheerful colours. The view from this vantage point was undoubtedly one of the best things Archer had encountered in Phoenix. The vast expanse of the ocean stretched out in every direction, offering a stunning panorama that was both soothing and awe-inspiring. As he continued along the path towards the address he had been given, Archer couldn't help but feel another positive surprise awaiting him. Arriving at the house bearing the same number as the address, he was struck by the impressive sight before him. It was a fine house, standing proudly in what appeared to be the best part of town. Archer couldn't ignore the fact that someone had gone to great lengths to ensure his comfort and enjoyment during his stay. The incongruity between the town's initial impression and the quality of the house left him with a lingering sense of mystery and intrigue. A place like this, and a man like him, why? Something weird was going on, and in Archer's business, something weird usually meant something bad. With the key provided, Archer opened the door and stepped inside the house. What greeted him within was a modest but comfortable interior. While it may not have been the epitome of suburban luxury, it was a reassuring sight, and he couldn't help but feel a surge of relief. The living space was well kept, with clean furnishings and a welcoming atmosphere. A cosy sofa sat against one wall, and a small dining area with a table and chairs occupied another corner. The decor was simple, yet functional, and Archer was thankful to find no bunk beds or any signs of local village idiots to share them with as he had started to fear. Archer opened his suitcase, quickly shedding the fancy suit that had drawn so much attention earlier. In its place, he donned his trusted outfit of choice, a comfortable grey t-shirt and a pair of well-worn blue jeans. The change was a welcome relief allowing him to feel more at ease in the unfamiliar surroundings. He settled onto the sofa, taking a moment to collect his thoughts, a deep breath in and then out, as he contemplated the enigmatic invitation from Colonel Huganaga. It was evident that his expertise in break-in and defence technology had been the reason for his summons. The presence of the military base on the island seemed to be a crucial factor, but the specifics remained shrouded in mystery. As Archer pondered the possibilities, he couldn't help but grapple with a gnawing doubt. Did World's Terminal truly house nuclear weapons, and if so, what role could he possibly play in such a scenario? His knowledge of nuclear weaponry was limited at best, and the sheer gravity of the situation weighed heavily on his mind. Not to mention, he had no idea what he was supposed to do next. He had said he was being expected, but in reality, all he had been instructed with was to arrive at the island and get settled in. He assumed sooner or later he'd be contacted. Archer, who had always been somewhat averse to modern technology, had opted to turn off his phone for the duration of his journey. However, he had made a promise to let Halaya know when he had safely arrived on the island. Retrieving his suitcase, he pulled out his trusty Antnia X5 phone. Upon unlocking the device, he saw no message from the army, a single text message from Halaya, asking if he had reached his destination yet. Not one to be much of a texter, Archer called her instead. Rome's? Halaya's sweet voice asked. Yeah, I'm here. On the island? Yep. How is it? Dull. You'd rather be with me? But of course, Arch said and smiled for the first time in a bit. Halaya made him feel at ease, unlike anyone he had ever met before. House is all right, though, he admitted. Good, she said. So, what are you doing there? she continued. Halaya's simple question had put Archer in an uncomfortable spot. 
he found himself grappling with the uncertainty of his situation, torn between two fundamental dilemmas. Firstly, he didn't know the answer to her query himself, given the enigmatic nature of his mission on the island. And secondly, even if he did have an answer, he remained uncertain about what he could or should divulge to her. Their relationship had spanned almost a year, yet Halaya knew virtually nothing about Archer's job. A particular unsettling conversation from a drunken knight had served as a stark reminder of the uncharted territory in their relationship. In a moment of vulnerability, Halaya had probed into Archer's work, asking him a question that had haunted her ever since they had first met. Have you ever killed someone? she had inquired, her voice tinged with unease. Archer, perhaps too casually, had answered in the affirmative. The truth was, he had taken more lives than he cared to count, and each face haunted his thoughts, an eternal reminder of the price he had paid for his career. Halaya, sensing that there was more to the story, had pressed further, asking how many. His reply, I don't know, was a half-truth. He did know, but he had chosen to shield her from the grim reality. Confirmed kills were one thing, reality another. Following that revelation, Halaya had made a conscious effort to avoid discussing Archer's work, and he had reciprocated by keeping the details of his job shrouded in secrecy. Meeting Halaya had been a true blessing in his life, providing him with a sense of solace and normalcy that had kept him tethered to his desk job at the Department of Defense Technologies. He often questioned whether he could reconcile a life of violence and death with the prospect of swearing eternal love to a woman who knew so little about his true nature. It was a moral quandary that weighed heavily on his conscience as he hesitated to answer Halaya's simple inquiry, knowing that it was just a glimpse into the vast, uncharted territory of his life that he had never dared to explore with her. I don't really know. I'm waiting for someone to tell me. Is it dangerous? Halaya asked again, as she had before he left. No, they probably want me to check out the base in town. If it's well protected. Yeah, something like that. How long are you staying? I don't know. Are you going back to the desk after this? Maybe. Maybe? So are you going back to field work? You're not going to Starnia, are you? Don't know. Probably not. Archer was getting weary of the questions, especially as he couldn't reply to them any more truthfully. He really had no clue where his life was going at the moment. Probably not. How can you not know? Halaya's voice was getting more frustrated by the minute. This is the job. They don't say shit unless they absolutely have to. But you're an officer. You've got to have some pull. They're not telling me anything right now. What does that mean? It's weird. You know what? You're fucking weird. You're fucking weird, Romeo Archer, Halaya snapped suddenly. Arched, sighed. Don't just fucking sigh at me, dude, Halaya barked. Archer didn't know what to say. He had to admit he had always been a little turned on by Halaya's zero to hundred temperament, but sometimes it added a little more stress than he needed, especially now. Won't you say anything? I don't know what to say, Archer replied. All right. Hey, you know what? Screw you, Halaya growled and hung up. Archer couldn't believe his ears, so much so that he almost let out a burst of laughter. Instead, he let out a deep sigh and buried his face in his hands, the weight of the situation pressing heavily upon him. The argument with Halaya had only added to his mounting frustrations and anxieties. As he sat there, wrestling with his emotions and contemplating the strained state of his relationship with Halaya, Archer couldn't help but feel a deep sense of regret in ever agreeing to come to this forsaken corner of the world. He knew that he couldn't afford to lose her, especially in a time when he needed her support more than ever. In that moment, his frustration turned to anger, and he wished for the impossible. He wished that he could have this Colonel Huganaga in the same room with him so that he could gently wring the man's neck in frustration. All he wanted was clarity, an understanding of why the army had brought him to this enigmatic island, and how it might impact his promising relationship with Halaya. 
He contemplated calling her back, but knew she had to calm herself down. It wasn't the first time she had told him to go do himself, and usually the situation resolved itself. Instead, he refreshed his text app, and suddenly there it was, a message from an army number. Archer opened it with growing excitement. Hope you're settling in all right. Car will pick you up tomorrow morning, 8 a.m., Huganaga, the text read. Arched sighed again. No answers tonight. He looked around the room and thought of ways to keep himself entertained. A television had not been provided to add to his growing disappointment. He felt a higher power tell him, No Antnean gridiron games tonight for you, Archer. Suddenly, a light bulb went off in his head. Only a shot of good old Irian tequila could save the day. Chapter 3 Archer locked the door behind him and ventured back into the town of Phoenix in search of a bar. As he walked through the town, his frustration and restlessness grew, exacerbated by re-seeing the depressing sights that surrounded him. The unremarkable buildings, the rocky pavement, and the overwhelming, too stiff for his liking military presence all served to fuel his appetite for a few stiff drinks. The only sight that gave him solace was the waving ocean beyond the cliffs. In the evening sun, it looked a bit like rum hitting the bottom of a glass anyway. With each passing moment, Archer's determination to find a suitable watering hole intensified. He scanned the surroundings, desperately hoping to stumble upon a place that would offer some respite from the overwhelming atmosphere of the town. After what felt like an eternity of wandering, Archer's persistence paid off. He came across a bar that, while not particularly inviting in appearance, beckoned to him for a different reason. A simple piece of paper taped to the door advertised shots for a mere two dollars. The prospect of affordable drinks was all the encouragement he needed. Without hesitation, Archer pushed open the door and stepped inside, ready to drown his frustrations and find solace in the company of strangers and a few shots of something strong. The dimly lit interior of the bar awaited him, and he hoped that this establishment would provide the escape he so desperately craved from the enigmatic mysteries of World's Terminal, what the hell that ever was, and the tumultuous state of his relationship with Haliah. As Archer entered the bar, he was met with a sight that took him by surprise. A small but welcoming group of patrons occupied the dimly lit interior. To his amazement, they seemed open and friendly to the arrival of a stranger in their midst. One disheveled-looking gentleman even raised his glass in a silent toast as Archer crossed the threshold. Taking in the interior of the establishment, Archer observed a cosy and rustic atmosphere. Dimly lit, the bar exuded a certain charm that was unexpected given its unassuming exterior. Weathered wooden beams crisscrossed overhead and old bar stools lined a well-worn counter. The low hum of conversations and laughter filled the air, providing a stark contrast to the gloomy ambience of the town outside. Archer made his way to the bar and took a seat on one of the available stools. It wasn't long before the bartender, an older, portly man with a friendly demeanor, approached him. The bartender's round face bore a weathered expression that hinted at years of experience in serving drinks and hearing stories. He wore a stained apron over his faded shirt, and his receding hairline revealed a distinct lack of vanity. What are we having tonight, stranger? the bartender asked in a friendly tone that made Archer feel at ease for the first time on the island. Irian, Archer said quietly, referring to his favorite brand of tequila made in the paradise-like westernmost corner of the utopian region. The bartender nodded. You're in luck. Just got a resupply of their finest a couple of days ago. Good for you, Archer nodded. The bartender promptly poured Archer a shot of his favorite tequila, and Archer expressed his gratitude with a nod of thanks. Without hesitation, he grabbed the glass and downed the fiery liquid in a single swift motion. The warmth that surged through his body in the wake of the shot brought instant relief, as if the troubles and uncertainties that had been gnawing at him were momentarily held at bay by the comforting burn of the alcohol. 
First tabs on the house, the bartender said, as Archer was reaching for his wallet. Archer looked up to him. It's not my place to tell you how to run your business, but are you sure that's wise? I've got a good head, Archer said with a grin. The bartender replied with one of his own, revealing a gold tooth. I've served soldiers on this island for twenty years. The first evening is always free, because trust me, they keep coming back. How do you know I'm with the army? Archer asked. The bartender smiled again. Like I said, I've served you guys nightly for quite some time, ever since the base was established. Besides, young chaps like yourself rarely venture here out of free will. New guys, like yourself, come in every now and then, us Finis Originals. We're all old farts, if you didn't notice yet, the bartender replied, causing an eruption of laughter among the other patrons. Another one? the bartender then asked, and poured Archer another drink before he could even nod. Arched nodded back, and this time took a smaller sip. I like to say I've got a trained eye, though, the bartender continued. You're clearly an officer. How do you know that? Archer asked. He knew he could tell an enlisted man and an officer apart in pitch-black darkness from a thousand yards away, but how an old bartender could do the same was quite a question. The way you carry yourself. Well, you're right. Van Riek Archer. Archer introduced himself. The bartender nodded and offered his hand. Tom Backstrom, he introduced himself. But I have to admit, I didn't just guess. As always, there are rumours. Rumours? Like I said, it's a rumour. But they say something weird happened in World's Terminal, Tom explained. Archer's intrigue peaked. He didn't expect a bartender could enlighten his mission. The World's Terminal? I haven't been there yet. I just arrived on the boat a few hours ago. Yeah, the World's Terminal. On the other side of the island by the cliffside, the official name is the 317th Logistical Defense Segment. Whatever that means, but that's what we call it. The World's Terminal, Tom said. Archer had seen the official name on paper and was convinced the very mundane and dull perfectly described everything the base did not represent. It was a facade. The World's Terminal was a far more accurate name, if the stories about nuclear warheads were real. A little apocalyptic, no? Some even say they've got missiles up in there. The bartender seemed to corroborate Archer's thoughts. What happened there? I repeat, Van Riek, sir, these are rumours, Tom began with a cheeky tone. But some say all alarms went off for no reason, or at least they didn't find one. Some people, townsfolk, I mean, think it's the Stanians hacking into the base's system to mess with us. Some say, some say it was a test run for saboteurs to try and break in and sabotage the missiles and do God knows what. Hell, the grandma next door thinks the Stanians want to destroy the island where it stands with our own weapons, he explained. Especially the last angle sent chills down Archer's spine. For the first time, he felt the urge to fulfill his duty as a bureaucratic military official. Wild rumours, I have to say, he said. Tom nodded, knowing that was all a Van Riek of the Antnian army could say. Truth was, he didn't know any better. The other rumour was that some big-shot colonel in the base got all riled up and worried about the state of the base's security, so he called around to find the best man to make sure it's all tight, no way in or out without the proper credentials. I'm going to assume that's you, Tom said. For a moment, Archer just stared at the bartender before downing his second shot of tequila. I'm going to assume so as well, Archer replied nonchalantly. As the conversation about World's Terminal reached its natural conclusion, Archer and Tom found common ground in an unexpected place. It came to light that forty years earlier, Tom had been a soldier himself, a private whose military career had been abruptly halted by a knee injury he sustained while playing gridiron. The shared love of the sport sparked a camaraderie between the two men, and they began to bond over their mutual passion for gridiron. However, what started as a friendly discussion soon morphed into a playful and good-natured argument. Tom, to Archer's chagrin, turned out to be a staunch fan of the Jacobtown Gamblers, the blood rivals of Archer's beloved hometown team, the Nicholson Blazers. 
Their conversation took on a light-hearted and humorous tone as they traded jabs and playful insults about their respective teams. Despite their rivalry, it became evident that Archer and Tom shared a camaraderie that transcended their team loyalties. In that moment, the bar became a place of respite, where Archer could momentarily set aside the weight of his mission and the troubles in his personal life and simply enjoy the camaraderie of newfound friends. As the evening wore on, Archer's high rank in the army became a point of fascination for the other patrons at the bar. Two fishermen came over, introducing themselves almost comically as Bob and Billy, and wasted no time in offering him several free beers, eager to hear more about his military experiences. Hours passed, and Archer found himself recounting some of the less wild and classified stories from his long and storied career. Although these tales may have held minimal significance to him, they captivated the attention of the patrons, who held a deep respect for the armed forces. Each story was met with nods of admiration and cheers of appreciation. As the clock struck midnight, Archer realized that he had allowed himself to indulge in one too many shots and drinks. The camaraderie and jovial atmosphere had drawn him in, but he was now acutely aware of the grave mistake he had made. Meeting his new boss the following morning in a state of inebriation was far from ideal. As the youth would say, at this point, Archer realized he fucked up. All right, I'm going to have to call it a night, Archer said finally, causing an eruption of booze within his enthusiastic audience. Hey, let's give the boy some slack. He's a big shot with surely a big mission. And once it's done, he'll come back to tell us all about it. Right, Van Reek, sir. Tom asked, a cheeky tone making a grand return. Archer smiled and nodded. Maybe, maybe, he said, as he climbed out of his chair and felt the world slosh. As Archer swayed near the door, contemplating his somewhat unsteady exit, it suddenly swung open before him. In March, two men who bore an imposing and unmistakably military-like appearance. Their entrance was both unexpected and commanding, causing Archer to take a hesitant step back into the bar. The first man, bald, tall and broad-shouldered, exuded an air of authority. He wore a crisply black t-shirt that crumbled at the sleeves under the pressure of his basketball-like biceps. His steely gaze scanned the room with a calculated intensity, and his posture conveyed a sense of unwavering confidence. Beside him, the second man was slightly shorter, dressed in a grey Henley t-shirt, had longer hair and combat pants, but just equally formidable in stature, with a rugged and no-nonsense demeanour. Together, they formed an imposing duo that left little doubt about their expertise in skull-crushing. Romeo Archer, the first man asked. Who's asking? Archer asked back. He was able to hide his drunken demeanour, a special skill he had to have learned years and years ago. We need you to come with us. Did Huganaga send you? Yes, the man replied, but the hesitation in his voice told Archer the truth was the opposite. Then I'll need to see some credentials. Just come with us. Let's not make a scene, the man said. The patrons had unmistakably started paying attention to the commotion at the door. Tom behind the bar was notably vigilant. As Archer stood there, contemplating his options and trying to make sense of the situation, a whirlwind of thoughts raced through his mind. He couldn't help but question the identity and motives of the two imposing men who had entered the bar. His initial instinct told him that they were unlikely to be sent by Colonel Huganaga, especially at this late hour. If they were indeed from the army or acting under official orders, they would have likely presented credentials and explained their purpose for seeking him out in the middle of the night. On the other hand, if these men were not affiliated with the army or on official business, it raised a host of troubling questions. What could they possibly want with him? The possibility of foreign agents, perhaps even Stanian, crossed his mind, but the circumstances seemed baffling. How could they have known of his arrival on the island, and what could their intentions be? Archer couldn't fathom how foreign agents could have infiltrated the island, especially given the thoroughness of the passport inspector. It seemed improbable that they could have slipped through unnoticed. If he was given so much trouble, he was certain all these guys would have received was a stamp in the ass saying, 
returned to sender. Step outside with us, please, the shorter man said. Why? Arched asked. Silence landed. The mister doesn't want to go with you. Please leave the establishment or I'll alert the authorities, Tom shouted from the other side of the bar. Stay out of this, old man, the bigger man said. Archer didn't take his eyes off the two men, but he could sense Tom and the patrons shaking their heads in union. The situation was quickly developing in a direction Archer wasn't fond of. He'd have to make the first move before their first move would put him down. Please leave, Tom said once more. The bigger man frowned and bridled in the most threatening, primal kind of way. He stepped forward as if to push through Archer and go tell the old bartender who called the shots in his bar now, but Archer didn't give him a chance to do so. Archer stepped back quickly and put everything in his body to a huge right haymaker that landed on the bridge of the big man's nose. The punch was so powerful it sent Archer's much bigger opponent straight through the door and onto the pavement outside. To Archer's surprise, the other man didn't lunge at him but instead went after his friend. From the corner of his eye, Archer saw Tom reach for his phone, assuming he was about to alert the authorities. Whether that was some sort of island police or the military police itself, Archer didn't know, but nonetheless, perhaps dumbly, followed the two men outside. Stepping to the dark night was a mistake. The bigger man still laid on the street, clutching his head, but Archer couldn't see the shorter man anywhere. With a sudden and brutal swing, the shorter man attacked Archer from behind the door with what appeared to be a heavy metal pipe into the back of his hip. The blow was neither clean nor merciful, and it landed with a resounding thud. Pain shot through Archer's body as he staggered forward, feeling the impact reverberate through his bones. Archer turned to see the man now lunge at him. He grabbed him by the pipe, and they tumbled to the ground in a chaotic struggle for control. Archer tried to swing his legs over the man's head to get control, but perhaps it was the other man's professionalism, or his own drunken state, that gave him no choice but to hang on to the pipe. Just as the battle seemed to be reaching a critical juncture, the distant wail of police sirens pierced the air. The sudden sound acted as a jarring interruption, causing the shorter man to release his grip on the pipe. Archer, still dazed and in pain, managed to scramble to his feet just as the larger man began to regain his senses. With adrenaline coursing through their veins, the two assailants wasted no time in retreating into the darkness, vanishing into the night like phantoms. The cacophony of police sirens drew closer, and Archer was left standing there, bruised and bewildered, trying to make sense of the frenetic and violent encounter that had unfolded before him. You all right? Archer heard a voice behind him. Tom had stepped outside. Yeah. Friends of yours? Not yet, at least, Archer remarked. Both men smiled just as a late model SUV pulled up in front of them, sirens blaring in the right. The big white text in the green side doors left no questions. Military police. What a fun day, Archer thought. Chapter 4. Archer slowly stirred to consciousness in the dimly lit and sterile environment of a cell, the events of the previous night gradually returning to his memory. He vividly recalled the moment when the police car had screeched to a halt in front of the bar, its four doors flung open to reveal a team of military police officers clad in full gear, seasoned professionals who left no room for doubt regarding their experience. The tall, dark and burly commander of the military police unit, Sergeant Susan Margeres, had introduced herself with an air of authority. In a polite yet unyielding manner, she had explained that Archer would be detained overnight at the military police complex located on the opposite side of town near the harbour. As Archer lay there in the cell, the cold reality of his situation began to sink in. He had been swept up in a whirlwind of events that he couldn't fully comprehend, and his fate now rested in the hands of the military police. He made no complaints and offered no resistance, as if he had resigned himself to the uncertainty and torment that had already befallen him on this enigmatic island. As Archer lay in the cell, grappling with the disconcerting turn of events, 
and the realization that his appointment with Colonel Hugenagger was imminent, a sense of urgency washed over him. He needed to ensure that he wouldn't be late for the crucial meeting that might shed light on the mysteries surrounding World's Terminal. Frustratingly, he remembered that his watch and personal belongings had been confiscated by the military police upon his detention. All he had left were the clothes he had been wearing, aching wrists and fists from the altercation the previous night, and an unrelenting sense of apprehension. Just as he contemplated his predicament, the faint sound of footsteps echoed through the corridor outside his cell. Archer's attention snapped to the cell door, where he could hear the telltale sound of a lock being fiddled with. The stern Sergeant Majoris stepped in, another soldier following. Van Riek Archer, Majoris started, then hesitated. Sir, she continued, I've been informed you're on a schedule. Archer nodded as his head pounded. Am I late? Not if we leave now. Archer was relieved when he was finally escorted out of the cell and his belongings were returned to him. Sergeant Majoras and her subordinate took charge of him, leading him out of the military police station. As they emerged into the early morning light, Archer found himself appreciating the view of the town for the first time since his arrival. The sun had just risen, casting a warm and inviting glow over the otherwise unassuming town. Despite its initially depressing exterior, there was a certain rustic charm to it that Archer couldn't help but acknowledge. Perhaps the warmth and camaraderie he had experienced at the bar had played a role in softening his perception. However, the physical assault had not. Sergeant Marjorez and her subordinate, Corporal Browning, escorted Archer to a car that he assumed was the same one that had brought him to the police station initially. Browning took the driver's seat with Marjoris beside him while Archer settled into the back seat. As the car pulled away from the police station and started to navigate the town's streets, Archer gazed out of the window, taking in the sights. He watched as they approached the familiar asphalt road he had seen earlier, a road that seemed to lead away from the town and toward a more secluded area. They continued along the road, and as they drove, the landscape began to change. The town gradually receded into the distance, replaced by rocky terrain, cliffs and pockets of dense forest. Archer couldn't help but feel a growing sense of isolation as they ventured deeper into this remote corner of the island. Then, on the horizon, he spotted a large and imposing structure made of concrete. Its design was unmistakable to him, a missile silo. Archer had encountered similar structures in the past, and he knew that their outer appearance often concealed the vast network of underground chambers and tunnels that lay beneath the surface. As the road descended into a valley, Archer's view of the military facility expanded, revealing a sprawling complex that spanned several acres. The facility appeared to be meticulously designed and strategically located, and its features were nothing short of impressive. Archer could see several missile silos dotting the landscape, rising like monolithic sentinels from the earth. These towering structures were built to withstand immense pressure, and that he now almost certainly knew housed the formidable weapons that could be launched at a moment's notice. The centerpiece of the facility was a large main building, a hub of activity and operations. Archer surmised that this building likely served as the nerve center for World's Terminal, housing command and control facilities, as well as the personnel responsible for the facility's day-to-day -day operations. In addition to the main building, there were auxiliary structures scattered throughout the complex. These included living quarters for the personnel stationed at World's Terminal, as well as warehouses for storing vehicles, ammunition and other essential supplies. The facility was self-sustaining, equipped to handle the needs of its inhabitants for extended periods. The entire perimeter of the complex was fortified with barbed wire fences and security measures that spoke to a high level of vigilance and protection. Archer couldn't help but notice the presence of various traps and deterrents designed to keep intruders at bay. As he continued to observe, Archer realized that the back end of the facility complex faced the ocean, perched atop a sheer and imposing cliff that descended sharply to the ocean below.
The vantage point provided a commanding view of the surrounding area, making it a strategic location for a facility of this nature. The sheer scale and meticulous design of the facility left Archer with a profound sense of awe and unease. It was clear that World's Terminal was far more than a simple military outpost. It was a complex and highly secure installation with a mission and purpose that Archer was certain he had now deduced. The care and launch of Antnia's last straw, the Hammerstone ballistic nuclear missiles. As Archer, Sergeant Marjoris and Corporal Browning approached the facility, they encountered the first of several checkpoints designed to ensure the utmost security. Marjoris promptly informed the guards that they were escorting a guest for Colonel Huganaga, a statement that triggered a series of thorough credential checks. Each checkpoint presented another layer of scrutiny, with Archer's credentials scrutinized as closely as those of the military personnel accompanying him. He couldn't help but notice the scrutiny of the sergeant conducting the security check, whose attention seemed to linger on his bruised and scraped fist. The guards meticulously verified their identities and purpose before allowing them to proceed. The journey continued, leading them through a series of checkpoints, each marked by its own stringent security measures. It was evident that World's Terminal left no room for compromise when it came to safeguarding its secrets. After a third and final checkpoint, they were guided by a young female corporal who helped Corporal Browning park the car in a designated visitor area. The multitude of security checks and the meticulous nature of the process left Archer with a heightened sense of the facility's secrecy and the importance of his impending meeting with Colonel Huganaga. The military police escorted Archer to the entrance of the main building, accompanied by the female corporal who introduced herself as Jennings. All right, I'll leave you to the hands of the corporal here, sir, Marjores said, adding extra emphasis on these ears this time. Archer nodded. I'll leave last night out of my report, Marjorie's continued. Thanks, and thanks for the ride, Archer said cheekily. No problem. If we do meet again, I hope it's in different circumstances, Marjorie said, and winked as the four soldiers saluted each other in a slightly awkward, ritualistic manner. Marjorie's and Browning then walked back towards the parking lot. Archer turned his attention to Corporal Jennings. Corporal Jennings, with her striking blonde hair and sinewy grace, had a captivating presence that couldn't go unnoticed. Her beauty was accentuated by a hint of eccentricity that hinted at foreign origins, an aspect of her that intrigued Archer. As he observed her, Archer couldn't help but be reminded of Halaya, his girlfriend, who shared similar features, albeit with dark, almost black hair. The resemblance was uncanny, and it stirred within him a sense of nostalgia and longing. Jennings's familiar smile only intensified this feeling, conjuring memories of the previous evening's fight with Halaya, a disagreement that had left their relationship strained. Archer's thoughts briefly turned to his phone, which he had retrieved from the military police but hadn't checked since. However, he knew that dealing with personal matters would have to wait until after his impending meeting with Colonel Huganaga. Van Riek Archer, sir, Jennings said, and directed her salute to Archer this time. Archer returned the favour. I've been instructed to wait with you here. Major Glenn Fulroy will escort you to the meeting with the Colonel. Sir, Jennings said. Archer nodded, but grew frustrated inside once more. More waiting. The name Major Glenn Fulroy struck a chord with Archer, and not just because Colonel Huganaga had informed him that his security chief and second-in-command, Fulroy, would be present at their upcoming meeting. Fulroy's name carried a sense of familiarity for Archer, and as he pondered it further, he realized why. Major Glenn Fulroy had previously served as a ranger trainer in the same battalion that Archer had been a part of during his field career. Although Archer hadn't had direct interactions with Fulroy as his commander, he had heard plenty about the man. Fulroy was known for his gruff demeanour, extensive experience, and an uncompromising attitude when it came to discipline and the avoidance of mistakes. His reputation as a tough and demanding leader had left a lasting impression, and perhaps trauma, on those who had trained under him. 
Archer's moment of reflection was abruptly interrupted as the imposing main doors of the facility swung open. Stepping out with unwavering determination was Major Glenn Fulroy, followed closely by his adjutant. Fulroy's presence was nothing short of commanding, and Archer couldn't help but be struck by the man's impeccable appearance. Fulroy's uniform was the epitome of precision and cleanliness, pressed to perfection. His bald head, large and square, appeared to have been meticulously waxed and shined daily for years. It was evident that Fulroy placed great emphasis on maintaining a pristine and impeccable appearance, a characteristic that matched his reputation for strict discipline. Fulroy cut an imposing figure, his stature akin to that of a mountain, with his head towering at least a full head above archers. Attention was drawn to Fulroy's belt, which hosted a rather uniquely placed utility knife in addition to his service pistol. As Corporal Jennings promptly saluted the Major, Archer followed suit. Major Fulroy, Corporal Jennings, a guest for Colonel Huganaga, Van Reek Archer, Jennings announced very formally. Yet Archer could sense the two were familiar with each other, as Fulroy smiled warmly at the corporal. At ease, soldiers, Fulroy growled with a deep bass and responded to the salute. To Archer's surprise, Major Fulroy extended his hand in a gesture of goodwill. Archer, not expecting such a friendly overture from a man of Fulroy's reputation, shook his hand with genuine surprise and gratitude. Van Riek Archer, it's an honour. Likewise, Major Sir. Major Fulroy sent Corporal Jennings on her way and started leading Archer inside the main building with his adjutant. Archer had to look back over his shoulder at Jennings, who waved farewell. Archer nodded in response. As Major Fulroy led Archer and his adjutant through the main doors, Archer found himself once again amazed by the surroundings. The interior of the building was a testament to its formidable nature and the level of security maintained within. The first thing that caught Archer's attention was the presence of numerous guards stationed strategically throughout the building. Their uniformed presence was a constant reminder of the facility's vigilance and readiness to protect its secrets. The building itself was a labyrinthine structure, with countless doors and hallways leading in various directions. The walls were adorned with high-end technology, including security cameras and access control systems all meticulously maintained and monitored. Archer couldn't help but feel a sense of the building's impenetrability. Resultantly, the age-old question raised its head once again. What the hell was he doing there? Chapter 5 As Archer, Major Fulroy, and his ironically named adjutant, Gilroy, who even physically looked like the Major, just wore glasses, was slightly leaner and had a little more hair, entered the elevator, the doors closed behind them with a soft hiss. The small, windowless compartment was well lit, with fluorescent lights overhead casting a harsh white glow. The elevator's walls were adorned with a metallic finish, giving it a sleek and modern appearance. Archer noticed that there were no buttons inside the elevator to select a floor, which struck him as odd. Instead, there was a small digital display that indicated the elevator's progress. As the elevator began its ascent, Archer could hear the low hum of the machinery at work, a reminder of the precision and engineering that went into the facility's design. The journey seemed to take longer than expected, and Archer couldn't help but feel a growing sense of anticipation. During the ride, Adjutant Gilroy continued to provide Archer with information about some of the facility's more routine activities. He mentioned airspace monitoring, naval support, and other functions that highlighted the multifaceted nature of the world's terminal. The combination of the elevator's steady ascent, the sterile surroundings, and the ongoing explanation from Gilroy only served to heighten Archer's sense of urgency to find out his purpose on this forsaken island. He felt he was ever closer to finding out. As the elevator doors slid open on the fourth floor, Archer found himself stepping into a long and surprisingly dull hallway. The hallway's walls were painted in a nondescript shade of beige, and fluorescent lights overhead cast a stark, utilitarian illumination. 
It was a stark contrast to the high security and technologically advanced environment Archer had encountered thus far. At the end of the hallway, Archer's gaze was drawn to a simple wooden table. Positioned behind the table was a young male lieutenant, dressed in a well-pressed uniform. The lieutenant sat with an air of professionalism, his posture upright and attentive. As Major Fulroy, Archer and Adjutant Gilroy approached the lieutenant, the young officer quickly rose to his feet and snapped to attention, rendering a crisp salute to the major. Major, sir, the colonel is waiting for you, Lieutenant Wellsby informed. The major nodded and urged for the lieutenant to announce them. Following Major Fulroy's lead, the young lieutenant dutifully stepped aside from behind his table. He approached a door at the end of the hallway, adorned with golden letters that read, Commander, Colonel Huganaga. With a firm and respectful knock, he announced the arrival of the guests. The door swung open, revealing the inner sanctum of the Commander of World's Terminal, Colonel Huganaga. The room beyond was well appointed, with tasteful decor that contrasted sharply with the blandness of the hallway. Colonel Huganaga sat behind his table, radiating an air of authority and gravitas that was impossible to ignore. This was Archer's first glimpse of Colonel Huganaga in person, and he couldn't help but take note of the man's most remarkable feature, his well-kept moustache. However, it was clear that Colonel Huganaga was an imposing figure in every respect. Despite approaching fifty years of age, he maintained a full head of ash-coloured hair with only a few scattered greys that lent an air of wisdom and experience to his appearance. As Archer entered the room along with Major Fulroy and Adjutant Gilroy, he couldn't help but feel the weight of the moment. The presence of Colonel Huganaga and the aura of the room left no doubt that this was a place of great significance and secrecy. As Lieutenant Wellsby excused himself and discreetly closed the door behind them, Archer's attention was drawn to the realisation that they were not alone in the room with Colonel Huganaga. In one of the mismatched chairs, clearly brought in for the purpose of this meeting, sat a curly-haired man with a beard. It was evident from his appearance that he was a special operator, exuding an air of ruggedness and military prowess. In the other corner of the room, almost inconspicuously positioned, stood a boyish corporal. He appeared remarkably out of place in the setting, standing there awkwardly like a fish out of water. The juxtaposition of these individuals, ranging from the seasoned special operator to the somewhat bewildered young corporal, only added to the enigmatic atmosphere of the room. Zooming in with his eyes, the special operator's name tag in his black uniform read Rush while the corporal was named Danvers. Colonel Huganaga rose from his seat behind the desk and approached his visitors with purpose. First, he extended his hand to Major Fulroy and Adjutant Gilroy, engaging in a firm but familiar handshake with each of them in turn. Then, he turned his attention to Archer, offering his strong hand in greeting. Archer reciprocated the handshake, feeling the firm grip of Colonel Huganaga's hand. Van Riek Archer. I've heard lots of good things about you, Huganaga said with a grin. Archer smiled. I know it's not only good, sir, I'm afraid, Archer smiled. Huganaga let out a small bit of laughter, and Major Fulroy nodded appreciatively. I hope you found your stay on our island pleasant so far. Very much so, Archer blatantly lied in response. Huganaga nodded, almost as if he knew the truth. At that moment, Archer decided to drop all pleasantries and shoot for the kill. Which brings me to, why am I on it? Archer asked. Archer couldn't help but notice a subtle shift in the expression on Colonel Huganaga's face. There was a momentary change that hinted at the gravity of the situation, as if the reality of whatever they were about to discuss had momentarily weighed on the Colonel's mind. However, this moment was fleeting and Huganaga's smile quickly returned. With a subtle gesture, Colonel Huganaga indicated for everyone to take their seats. Archer and the others followed suit, settling into the chairs provided. Archer found himself positioned next to Captain Rush and directly facing Colonel Huganaga, who remained seated behind his desk. The atmosphere in the room was charged with anticipation, 
and Archer couldn't help but wonder what secrets and challenges lay ahead in this clandestine meeting. Colonel Huggenagger cleared his throat and began to speak, his tone both authoritative and measured. This was the moment of truth Archer had so been waiting for. Gentlemen, he began, his gaze encompassing all those seated before him, but Archer could sense the words were meant for him specifically. He was the only one in the dark. The 317th Logistics Defense Segment, or the World's Terminal, as you may know it, is more than just a remote military installation. It is a bastion of security and the linchpin of our nation's defense. What you see before you is not merely an impressive display of concrete and steel. It is the last line of defense against an unthinkable threat. His words hung in the air, heavy with the weight of their implications. The world's terminal was established in secrecy, against the agreements made with the Stanian regime, for one reason and one reason alone, to safeguard our nation and its people from the gravest threat that humanity has ever faced. Nuclear Annihilation Colonel Huggenagger's eyes bore into each person in the room, ensuring that his message was fully understood. In the event that the Stanian regime, or any other hostile force, were to deploy nuclear weapons against us, the world's terminal holds the capability to respond swiftly and decisively. Our ballistic nuclear missiles, including the Hammerstone, can reach known Stanian launch sites within seconds, ensuring that any act of aggression will be met with overwhelming force. Archer's eyes widened. He knew to expect something of the like. But Hammerstone missiles? It was bold, if not blatantly arrogant, to place one of the most destructive weapons known to mankind within 200 kilometers of enemy lines. He just couldn't put it into words out loud. As far as we know, the world's terminal has remained hidden from the prying eyes of the Stanians and other potential adversaries. And I fervently hope that it shall always remain so, Huganaga continued, his voice filled with a mixture of determination and concern. He paused for a moment, his brows furrowing slightly. However, three days ago, something unusual occurred within the confines of this very facility. A breach was detected in the control room, but no explanation was found. Alarms blared, signalling a potential security threat that should have been impossible within these walls. Colonel Huganaga's gaze turned towards Corporal Danvers, who had been at the centre of this mysterious incident, but remained in the shadowiest corner of the room so far. Corporal Danvers, he said, I'd like you to take the floor and provide an account of what transpired on that day. The room fell silent as all eyes turned to Corporal Danvers. He stepped in next to Huganaga's desk and looked at the colonel, almost as if looking for permission to speak. Archer observed the young and somewhat uneasy man closely. Danvers' demeanour and appearance hinted at a mix of nervousness and a strong sense of duty. Danvers appeared to be in his early twenties, with a lean but slightly muscular build. He wore the standard military uniform, complete with the insignia of his rank, two silver arrows. His dark hair was cropped short, and his clean-shaven face showed signs of fatigue, likely from the recent ordeal. The corporal's eyes darted around the room, but he maintained a focused and determined expression as he started recounting the events. In a monotone, Corporal Danvers began to recount the events that had transpired in the control room of the world's terminal. His voice remained steady, but the tension in the room was palpable, as everyone hung on his every word. As I was on duty in the control room, sir, Danvers began, I had momentarily drifted, uh, into a bit of nap. The alarm suddenly went off, indicating a breach. Archer noted the slight tremor in Danvers's hands, a sign of the pressure he was under. Yet, despite his apparent unease, Danvers maintained eye contact with Colonel Huganagger. I immediately alerted my commanding officer, Colonel Huganagger, and he assembled a team to investigate the breach, Danvers explained, and slightly nodded in the direction of Captain Rush. Huganagger confirmed it. Captain Rush, with an air of surprise and mild annoyance, took over the briefing from Corporal Danvers. 
As he spoke, his eyes seemed to narrow ever so slightly when he directed his words at Archer, conveying a subtle sense of hostility. It was clear that Rush was irritated by the need to explain the situation to someone who seemed out of the loop. We assembled a team, yes, Rush began, his voice tinged with frustration. We conducted a comprehensive sweep of the entire facility, from the missile silos to the pantries. I want to be clear that we left no stone unturned. Rush's tone remained professional, but there was an underlying tension in his voice that Archer couldn't miss. There were no signs of intruders, no evidence of tampering with security measures, and no indication of a breach. It was as if the alarms had gone off for no reason at all, Rush said. His annoyance seemed to grow more apparent as he further explained the meticulous search. Or perhaps Archer was imagining it. By Rush's outer appearance, he was the only one with field experience rivaling that of Archer's, and that if anything should command respect, not frustration. Archer couldn't help but wonder why. A heavy silence hung in the room for a brief moment after Captain Rush concluded his intense briefing. The tension in the air was palpable as everyone awaited Colonel Huganaga's response. That's the gist of it, Huganaga stated succinctly, his voice carrying an air of authority. He leaned forward slightly, his hands resting on the desk as he continued to address the room. Now, does anyone have any questions? Archer, despite the somewhat hostile atmosphere and his sense of being out of the loop, felt compelled to seek answers. He had plenty of questions swirling in his mind, starting many days ago, and he saw this as an opportunity to clarify the situation. Raising his hand, he waited for the colonel to acknowledge him. Colonel Huganaga, Archer began, his voice steady and respectful. I have a few questions, and few is an understatement. Firstly, have there been any previous security breaches or false alarms of this magnitude at the world's terminal facility? And secondly, do we have any intelligence indicating possible Stanian involvement or any other external threats? No and no, Huganaga confirmed what Archer already knew. This is the first of its kind, any kind. Do we know what caused the alarms? Archer asked, leaning forward slightly in his chair. And can we confirm if they were indeed false alarms? Colonel Huganaga sighed his expression somber as he considered Archer's question. Captain Rush conducted a thorough sweep of the entire facility, and Corporal Danvers and his team have investigated all possibilities of technical or mechanical failure, he began, his voice measured. They found nothing out of the ordinary, no signs of intrusion, and no explanation for the alarms. In these highly secure installations, false alarms are extremely rare and there is practically no way of ever knowing what triggered them. What worries me, Huganaga began and cleared his throat, is that we have confirmed it was not a glitch of any kind, which means something caused it, and we don't know what, which, in this business, usually means enemy activity, Huganaga stated. The uncertainty in Huganaga's tone was palpable, and it hung in the air like a heavy cloud. The situation was indeed perplexing, and the lack of answers only added to the sense of unease that permeated the room. Stanians? Archer finally asked. Who else? Rush remarked. While it's a remote possibility, we cannot rule out the use of hackers by the Stanians to trigger these alarms, Huganaga said. His voice remained as steady as it could, which wasn't much, as he continued. But the more troubling thought is that there may be someone on the inside working against us, someone who has infiltrated the very heart of our defence. Colonel Huganaga's words hung in the air like a foreboding shadow. The notion of potential Stanian involvement, even the possibility of a sleeper agent within the world's terminal, sent shivers down the spines of those in the room. Silence enveloped the space as everyone exchanged uneasy glances, the weight of the situation sinking in. Archer's mind raced with questions and suspicions. The atmosphere in the room had shifted from uncertainty to a palpable sense of paranoia, and the need for answers became even more pressing. At that moment, Archer felt like he could finally understand the messed-up, paranoid minds of those within high power in the Stanian regime, 
the unfaltering feeling that shit could hit the fan at any given moment. By now, Archer had to assume he was there to prevent that from happening. Colonel Huganaga's gaze turned towards Archer, and he began to address him directly as if he had read Archer's thoughts. Now to the matter at hand, Huganaga said, his tone becoming more businesslike. He turned to the others in the room, some of whom were not privy to Archer's background. Van Riek Archer here, he gestured toward Archer, brings with him a wealth of experience in combat and an exceptional skill set in the field of breaking and entry, Huganaga said, and frowned at Archer, waiting for a confirmation. Examining eyes now laid on Archer from everywhere in the room. Archer nodded in confirmation, his expression serious. Given your expertise, I am going to task you with conducting a thorough re-evaluation of our facility's security measures. We need to be absolutely certain that there are no vulnerabilities that could be exploited by the Stanians. The last thing any of us want is for them to gain access to this facility and take control of our missiles, Huganaga said astonishingly calmly as if he were reciting groceries. While Archer felt a sense of relief knowing his purpose now, which was among the lines of what he had expected, the weight of the responsibility placed on his shoulders. It was clear that this mission was of utmost importance, and failure was not an option. He glanced around the room, meeting the eyes of his new colleagues, some of whom regarded him with curiosity and others with a degree of scepticism. Archer knew he had a daunting task ahead of him, but one he was capable of one he had to be capable of. Yes, sir, Archer said. Huganaga nodded. However, that's not the extent of your responsibilities, Van Riek Archer, he said, his voice steady and unwavering. In light of recent events and the heightened need for security, we are implementing a significant change in our shift schedules. Archer knew whatever came next, Halaya wouldn't like it. His quick trip to an island was about to change into a permanent post in one of the most secluded locations in Utopia. Currently, there were two 12-hour security shifts, one led by Major Fulroy and the other by Captain Rush, Huganaga began, receiving nods from both mentioned. But the recent incident has made it clear that there can be no room for error or exhaustion within a shift, he continued. Archer saw Danvers blush. Therefore, a third shift has been added, with each shift reduced to eight hours to maintain vigilance and focus. This newly added shift will be under Archer's leadership, Huganaga concluded. This received an accepting nod from Major Fulroy, and a very slight but witnessable nonetheless shake of the head from Captain Rush. As Archer contemplated his new, all-encompassing role on the island, thoughts of Halaya weighed heavily on his mind. He knew that this sudden change in his life would undoubtedly create turmoil between them. His relationship with Halaya had always been complicated due to the nature of his work, and this new development might be the breaking point. He thought about how he wished he had popped the question earlier, making their bond legally significant and potentially allowing him some say in his stationing. But now he found himself separated from her by both distance and circumstance and he couldn't help but wonder if this would be the end of their relationship. Deep inside, he longed for the simplicity of their life together and wished he had acted on his feelings sooner. However, in the military, orders were orders, and he had a duty to fulfil. Archer knew that he had to focus on his responsibilities at World's Terminal and to his country, even as the personal sacrifices weighed heavily on his heart. Archer pushed Halaya out of his mind for the time being as Huganaga cleared his throat once more. Before we conclude this meeting, I want to ensure that each and every one of you understands your role and responsibilities. Our mission here is clear, to safeguard the world's terminal and above all else, the Hammerstone missiles. These are not just weapons, they are the key to our nation's security. He paused for a moment, allowing the gravity of their mission to sink in. Major Fulroy, Captain Rush, you are the pillars of our security detail. Your leadership is critical in maintaining the safety of this facility. Be vigilant, and remember that any breach in security could have catastrophic consequences, he said. 
The two addressed nodded silently. Danvers in the corner looked out of place. Huganaga noticed this. Corporal Danvers, your role as a control room operator is essential. We must ensure that our alarm systems and monitoring are impeccable. Huganaga turned his attention to the young corporal, who nodded excitedly out of pure noticement. Huganaga then turned his attention to Archer. Van Riek Archer, your expertise in security evaluation and your assignment to the third shift is crucial. We need to identify and address any vulnerabilities in our defences. Your diligence in this task will be instrumental in our success. As Huganaga concluded, he looked around the room one final time. This is a team effort, and I have full confidence in each of you. Remember our mission, stay vigilant and keep World's Terminal, and Antnia secure. Huganaga paused almost melodramatically, letting the words sink in once more. One question, Archer said. Go ahead, Van Riek. When do I begin my security evaluation? Why not right now? Chapter 6 Archer was given an hour to prepare for his security re-evaluation. He hadn't expected the colonel to assign him to it so fast, but all the better for him. As the meeting dispersed, Archer observed the hurried exit of Captain Rush. The tension between them was palpable, and it was clear that Rush had little patience for Archer's presence. Nevertheless, Archer had a job to do, and he couldn't be bothered by interpersonal conflicts at the moment. Corporal Danvers, on the other hand, had displayed an almost theatrical commitment to his duties as he passionately pledged vigilance to Colonel Huganaga. His fervent declaration was met with nods of approval from some and subtle amusement from others. Archer couldn't help but find the display a bit over the top, but he recognised that each member of the team had a unique way of expressing dedication. Major Fulroy's assurance that he would meet Archer in the front lobby was a welcome relief. It meant he wouldn't be navigating this complex facility alone. Archer nodded in acknowledgement of Fulroy's instructions, and then he turned his attention to Fulroy's adjutant Gilroy, the sergeant assigned to escort him to the armory to receive his new service weapon and uniform. As Archer followed Sergeant Gilroy and listened to his tour guide, like explanations about the facility, he couldn't help but notice the transformation of the island's atmosphere. They exited the building onto the front yard, past the parking's lots, and for one of the warehouses on the other end of the building complex. The morning had gradually transitioned into noon, and the gentle ocean breeze had become even more soothing. The scent of the sea and the rhythmic sound of the waves crashing against the cliffs provided an unexpected sense of tranquility. Strangely, Archer found himself feeling a sense of anticipation and even excitement about his new role. Despite the inherent complexity and potential dangers involved, he had a clear mission to protect his country and ensure the safety of the world's terminal. This sense of purpose helped dispel some of the initial doubts and anxieties he had felt. However, amidst this newfound determination, Archer couldn't escape the heavy concern he felt for Halaya. The abrupt nature of his deployment and the secrecy surrounding his mission left him worried about their relationship. It was a burden he carried with him, even as he embraced his responsibilities on the island. Moreover, the mysterious attempted assault from the previous night still lingered in his thoughts. The unanswered questions about the attackers and their intentions added an extra layer of complexity to his situation. But for now, he had a task at hand to prepare for the security re-evaluation and ensure the safety of World's Terminal. Inside the armory, Sergeant Gilroy introduced Archer to Sergeant Williamson, the weapons master of World's Terminal. Sergeant Williamson was a compact man with light hair and broad shoulders. Despite the relaxed uniform, his demeanor suggested a wealth of experience in handling firearms. Archer and Sergeant Williamson exchanged handshakes, and then the weapons master led them to a small cabinet filled with firearms. With practiced ease, Williamson retrieved a box containing brand new polymer pistols. He handed one to Archer, grip first, displaying a high level of familiarity with the weapon. Fancy one of these, 
Williamson asked with his southern drawl, which Archer presumed originated from the Dixon region of Antnea. Nodding, Archer took the fifth-generation Glock 17 in his hand, his fingers instinctively familiarizing themselves with its form and function. Antnean Army Standard Issue. It was a tool, nothing more, nothing less, and he treated it as such. The Glock 17 was utilitarian in design, a no-nonsense firearm built for reliability and functionality. Its black polymer frame felt sturdy and unyielding in his grip. Archer's thumb easily reached the magazine release, making for efficient reloading. Archer's experienced eyes scanned the pistol. Fixed white dot front and rear sights lined up neatly, offering quick target acquisition. On the left side of the frame, Archer could see the slide stop lever, ready for thumb manipulation. The matte black steel slide, serrated for better grip, smoothly covered the top of the pistol. The flag of Antnia, alongside with the antlers of the Antnian armed forces, was engraved in the rear end. Despite its simple appearance, the Glock 17 was a workhorse of a sidearm, known for its reliability, accuracy, and ease of use. It may not have been Archer's favourite, but he knew that when it came to firearms, functionality trumped aesthetics. Williamson offered him a holster, which Archer instinctively clicked onto his belt. With a nod of acknowledgement to Sergeant Williamson, he holstered the Glock 17, ready for the tasks ahead. This will do, Archer said. Williamson grinned. Now let's get you changed, Williamson continued. Only then, Archer remembered he was still wearing his T-shirt and jeans combination. He couldn't help but feel a tinge of embarrassment for having attended such a high-value meeting out of uniform. It was a reminder of the unexpected turn his day had taken and how unprepared he had been for the mission Colonel Huganaga had assigned him. Archer followed Sergeant Williamson to the changing room. The brand new uniform hanging there was a welcome sight. He could tell it was high quality, well-pressed and tailored to fit comfortably. Someone had done their homework on him before his arrival. On the right chest, there was a name tag with Archer neatly embroidered in block letters. The collar bore his rank insignia on both sides. A single heraldic silver rose on a camo brown patch. It was a subtle but meaningful symbol of his position within the military hierarchy. I'll leave you to it. Williamson said, and led Gilroy out of the room. Instead of hurrying to jump into the uniform, Archer closed the door and took a moment to collect his thoughts. Glancing at his watch, he saw that he had almost fifty minutes to spare before his scheduled meeting with Major Fulroy for the security re-evaluation. With a sigh, he pulled out his phone for the first time since last evening. As he unlocked his phone, he was met with a flurry of text messages and missed calls from Halaya. Seventeen missed calls. As usual, following a fight of theirs, the first few messages were filled with apologies. The remaining messages were filled with worry and frustration, wondering where he was and why he hadn't responded. The most recent message asked if he was okay and if something had happened. Instead of texting, Archer called her. Where the hell are you? Halaya answered after the first dial. At the base. Why haven't you replied? It's a story longer than a year of famine. But I'm all right. It's been a rough 24 hours, Archer said. For a moment, there was silence on the line. I'm sorry, Halaya said finally. Archer heard the emotion in her voice. About yesterday, she continued. Archer closed his eyes. I know. I'm sorry too. My job is so unpredictable, he said. He heard Halaya nodding to herself. Yeah, I wish it wasn't, she said. Me too. When are you coming back? she asked. Archer wasn't sure what to answer after the meeting. He knew his post could be permanent. Months, hell, it could be years. That part hadn't been discussed at all. A couple of weeks, I think, Archer chose to lie. He decided breaking the truth to her slowly would be easier. Professionally, it was better. It'd give him more time to focus on his work. Personally, it made him feel like a damn chicken. For a moment, there was silence on the line again. Archer then heard a deep sigh, but a surprisingly understanding sigh. All right, Halaya said. It's what you got to do. 
It's got to be important, right? she asked. It is, Archer said and nodded to himself. Very, very important. All right, then. I don't like being away from you. But I respect what you do, Romeo. I really do, Halia said. Archer smiled and realized how rare it was to hear his first name. He had spent thirteen years in the army, where first names were more of the last measure to tell two people with the same surname apart from each other, rather than a daily occurrence. His family and friends didn't call him Romeo. He didn't really have any anyway, apart from Halia, and nearly systematically lying to her hurt him more than any hit he had ever received. Thank you, Halia. I love you, Romeo. I love you too, Archer said. That wasn't a lie. After the call with Halia, Archer felt a renewed sense of connection to his life back home, despite the secrecy and uncertainties of his current assignment. They had agreed to call each other daily, a lifeline to maintain their bond while they were apart. Thankfully, the time difference wasn't significant unlike on some of Archer's deployments. With his conversation with Halia, concluded Archer returned his attention to the task at hand. He changed into his uniform in the changing room, making sure everything was in order. The crisp, brand new uniform felt different from his casual attire, and as he looked at himself in the mirror, he couldn't help but feel a sense of pride in the uniform he wore. Archer proceeded to change into his uniform. The neatly pressed military attire hung on the hanger, waiting for him to don it. He meticulously dressed, ensuring that every button was fastened, every crease was sharp, and his insignia, one heraldic rose, and name tag were properly displayed. As he buttoned up his uniform shirt, he couldn't help but appreciate the crisp and professional appearance it afforded him. Archer was greeted by Sergeant Williamson, and Archer nodded his thanks and exchanged a brief salute with the sergeant before continuing on his way. As he walked across the courtyard, the noon air was refreshing, carrying the salty scent of the ocean. Archer paused for a moment to take in the breathtaking views that the island offered of the vast Atlantic Ocean. The expansive blue horizon stretched out before him, and for a moment he allowed himself to appreciate the natural beauty surrounding World's Terminal. Re-entering the main building, Archer was met with more salutes and respectful nods from the soldiers he passed. Each salute acknowledged his rank and position within the military hierarchy. With each salute and nod, Archer felt a sudden surge of pride in the uniform he wore. Archer checked his watch and noted that he still had a brief moment for lunch. After a quick search for a suitable place to eat, he discovered a cafeteria designed primarily for officers. The interior of the cafeteria was clean and well organized, with military precision evident in every detail. The tables were neatly arranged, and the seating area was spacious, accommodating both small groups and individual diners. One wall of the cafeteria featured a large window that provided a panoramic view of the ocean. The clear glass framed the vast expanse of the Atlantic, offering a stunning vista of the sparkling blue waters that stretched as far as the eye could see. The view was captivating, and Archer couldn't help but appreciate the natural beauty of the island. Approaching the buffet area, Archer selected a tray and began to peruse the offerings. The cafeteria offered a variety of dishes, from hot entrees to salads and sides. He decided on a hearty chicken and rice dish, adding a generous helping of steamed vegetables. Next, he grabbed a chilled bottle of water from a cooler and made his way to the cash register to pay for his meal. With his tray in hand, Archer selected a table in the corner of the cafeteria, providing him with a clear view of the ocean through the large window. As he settled into his seat, he took a moment to reflect on the island. Despite his initial reservations and the mystery surrounding his assignment, the island had started to grow on him. The sense of duty and the responsibility to protect this unique place had become more prominent in his mind. With a newfound focus, Archer began his meal, appreciating the moment of tranquility before he would continue his duties at World's Terminal. Archer got halfway through his chicken when he was suddenly surprised by a familiar silhouette in the corner of his eye. Major Fulroy approached him, 
and to Archer's pleasant surprise, Corporal Jennings followed him. Corporal Jennings had evidently taken some time to refresh herself. Her blonde hair was now tied up neatly, and her uniform appeared immaculate. Instinctively, Archer began to rise from his seat, intending to show respect to the Major, but Fulroy waved him off, signalling for him to remain seated. With a nod of acknowledgement, Archer settled back into his chair, ready to engage in conversation with the Major and his unexpected companion. Van Riek Archer, the Major began, as he took a seat opposite Archer. Major, sir, Archer said formally, and laid down his utensils. Fulroy nodded for Jennings to take a seat as well, and she did so next to him. I didn't have time to say this earlier, but I got your file from Colonel Hugenager, Fulroy began. Calamy impressed, he concluded, and nodded with respect. Archer felt himself blush ever so slightly. Thank you, sir. We can do away with the Sears right now, Van Riek. The moment you received that Medal of Valor was the moment you should have started being the one being saluted, not the one saluting, Fulroy said. I appreciate it, Archer said, nodding, although he wasn't sure where Fulroy was going with his speech. In fact, I'm a little surprised you're still a Van Reek, he continued. Archer wasn't sure how to take Fulroy's comment. He knew he was of the age and experience to be promoted to lieutenant, but if Fulroy had indeed read his file, he would have known Archer's trouble sticking to orders was probably the reason why only a single heraldic rose decorated his collar, not two. Anyway, I'm going to get myself one of those chickens, and we'll be on our way to see what you think about the security of our little facility here. Corporal Jennings has kindly volunteered to act as our secretary during the tour, Fulroy explained while rising to his feet, nodding to Jennings, who nodded in turn. Archer nodded to her as Fulroy headed to the buffet. As Archer observed Major Fulroy filling up his tray with food, he couldn't help but sense Corporal Jennings's gaze fixed upon him from across the table. Her eyes seemed to carry a mixture of curiosity and something else he couldn't quite put his finger on. It was as if she had questions she wanted to ask, but was choosing to hold back for the moment. The atmosphere at the table felt somewhat charged, with unspoken thoughts hanging in the air. Something on your mind, Corporal Jennings? Archer asked, after he swallowed a larger piece of chicken. Jennings flinched. Can I speak with you, Van Riek, sir? she asked. Of course. The Major means well. He just doesn't have a way with words. What he meant to say was, your track record is very impressive, sir. I appreciate it, Corporal but I knew that, Archer remarked somewhat unnecessarily. Jennings smiled somewhat artificially and leaned back in her chair. Archer was about to continue his meal, but felt it necessary to soften the blow. Corporal, if I may, what's your name? he asked. Jennings seemed very surprised, but her artificial smile turned into a most genuine one. Aisha, sir, she replied. Aisha Jennings. Archer felt the name roll on his tongue. He liked the sound of it. Somehow, it fit her very well. Aisha, I like that, he nodded. Jennings continued to smile before turning her attention to the window and to the ocean front and below. Major Fulroy returned to the table with a tray full of food, and as they began their meal, the atmosphere shifted from the weighty matters of security to a more informal and personal tone. It surprised Archer how easily the conversation flowed between them. Fulroy initiated by asking about Archer's experiences during his tours in Stania, and Archer responded as candidly as he could, being mindful of classified operations. He shared stories of his deployments, the challenges he faced, and the camaraderie of his unit. In turn, Fulroy opened up about his own military career. He revealed that despite his high rank, he had limited combat experience, having served only one tour in Stania as a squad leader. Fulroy had graduated the Military Academy of Metalingus at age 21 and been promoted to Van Riek, seven years earlier than Archer received his heraldic rose. Archer was surprised to learn that Fulroy was only five years older than him, despite appearing older. The Major then took an even more unexpected turn, sharing the personal toll his career had taken on his life. 
He disclosed that he had gone through a difficult divorce a few years earlier, attributing it to his distant stationing on the remote island. Archer reciprocated by talking about Halaya, revealing some details about their relationship. Fulroy congratulated him and wished him well in his personal life. However, Archer couldn't help but notice that Corporal Jennings remained relatively quiet throughout this exchange, her thoughts and emotions hidden behind her reserved demeanour. All right then, Major Fulroy said as he swallowed the last piece of his food and washed it down with coffee. Archer had finished his already. Perhaps we should get on with this, Fulroy said as he got to his feet. Archer and Jennings followed suit. Although I can't say I have high hopes of finding any new weak spots, we do very thorough evaluations annually, he added. Archer nodded. He'd expected such. But in his years of breaking and entering into the enemy's best-kept secrets, he'd learned one thing. They were always too confident in their ability to keep out someone who really, really wanted to get in. If there's a will, there's a way, was Archer's motto in a previous life. Now Archer wished he was dead wrong. As the tour commenced, the trio left the cafeteria and proceeded from the lobby. Corporal Jennings was carrying a digital notepad, which she intended to use to record any findings or useful remarks made by Archer or Fulroy during the security re-evaluation. Standing just outside the front doors of the facility, Major Fulroy began to explain what Archer had already gathered from their earlier conversation, that attempting to enter the facility unauthorised through the front gates would be an act of sheer suicide. The security measures in place were extensive and formidable, designed to deter and neutralise any potential threats. Fulroy elaborated on these measures as they stood there. There were three rigorous security checks at various points leading up to the main entrance, as Archer had noted himself coming in. Each check included thorough identification verification, scanning for contraband, and close scrutiny of all personnel seeking access. Along the approach to the main gates, there were concealed traps and barriers. Spikes embedded in the ground could be raised to obstruct any unauthorised vehicles attempting to breach the perimeter. As a final insurance policy to ensure that no unauthorised visitors could approach the facility unscathed, hidden and customised Heckler and Coke MG-5 machine gun emplacements were strategically positioned and aimed at any potential threats. While they could also be operated manually, these emplacements were operated remotely from the control room inside the main building with short-distance radio signals and were equipped with advanced targeting systems. As they continued their walk deeper into the main building, Archer couldn't help but think about contingency plans in case the enemy managed to shut down the facility's electronics and power supply. He voiced his concerns to Major Fulroy, who provided a detailed explanation of the backup power systems in place. Fulroy explained that there was a network of backup generators strategically placed throughout the facility. These generators were designed to activate automatically in the event of a power failure, ensuring that critical systems would continue to operate without interruption. In addition to the primary electrical grid, there was a secondary power source in the form of diesel power generators. These generators could provide electricity independently of the main grid and were capable of sustaining the facility's vital functions. Fulroy then mentioned a hydroelectric power plant that had been constructed at the base of the steep cliff upon which the world's terminal facility was situated. This hydroelectric plant served as a last resort power source. It harnessed the energy of the ocean itself and could supply electricity to the facility in the event that all other power sources failed. Only downside, it had to be operated manually. Archer was genuinely impressed by the thoroughness of the backup power systems. However, he understood the importance of his role, which was to identify any potential vulnerabilities or weaknesses in the facility's security, no matter how well prepared they might be. And what if all three backups are sabotaged? Archer asked. Fulroy stopped in his tracks in the hallway and looked back at Archer. Jennings seemed ready to write down. You think that'd be possible? Sabotaging all three without anyone noticing? 
Anything is possible, especially if we have a traitor in house, Archer said. Silence fell on the trio until Fulroy nodded. Noted. Corporal, write that down. As Archer, Fulroy and Jennings approached the main elevators, Major Fulroy provided further insight into the layout and security of the facility. He explained that the upper floors primarily consisted of offices and administrative areas, while the most critical and secure elements of the facility were located below ground, constructed within the solid bedrock. Archer took note of this information, but wasn't particularly concerned about the safety of the upper floors to begin with. From his observations outside, he had already noticed that the roof of the building was heavily guarded, and the windows of the upper offices were fortified with three-sided security glass designed to withstand even a burst of small explosive rounds. It was clear that the security measures in place extended to all aspects of the facility, leaving very little room for vulnerabilities. In the elevator, Major Fulroy confirmed Archer's question about the backup power methods for the elevators. He explained that indeed, the elevators were designed to continue functioning even in the event of power failures, thanks to the backup generators and other emergency power sources. Archer also noticed that there was a stairway adjacent to the elevator, which provided an alternative means of access between floors. Archer raised a valid point, suggesting that an enemy attempting to infiltrate the facility might opt for the stairway to avoid any potential risks associated with the elevator, such as being trapped between floors or emerging into an unexpected situation. Major Fulroy seemed impressed by Archer's strategic thinking, and Corporal Jennings diligently noted this down. As the elevators descended to the basement floor, Archer was struck by the realisation that they had entered one of the most heavily protected areas in the world. The basement was a maze-like complex of hallways and corridors, and as soon as they exited the elevator, a vigilant sergeant approached them to check their credentials. Once their identities were verified, they were allowed to proceed. Walking through the labyrinthine hallways of the basement, Archer was struck by the sheer complexity and secrecy of the facility. The dimly lit corridors were lined with unmarked doors, and only those with the highest security clearance would know what lay behind them. The atmosphere was a blend of tension and efficiency, as personnel moved about their duties with a sense of purpose. The chambers they passed were equally enigmatic, some filled with high-tech equipment and others appearing almost empty, their true purpose known only to a select few. Archer noticed security cameras positioned strategically throughout the area, ensuring that every inch of the facility was under constant surveillance. Occasionally, they passed by groups of uniformed personnel engaged in hushed conversations or busy with their tasks, their expressions ranging from serious to focused. The air was filled with a sense of secrecy and purpose, making it clear that this facility was at the forefront of national security. Archer couldn't help but feel a sense of awe mixed with trepidation as he navigated this hidden world beneath the surface, where the nation's most sensitive operations were carried out in utmost secrecy. Archer couldn't help but notice that there was a guard stationed by every door and at every turn and corridor, each of them armed with H&K 416 assault rifles. The level of security was truly impressive. Major Fulroy led the group through one of the doors, and he requested Archer's fellow Van Riek, named Gerard, a slender but athletic individual with a dark complexion, who had been guarding the door to accompany them inside. Entering the generator room, Archer was immediately struck by its sheer scale and complexity. It was a vast, cavernous hall filled with rows upon rows of backup generators. The generators hummed with energy, their mechanical precision evident in their synchronized operation. Archer could hear the low, steady rumble of the machinery, a testament to the facility's redundancy in maintaining power. At one end of the room, there was a massive, mill-like contraption designed to harness the power of the ocean, a hydroelectric generator. It was an impressive piece of engineering, a contingency plan in case all other power sources failed. Archer could see the powerful turbines churning water to generate electricity. 
The walls of the room were covered in control panels and monitoring screens, each one displaying crucial data about the facility's power supply. Soldiers and technicians were scattered throughout, diligently monitoring the equipment and ensuring everything ran smoothly. They moved with purpose, aware of the critical role this room played in maintaining the facility's security. In addition to the technical personnel, Archer counted a total of eight guards stationed in the room. Two of them were armed with MG5 machine guns, a clear indication of the facility's commitment to security. The presence of these heavily armed guards made it abundantly clear that any attempt to sabotage the generators would be met with lethal force. As you can see, attempting to sabotage the generators equals suicide, Fulroy said suddenly, almost nastily. His eyes scanned the room in a peculiar way, almost like he had never been there. No way, though, Archer thought. Archer nodded, but didn't let the remark go unanswered. I still don't like them all being in one room, he said. Fulroy glanced at him, then nodded. Perhaps something to consider. Let's move on, he said. They exited the generator room, Gerard closing the door and taking his place back at guard. The trio's journey through the facility continued, with Fulroy offering explanations of various functions along the way. Archer interjected with observations and remarks, and Jennings diligently recorded these notes. Thus far, Archer was reasonably satisfied with the facility's security measures, which seemed robust and well thought out. They peeked into the control room, where Corporal Danvers and his fellow technicians seemed ever vigilant, monitoring the security of the facility. Danvers stood and greeted the Major in a salute, who then told Danvers to proceed and stay awake. Danvers, blushing, went back to his seat. Archer didn't have any concerns of the control room itself. He didn't have enough technical expertise to start scrutinizing if the control room was responsible for the false alarms, but it was something he'd have to look into once his actual shifts patrolling and being in charge of guarding the facility began. As they ventured deeper into the facility, the atmosphere took on a distinct shift. The corridors grew quieter and the sense of gravity in the air became palpable. Though Fulroy didn't explicitly state their destination, Archer had a growing sense of where they were heading. However, the change in atmosphere was unmistakable as they proceeded. The silence grew more pronounced, and Archer's instincts told him that they were heading towards something significant. The subtle shift in the mood was accompanied by a gradual increase in the number of security checks they encountered. Finally, they arrived at a wide hallway that seemed to lead to their ultimate destination. Archer's suspicions were confirmed when he saw a massive concrete door at the end of the corridor. The door was guarded by a formidable contingent of twelve soldiers, all of them armed with MG5 machine guns. By now, Archer knew exactly where they were going. Upon reaching the colossal door that stood the height of three men, the trio was halted by a stern-looking captain named Stiller. He offered a crisp salute to Major Fulroy, and then, in an almost apologetic manner, requested the Major to surrender his Glock sidearm. Fulroy complied without hesitation, and Archer and Jennings followed suit by handing their pistols to Captain Stiller's subordinates. With the sidearm secured, Stiller signalled for the massive doors to be opened. Slowly, the immense barriers began to move, sliding to the side and revealing the enigmatic space beyond. Following in Major Fulroy's footsteps, Archer entered the vast, cavernous space that stretched out before him. The sheer size of the room was awe-inspiring. Rows of eight missile launch pads were neatly arranged, and a total of sixteen missiles stood tall and menacing, poised to deliver devastation to any adversaries of the state. The missiles were adorned in bright neon green, each one bearing the same ominous name, Hammerstone. The ceiling of this colossal hall was box-like in structure, matching the exterior structure Archer had observed earlier. It was designed to open swiftly and efficiently, standing ever ready for the launch of a nuclear weapon should the need ever arise. 
The sheer magnitude of the weaponry and the implications of their presence weighed heavily on Archer's mind as he stood amidst this chamber of unparalleled power. Behold, the heart of World's Terminal, our nation's last line of defence, existing only so that it had never be needed, Fulroy stated meaningfully, and Archer couldn't but nod in wholehearted agreement. As Archer stood there, surrounded by the intimidating presence of those massive nuclear missiles, a moment of deep introspection washed over him. The gravity of the situation, the existence of these apocalyptic weapons, and the absurdity of war as a whole struck him with an unsettling force. He contemplated the necessity of such destructive power, the madness that had led to its creation, and the consequences that humanity might face should it ever be unleashed. However, Archer knew that pondering these existential questions wouldn't serve his current mission. He had a task at hand, a duty to fulfill in ensuring the security of this facility and the world it protected. With a deep breath, he refocused, knowing that his expertise would help safeguard these deadly instruments of war from falling into the wrong hands. Fulroy took the lead, guiding Archer and Jennings through the massive missile silo room, where each colossal missile stood like a sentinel of destruction. As they walked past each missile, Archer couldn't help but marvel at the sheer size and power of these weapons. Each one was a potential catastrophe waiting to happen, a reminder of the precarious balance of global security. Archer observed dozens and dozens of guards everywhere the eye could see. The sheer sight made him wonder how the island of Phoenix could even house such an amount of people. Then again, the accommodations on the base itself next to the armory had seemed enormous. Van Riek Archer, while it's theoretically possible to attempt a breach from the seaside, digging through bedrock underwater, our security measures are not limited to just the surface. We have ground-penetrating radar systems installed inside the cliff face. Any excavation, no matter how stealthy, would trigger an immediate alarm in our control room, Fulroy said calmly and confidently. But something caught Archer's attention. He stopped in his tracks. Excavation? Are you telling me that there are sensors only inside the cliff and not on the face of it? Archer began. Worry had crawled down his spine. I need to see the cliff face, he continued. Fulroy and Jennings looked at each other, realizing their much-requested specialist had spotted something that required urgent attention. It took them nearly twenty minutes to exit the main building. While Archer felt a sense of relief to be back in the open summer air again, he also felt a sense of urgency to reach the cliffside. As Archer, Fulroy and Jennings reached the ten-metre-tall barbed wire fence at the edge of the cliffs, Archer couldn't shake the feeling of unease that had settled over him. The proximity of the missile silos to the cliff face was much closer than he had initially realised, and it troubled him deeply. He glanced over the edge and saw the waves crashing against the cliff a hundred metres below. The sheer drop was daunting, but Archer knew that with the right equipment and determination, it was theoretically possible to climb down or reach the facility from the ocean. Worse yet, Archer saw no sign of sensors on the cliff face. Fulroy's face told the story. He had come to the same realization as Archer. You really think it'd be possible to climb up here? He asked. Archer shrugged his shoulders and cleared his throat. But of course, all you need is a good rope and Edmund Hillary. Chapter 7 in the hours following the security re-evaluation, Archer was astounded by the incredible efficiency of the Antnian war industry. Major Fulroy wasted no time in taking action based on Archer's observations. Within minutes of Archer's analysis of the cliff-face vulnerability, Fulroy had contacted Colonel Huganaga, who swiftly granted permission to begin the process of installing motion sensors and other security measures along the cliff-face. Archer observed a flurry of activity as engineers, technicians and soldiers mobilised to address the newfound security concern. Cranes were brought in to lift heavy equipment and teams worked tirelessly to install motion-sensing devices, cameras and additional fencing along the cliff edge. 
Archer heard a cliff sensor specialist or something of the like was being flown to the nearby Edwardian island of Aronia and then boated over. It was a testament to the military's ability to adapt and respond rapidly to emerging threats. Archer understood that it would take some time to install the sensors on the cliff face, but even though the sensors weren't installed yet, the two dozen engineers occupying the cliff face made it a far less attractive option for any potential intruders. Major Fulroy provided him with a clear schedule, instructing him to return to the facility at 4 p.m. the next day to assume command of the afternoon security shift. Fulroy assured Archer that his other recommendations would also be considered. With a swift salute, Major Fulroy dismissed Archer before disappearing back into the main building. Corporal Jennings, who had been present throughout the security re-evaluation, stepped forward. Follow me, Van Rijk. Let's get you a set of wheels. As Archer followed Corporal Jennings across the parking lot, he found himself admiring her graceful stride, captivated by the sway of her hips. However, his thoughts quickly shifted between concerns about his job, memories of Halaya, and his attraction to Aisha. Contrary to what may seem, Archer had always been a hopeless romantic at heart, and his emotions seemed to be pulling him in different directions. He couldn't help but acknowledge the impending challenges in his relationship with Halaya, especially as the reality of his long-distance job sank in. The idea of pursuing other options crossed his mind. Here we go. Corporal Jennings's quick words pulled him back to reality. Archer looked at the row of half a dozen brand new army green sedans, and it was clear that these vehicles were top-of-the-line ant motor adventurers. Each one appeared to be a late model, sleek and robust design. He knew adventurers had powerful engines, boasted four-wheel drive capabilities, and seemed built for speed and durability. Their military-grade appearance hinted at their ruggedness and reliability, suitable for the demands of the island. Corporal Jennings handed Archer a key. The last one is yours, Van Rijk, sir, she said. Archer nodded in gratitude. Thank you, Corporal. Anything else? No, not right now, Archer said and smiled. Jennings saluted him quickly. Enjoy the rest of your day, sir. You too, Archer returned the salute, nodded, and watched Jennings stride back towards the main building. Archer stepped into his new car and was immediately impressed by the interior. The seats were sleek and comfortable, adorned with smooth leather upholstery. The dashboard featured modern technology, including a high-resolution touchscreen display, a GPS navigation system, and various controls for climate, entertainment, and communication. The overall design was sophisticated and offered a blend of comfort and functionality. Archer grabbed the steering wheel, feeling its firm grip, and leaned forward, taking in the luxurious yet high-tech surroundings. Deep sigh. It had indeed been quite a day. Archer started the car's engine and smoothly exited the parking lot. The vehicle's performance was impressive, and Archer couldn't help but enjoy the ride. After passing through three security checks, he found himself back on the road to town. He couldn't help but admire the breathtaking natural beauty of the island once more. The rocky landscape stretched out before him, adorned with rugged cliffs. The late afternoon sun bathed the island in a warm, golden glow, casting long shadows and creating a serene atmosphere. In the distance, the vast expanse of the Atlantic Ocean stretched out to the horizon, its waters glistening under the sun's gentle touch. The ocean's tranquil blue surface extended beyond the island, creating a sense of calm and tranquility that contrasted with the day's intense activities. The combination of the rocky terrain, the warm afternoon sun, and the endless expanse of the ocean on the horizon painted a picturesque scene that reminded Archer of the island's remote and captivating charm. The increased traffic during this time of day was noticeable, and Archer checked his watch to see that it was close to 5 p.m. The idea of enjoying a cold beer after the demanding day he had was quite appealing. He pulled the car up in front of Tom's bar and stepped onto the sidewalk. As he did, he couldn't help but recall the altercation that had taken place on that very pavement the previous evening, adding a layer of unease to his return to town. 
It was more quiet this time of day. Fishermen were out to sea, no doubt. To no surprise, Tom was behind the bar again. He looked up as Archer entered the bar, a warm smile spreading across his weathered face. He nodded at Archer, acknowledging his presence. Welcome back, Van Reek, he greeted, his voice carrying a friendly tone. Archer nodded, approached the bar and took a seat on one of the stools. I hope I'm still welcome here, Tom, he leaned in and smiled. Tom chuckled and shook his head. You're always welcome here. In fact, I should be thanking you for taking care of those guys. People like that are bad for business, Tom said while grabbing and opening a beer. He gave it to Archer. On the house, Tom said. Archer laughed. You know, this here is what's bad for business, Archer said. Tom grinned. It keeps you coming back, doesn't it? He replied. They laughed. As Archer took a long sip of the cold beer, he could feel the tension of the day slowly melting away. The familiar taste of the local brew was comforting, and the atmosphere of Tom's bar provided a sense of solace he sorely needed. The bar was dimly lit, with the afternoon sunlight streaming through the windows, casting warm golden hues across the worn wooden surfaces. As he sat there, Surrounded by the low hum of conversations from the few patrons scattered about, something nagged at the back of Archer's mind. It was a thought, an idea, something he couldn't quite shake off. Those troublemakers from last night. You didn't happen to know them? Oh, yes, I did, Tom said, with a tone that implied he had believed Archer knew them just as well. Their army. They work at the world's terminal. Tom's words hit Archer like a sledgehammer. Sitting there in Tom's bar, Archer's mind raced as he delved deeper into the implications of the revelation. The fact that his attackers were connected to World's Terminal added a sinister layer to the situation. He had brushed off the attack as a random act of violence, but now it was apparent that it was anything but random. The realization left him feeling vulnerable and exposed. Questions swirled in his mind like a turbulent storm. Why had they targeted him specifically? Was it to sabotage his security re-evaluation? And the most pressing question of all, who was pulling the strings behind this covert operation? Trust became a rare commodity in this environment, and Archer found himself second-guessing everyone he had encountered so far. He needed to take action, to alert someone about this threat. But the dilemma remained. Who could he truly trust with this information? The bonds of loyalty and deception were intricately woven in this world, and Archer knew that making the wrong move could have dire consequences. Van Rieke? Tom's query snapped Archer out of his thoughts. Archer quickly rose to his feet. I need to go, I'm afraid, Archer said as calmly as he could. Tom nodded understandingly. I hope you'll be back, he said. I will. I will, Archer replied, while almost out of the door already. Archer drove back past the downtown area, past the church and the ominous cemetery that stood on the end of the cliffs. The events of the past 24 hours swirled in his mind like a storm. The questions about his assailants, their motives, and who might be pulling their strings weighed heavily on him. He couldn't shake the feeling that the security re-evaluation would prove more crucial than ever considered, that the false alarm incident and his assault were merely the beginning of something far more sinister. Archer arrived at his new house in the better part of town and parked in the short driveway. He realized this would be his first night there after spending the previous one in a jail cell. Inside his house, Archer felt the need to refuel both his body and mind. He checked the fridge and found it stocked with groceries, a thoughtful touch from whoever had arranged his accommodation. Without wasting any time, he quickly prepared his favorite snack, a maple syrup sandwich. The simple act of making it brought a hint of comfort, a taste of normalcy amidst the chaos. With the sandwich in hand, Archer settled and savored the familiar taste of the majestic sandwich with a nagging thought tugged at the back of his mind. It became increasingly clear that in addition to the official duties of conducting the security re-evaluation and overseeing the third security shift, he had an unspoken, hidden mission on the island, one that only he seemed to be aware of. 
With each bite of his sandwich, Archer's determination grew stronger. He knew that uncovering the truth behind the mysterious assailants, their hidden agenda and their puppet master was a task he couldn't ignore. It was a mission that would require him to navigate a complex web of secrecy, deceit and danger, all while ensuring the safety of the facility and the powerful Hammerstone missiles it held. As the afternoon sunlight filtered through the windows of his new home, Archer pondered the challenges that lay ahead, knowing that he was about to embark on a mission that could have far-reaching consequences for both him and the security of the nation. After a long and steamy shower, Archer changed into more comfortable attire, opting for a simple black t-shirt and lightweight black shorts. He felt a weariness in his bones that came not just from the day's events, but also from the weight of the hidden mission that now rested on his shoulders. He longed for a good night's sleep and a way to take his mind off the complex web of secrets that surrounded World's Terminal. As he settled into the living room of his new house, Archer found himself yearning for a source of entertainment, something to distract him from his racing thoughts. The absence of a television made him contemplate whether he could use his influence to have one installed. Probably, but not tonight. In the meantime, Archer turned to his trusty smartphone for entertainment. He briefly thought about reaching out to Halaya, but couldn't bring himself to lie to her any further. Instead, he decided on the Nicholson Blazers facing off against the Tabany Pythons. It was a temporary escape, he knew. The gridiron game ended with the Nicholson Blazers emerging as the clear victors, scoring three touchdowns in the fourth quarter to secure a dominating 28-3 win. Due to the one-sided nature of the game, it failed to fully divert Archer's thoughts from the pervasive mysteries that now plagued him. As the evening descended and darkness enveloped the island, Archer's anxiety intensified. He couldn't shake the feeling that a target was firmly fixed on his back, and he was acutely aware of the potential dangers that lurked in the shadows. After the game concluded, he retired to his new, surprisingly comfortable bed. He made it significantly less comfortable by placing his brand new Glock under the pillow. Chapter 8 Archer's night was restless plagued by racing thoughts and the looming uncertainties that weighed heavily on his mind. When morning finally arrived, he resolved to clear his mind through exercise. He dressed in athletic attire, laced up his running shoes, and embarked on a jog through the quiet neighborhood surrounding his new home. The neighborhood featured a series of similar houses, many of which housed cars that were strikingly similar to his own. Several of these residences were clearly occupied by officers working at World's Terminal. As he jogged past, he observed the various houses and made mental notes. One of the houses stood out as particularly luxurious, leading him to assume that it belonged to Colonel Hugenager himself. However, the absence of a car in the driveway suggested that the Colonel was already deep in the day's schedule. After another refreshing shower, Archer prepared himself a simple lunch although he didn't pay much attention to what he was eating. His mind was preoccupied with the secret mission he had unofficially taken upon himself. As he ate, he made mental notes to be extra vigilant and observant regarding the trustworthiness of everyone he worked with at World's Terminal. Archer knew that uncovering the truth behind the mysterious assailants and their intentions was paramount, and he couldn't afford to trust anyone blindly. The assailants had likely reported their failed mission to whoever they answered to. If the person responsible had any sense, they would ensure that Archer wouldn't run into them at World's Terminal if they were indeed soldiers. While Archer only had Tom's perspective on the matter, for some reason he trusted the old bartender's intuition. Tom's insight had already proven valuable, and Archer believed he might be onto something. After 3 p.m., Archer meticulously dressed in his crisp uniform, ensuring that his pistol was properly holstered. With determination in his eyes, he started his car and began the drive back to World's Terminal. He had a strong desire to arrive with ample time to spare. Passing through the security check smoothly, he entered the main building, impressively early, a full 30 minutes before his shift was scheduled to officially begin. 
Seeking a quick caffeine boost, Archer made his way to the cafeteria. To his surprise, he found Major Fulroy and Colonel Huganaga seated at the same table he had occupied the previous day. Their presence immediately captured his attention. His captured theirs. Van Reek Archer, Huganaga hollered. Get yourself a cup and join us, please, he continued. Yes, sir. Archer nodded and headed for the counter. The cafeteria, typically a bustling place during meal times, now had a more subdued atmosphere as it was situated between lunch and dinner hours. Archer approached the counter and poured himself a cup of hot coffee, the rich aroma permeating the air as he did so. The steam rose from the cup as he carried it over to the table where the two high-ranking officers sat. Huganaga nodded for Archer to take a seat. Van Riek, the Major and I were discussing some of your most excellent remarks during your re-evaluation, Huganaga said. Thank you, sir, Archer replied. Your observation of the cliff face could prove crucial. I don't know how, during all these years, such didn't even pop into our heads, the Colonel continued. Archer nodded understandingly. Well, if I may, sir, not everyone is a rock climber. But that's why you asked me here, sir. I've been to places not many have, he said. Both Huganagar and Fulroy nodded. The Van Reek's perspective and perception are impeccable, Fulroy commended Archer, aiming his words to Huganagar. Archer blushed. Fulroy finished his cup of coffee. Well, since the Van Reek is already here, why don't we get this out of the way? Fulroy said, and reached into his pocket. He pulled out a keycard. The keys to the kingdom, Fulroy said. Archer extended his hand and attempted to take the keycard. Fulroy's grip was strong, almost too strong, and his expression stern. Take good care of it, Fulroy said, smiled, and let go. Archer smiled back, but couldn't but wonder what Fulroy meant with such a gesture. There are only two master keys. One is in my possession at all times, the other with the shift commander. When your shift begins, you'll receive it from Major Fulroy. Once it ends, you'll personally hand it over to Captain Rush, Huganagar instructed, as Archer put the keycard into his chest pocket. Yes, sir, Archer said. Fulroy tapped Archer on the shoulder as he rose. I'll be heading out then, Fulroy said, a full fifteen minutes before his shift ended. He looked at Huganagar, who seemed to somewhat reluctantly accept Fulroy's exit with a nod. Good luck then, Van Riek, Fulroy said, and walked out of the cafeteria. Huganaga's eyes shifted and met Archer's gaze. They both seemed to agree there was more to Fulroy's character than met the eye. Glenn's been troubled ever since his divorce, Huganaga began. But he's a good man, he concluded. Archer and Colonel Huganaga sipped their coffees in the quiet corner of the cafeteria. The aroma of freshly brewed coffee hung in the air as they discussed the responsibilities and expectations of Archer's new role as the shift commander. The colonel, with his years of experience and deep knowledge of the facility, imparted valuable advice to Archer. His words were laden with wisdom and caution, emphasizing the gravity of the task at hand. Archer listened attentively, his gaze unwavering as he absorbed every detail. As their conversation came to an end, Colonel Huganaga gave Archer a reassuring nod. The officer's eyes held a sense of trust, and his demeanor exuded confidence in Archer's abilities. It was evident that the colonel believed in him and the role he was about to undertake. Before parting ways, Colonel Huganaga leaned in slightly, his tone serious and resolute. He urged Archer to reach out to him immediately if any issues or concerns arose during his shift. With a firm handshake and a final word of encouragement, Colonel Huganaga rose from his seat. Archer followed suit, both men leaving their empty coffee cups behind. Outside the cafeteria, Colonel Huganaga directed Archer to seek out Lieutenant Wellsby, who would provide him with an office room. Other than setting a base of operations there, Archer was free to supervise, patrol, fraternize with his subordinates, and roam the entire facility as he saw fit. Archer found Lieutenant Wellsby's at his desk by Huganaga's office promptly at four, the official start of his first shift as the commanding security officer. 
Wellesby turned out to be mild-mannered and soft-spoken, an almost Clark Kent-like figure. Archer took an immediate liking to Wellesby. The lieutenant then led Archer to his own new office, along the same hallway. The office was sparsely furnished, with functionality taking precedence over extravagance. A simple wooden desk stood at the centre of the room, accompanied by a comfortable chair that invited anyone to sit and focus on their duties. The desk was meticulously organised, with a laptop neatly placed to the side, ready for Archer's use. A paper notepad lay nearby, awaiting any handwritten notes or observations. Stacks of documents, reports, and seemingly a map of the facility were neatly arranged on the desk's surface, containing information that Archer might find valuable in his new role. The room was designed for efficiency, with no unnecessary distractions to divert one's attention from the task at hand. The most striking feature of the office was the large window that provided a breathtaking view, the Stanian mainland at the edge of the horizon. From this vantage point, Archer could gaze out at the vast expanse of the ocean, the distant horizon merging seamlessly with the sky. The view was both serene and awe-inspiring, serving as a reminder of the significance of their mission and the responsibility that came with it. After offering his services if Archer were to have any questions, Wellesby excused himself. Archer leaned over the desk, his eyes fixed on the large map that lay before him. The map was meticulously detailed, a topographical representation of World's Terminal and its immediate surroundings. As he inspected the map, he recognised several familiar locations from the previous day's tour of the facility. The main building, which housed the administrative offices and the security command centre, was prominently marked on the map. He traced the layout of the missile silos with his finger, recalling the sight of the Hammerstone missiles and the immense underground chambers that housed them. The map showed the proximity of the silos to the cliff face, a reminder of the security vulnerabilities he had identified during the security re-evaluation. Arriving, Archer had noted the work on the cliff face was almost completed, reassuringly so. Archer's gaze then shifted to the various security checkpoints and access points that encircled the facility. As he continued to explore the map, Archer noted the locations of key infrastructure, such as the control room and backup power generators and the hydroelectric power plant. These were essential components of the facility's security measures, ensuring that critical systems would remain operational even in the event of an emergency. Archer opened the laptop, logged in with his army credentials, and found it to be a standard work computer with no specific files or documents of note. Satisfied that everything was in order on that front, he turned his attention to the paper notepad on his desk. With a sense of purpose, Archer decided to utilise the notepad as a tool to keep track of his secret mission, assessing the trustworthiness of individuals within World's Terminal. He took a moment to write down some initial thoughts and guidelines for his mission. Create a list of individuals who might have been involved in the attack or had motives to harm me. Pay close attention to the actions, interactions and behaviour of these individuals. Look for any signs of suspicious or unusual activity. Discreetly gather information about the backgrounds, affiliations and personal histories of potential suspects. Use available resources and contacts. Keep this mission covert. Avoid discussing it with anyone unless absolutely necessary. If compelling evidence or leads are discovered, report findings to Major Fulroy and Colonel Huganaga. But were those two worth of trust, either? Archer didn't know, but it had to be a question he'd have to determine the answer to as he went along. For the next few hours, Archer patrolled and continued familiarising himself with the environment and the staff on his shift, both inside and outside the facility. One particularly pleasant discovery was that Sergeant Williamson, the weapons master, was part of the personnel working during his shift. In the armoury, Archer had the chance to meet several members of the Quick Response Strike Team, which was under the leadership of Sergeant Carruthers, who would be Archer's second-in-command during a red alert. Carruthers, an experienced special operator with a buzz cut and a short beard, left a strong impression on Archer. 
The sergeant's professionalism and sense of respect were evident as he quickly extended his hand for a firm handshake when meeting Archer. Archer appreciated this move. It set a nice example for Carruthers' teammates from the get-go, giving little chance for the common special operators versus Cake Eater's rivalry. Archer made his way to the cliff face, where the installation of sensors and security measures was underway. The fading daylight cast a warm, golden hue over the area as the workers diligently hung from the fences, installing what looked like a new motion sensor on the surface of the cliff face. Archer returned to the main building and decided to pay a visit to the control room. He made his way to the elevator, which took him down to the lower levels of the building. Once he arrived, he went through another security check before entering the control room. To his surprise, Corporal Danvers was not in the control room at this time. Instead, he found another young corporal in charge, who introduced himself as Carlson. Carlson promptly saluted Archer upon entry. Everything appeared to be in order, with the monitors displaying various surveillance feeds and the staff busy at their stations. Satisfied with what he saw, Archer encouraged Carlson to continue his duties diligently and told him to report any irregularities or concerns, no matter how minor they might seem. With confidence in Carlson's ability to manage the control room effectively, Archer decided to leave the rest of the basement to the capable guards and return to his office on the fourth floor. Along the way, he exchanged polite greetings with unfamiliar faces, but there was a lingering sense of disappointment that Corporal Jennings, with her striking presence, was not on duty at that moment. As Archer continued with his shift, he found himself caught between two pressing matters. On one hand, there was the mystery surrounding his assailants, wondering who they were, what role they played in the larger scheme of things, and how they had seemingly disappeared. On the other hand, there was his relationship with Halaya. He knew that he needed to have an honest conversation with her about his deployment and the potential risks involved. He couldn't keep her in the dark any longer, especially now that he was in a position of greater responsibility. As the hours passed, Archer resolved to call Halaya once his shift ended. He knew it was time to share the truth with her, regardless of how difficult that conversation might be. The thought of finally opening up to her about his deployment and the dangers that came with it loomed large in his mind, and he hoped that their relationship would withstand the challenges that lay ahead. Archer's late-night coffee break was a welcome respite from his patrol duties. The cafeteria, illuminated by soft overhead lights, had a tranquil atmosphere. A few other officers occupied nearby tables, engaged in quiet conversations or sipping their own cups of coffee. Archer nodded in acknowledgement as they exchanged respectful gestures. His coffee, black with a touch of milk, was a comforting reminder of home. It was a small ritual he had carried with him, something his mother used to say. As he took a sip and savoured the familiar taste, he turned his attention to the large window overlooking the Atlantic Ocean. The moonlight bathed the water's surface, casting an enchanting glow that shimmered in the night. Archer's attention was abruptly drawn away from the serene view of the moonlit ocean as he spotted a figure passing by the cafeteria. The reflection on the window revealed that this person was moving with haste and a hint of discretion, as if trying not to draw attention to themselves. It didn't take long for Archer to recognize the identity of this individual, Captain Rush. Captain Rush's early arrival, a full hour before the commencement of his shift, struck Archer as peculiar. Not exactly illegal, but weird, enough to question. Archer couldn't ignore the nagging suspicion that Captain Rush's early and seemingly secretive arrival might be connected to something more than a diligent work ethic. Archer rose from his seat, leaving his untouched cup of coffee behind. He discreetly followed Captain Rush, tracking his movements through the lobby and front hallways. Archer assumed that Rush would utilize the elevator, however. To his surprise, Archer saw Rush's figure slip into the stairway. Archer waited for a brief moment, calculating that Rush would take the stairs to a floor corresponding to his own office, perhaps indicating that he was merely being diligent by arriving early for his night shift. 
However, the manner in which Rush had entered the stairway, moving with stealth and discretion, raised a flag in Archer's mind. Not necessarily a red flag, but at least pinkish. He gave Rush some head start, allowing him time to ascend a few flights of stairs. After roughly a minute had passed, Archer signalled the elevator to the fourth floor, where he assumed Rush would head. Archer arrived on the fourth floor and began searching for the door marked with Captain Rush's nameplate, situated only a short distance from his own office. His footsteps were quiet, and he moved with a sense of caution as he approached the door. The door wasn't fully closed, leaving just a slight gap that caught Archer's attention. Years of military training and a heightened sense of vigilance compelled Archer to take precautionary measures. He instinctively placed his hand near his holster, ready for any potential threat. In the world of security and covert operations, one learned to live with a constant awareness of potential dangers. In one fluid motion, Archer knocked on the door, giving Captain Rush a brief opportunity to react or respond. Then, without hesitation, he pushed the door wide open. Captain Rush flinched and dropped a folder he had been holding. Archer's eyes quickly scanned the interior of Rush's office, taking in the various details that revealed more about the man who occupied it. The walls of the office were adorned with an impressive collection of military medals and ribbons, a testament to Captain Rush's years of dedicated service. Each medal represented a story, a chapter in his career, and a commitment to duty. On one corner of the desk, there was a collection of framed photographs. Archer's eyes were drawn to a particular picture that depicted a slightly younger and clean-shaven Captain Rush. In the photograph, Rush was dressed in a crisp military uniform, standing beside a beautiful bride. The woman held a baby in her arms, and they all wore smiles of pure happiness. It was evident that this was a cherished family photo, a reminder of a life beyond the confines of military service. The office was a reflection of the man himself, decorated with honours and personal memories, yet it held an air of secrecy and tension that Archer couldn't ignore. Most so from Rush himself. With a grunt, Captain Rush reached down to pick up the folder he had dropped. What the hell are you sneaking around like that for, Van Reek Archer? Nearly gave me a heart attack, Rush scolded, as he lifted the folder and threw it on a pile, front page down. But Archer had seen what folder it was. He didn't let it show to Rush, however. Visibly, Archer grinned. My apologies, Captain. Just making sure your watch runs right. Rush raised his head with an obvious expression of plain confusion. What's that supposed to mean? Rush asked frustratedly. It's barely eleven, Captain. Sir, your shift starts in an hour. Oh, Rush said, almost convincingly surprised but something told Archer he knew exactly what time it was. Well, I like to be early, he continued. For a moment, the two stared each other down, both men stern. Archer then smiled. Good, good. Here's your master key. Doubt I'll be needing it any more tonight, Archer said, and reached into his pocket for the master key. Rush stepped from behind his desk and took it from him quickly. Thank you, Van Reek Archer. Rush spoke with a formal but annoyed tone. You can go home now. I'll take over from here, Rush continued. Archer frowned ever so slightly, but then nodded. If you say so, sir, Archer said and made his exit. Close the door, Rush said, and Archer did as asked. Archer didn't mind leaving his shift a little early. He had some thinking to do. Perhaps Rush wanted to be thorough, get his shift started early, the man was used to working shifts four hours longer than now anyway. But as Archer took the elevator downstairs, he couldn't help but think back about the folder he had seen Rush skim through, drop, and then obviously try to hide from Archer's eyes. He had seen it only at glance, but he had no doubts about the folder's containment. It was Archer's folder. Chapter 9 After his encounter with Captain Rush, Archer had a lot to think about. He finished his shift at World's Terminal and on the way back to town decided to call Halaya. He had initially planned to tell her the full extent of his deployment, including his secret mission, but Rush's odd behaviour had raised suspicions 
and added to his stress, and telling Halaya something that might make her lose her temper once again wouldn't have helped one bit. The drive through the Starry Island night was somewhat relaxing, with Halaya mainly talking about her day, working at an animal shelter. Archer had always admired her passion for animals, yet it just didn't feel right, not like before anyway. He couldn't shake the feeling that the distance between them had grown wider and wider. Archer listened intently, sure, offering words of encouragement and support. But in the back of his mind, he knew he had to keep his own secrets, at least until he could figure out what was happening at World's Terminal and who might be targeting him. The weight of his double life was starting to take a toll on him, and he hoped that somehow he could find a way to balance it all. He didn't know one yet, but he knew how to drown it. Archer closed the call with Halaya and pulled up at Tom's bar. He knew from the sign that it was open until 1am every day, so he had a good hour and a half to reflect and soul-search. He spent his time chatting with Tom and the other patrons, hoping that the casual conversations and camaraderie would help ease his troubled thoughts. As closing time approached, Archer said his goodbyes and headed back to his house. He took a long, contemplative shower before finally settling into bed. However, he couldn't relax completely, and he made sure he once again slept with one hand on the grip of his glock. All this settled into a daily routine for Archer. For the next week, he devoted seven days a week to his duty at World's Terminal. He immersed himself in the facility, patrolling its various areas and meticulously getting to know the layout. Archer made an effort to build rapport with his fellow soldiers, particularly the ones on his shift, which included Lieutenant Wellesby, Sergeants Carruthers and Williamson, and Corporal Carlson. Nobody saw anything unusual. He saw nothing unusual about them. He spoke to them, observed their behaviour, and learned about their experiences. But nothing struck him as unusual or suspicious. They seemed like dedicated professionals and he couldn't detect anything out of the ordinary about them. The work on the cliff face had been finished quickly, and everyone, especially Major Fulroy who had ordered the work, was pleased with the swiftness of the engineers, but especially the man shipped in from the mainland. He had introduced himself as a former special operator, engineer and a defence technology specialist, whom Archer didn't know, to his great surprise, by the name of Calvin Jones. Archer had taken a liking to his never-met-before, short, bearded and dark-skinned but sophisticated colleague, who seemed to know his craft and spoke in an eccentric but professional manner. A scar on his left cheek spoke of a rich past, probably one of Archer's calibre. Before the start of his shifts, Archer would often engage in casual conversations with Major Fulroy. They discussed the security measures, and Archer was reassured by Fulroy's confidence that the added safeguards on the cliff face would effectively deter any potential intruders from reaching World's Terminal. Fulroy didn't fail to mention Calvin Jones' great work on the cliff face, but it was apparent Fulroy had also become a great supporter of Archer's. Archer felt like a friend in such high places was great to have, especially if he ever wanted a post somewhere else. At the end of his shifts, he would hand over the master key to Captain Rush. Archer noticed a significant change in Rush's demeanour as opposed to Archer's first night on duty. The sneakiness that had caught his attention earlier seemed to have dissipated, but their interactions remained cold and distant. He couldn't imagine what exactly Rush had against him, but something about it seemed odd, especially in the circumstances they were in. One of those routinely days, Colonel Huganaga requested to meet with Archer. Archer had contemplated discussing Captain Rush's suspicious behaviour with the colonel, but he hesitated to make any allegations without concrete evidence. Accusing a superior officer without just cause could lightly, very lightly, be perceived as insubordination and disrespect, something Archer aimed to avoid like the plague. As he sat in the colonel's office, the question regarding oddities among the staff lingered. Huganaga was likely alluding to something specific, but Archer didn't want to reveal his suspicions without more substantial information. The thought that Rush might have been a Stanian spy or saboteur was still a distant possibility, 
and Archer acknowledged that Captain Rush's curiosity or his own paranoia may have played a role in the previous incident. Archer's response to the colonel was careful and non-committal. He admitted to not having noticed anything unusual among the staff thus far, hoping that the colonel would provide more details or guidance to shed light on the matter. Huganaga seemed to accept the fact, and Archer was dismissed back into his routine. Huganaga himself seemed the most trustworthy of all, an almost Dumbledore-like figure guiding Archer through the mysterious fog that still surrounded the island of Phoenix and the world's terminal. Archer's late-night calls to Halaya on the drive home had become a routine as well, yet a painfully emotional and complex part of his life. The calls were a lifeline connecting him to the world outside the military, but they also served as a constant reminder of the stark contrast between his two worlds. Their conversations often fluctuated between moments of genuine connection and strained attempts at normalcy. There were nights when the conversations felt natural, when they shared dreams, hopes, and the mundane details of their daily lives. Those were the moments that reminded Archer why he loved Halaya so deeply, why she was the anchor in his tumultuous life. However, there were other nights when the weight of Archer's job, his experiences, and his secrets loomed over, over everything, simply. He could sense the distance between them growing as they struggled to bridge the gap between his life of military service, his job, which had included taking lives, and now consisted primarily of safeguarding weapons that could kill millions in the blink of an eye. Archer questioned whether he could ever fully open up to her about the dark, dangerous aspects of his world. Would she understand? Would she accept him for who he was, both the protector and the warrior? He knew one thing for sure. One thing that helped. Every night, like clockwork, Archer would head to Tom's bar after his shift and the call with Halaya. He appreciated the camaraderie of the patrons, Tom the bartender specifically, the welcoming atmosphere, and the opportunity to unwind. In this local establishment, he could briefly set aside the complexities of his military life and immerse himself in the simpler pleasures of small-town living. Tom's bar had become more than just a place to have a drink. It was a refuge from the turbulent worlds that Archer inhabited. It was a reminder that in the midst of his demanding and secretive life, especially his third, secret mission, he could still find moments of normalcy and human connection. As Archer pulled up to Tom's bar, mere twelve hours before he'd have spent two full weeks on the island, after the clock displayed exactly half-past midnight, the island's weather had taken a noticeable turn, signalling the approach of autumn. The day had been gloomy, with overcast skies and a slightly cooler temperature than usual. His call with Halaya had been even colder than usual. His own deadline of a couple of weeks was approaching, and Archer had simply muttered something about it, taking a little longer than that. A faint chill lingered in the air as Archer parked the car and stepped out to the pavement. Archer couldn't help but sense the imminent arrival of rain. Although he had yet to experience the island's rainy season, his instincts told him it was only a matter of days away. The atmosphere had shifted, and Archer felt a palpable change in the air as he parked his car. The island itself seemed to be undergoing a transformation, mirroring his own uncertainty and shifting circumstances. As he entered Tom's bar, he hoped to find solace and warmth in its familiar surroundings, seeking refuge from the encroaching autumn, both in nature and in his life. In Tom's bar, Archer went about his routine and greeted Tom as he typically did. The familiar faces of the regular patrons filled the establishment, creating a cosy and inviting atmosphere. However, one significant change caught Archer's eye. The commonly empty corner table was now occupied. There, sitting at the corner table, was military police sergeant Marjores, out of uniform. Her striking oil-black hair cascaded down in loose curls, and she sported a leather jacket, giving her a confident and enigmatic aura. Quickly, Archer grabbed his usual local craft beer from Tom. Despite being engrossed in her phone, Marjores lifted her gaze when she noticed Archer approaching, and a warm smile graced her lips. Well, well. Van Riek Archer. Looking for trouble? Marjores asked with a grin. 
Archer smiled as she respectfully stood by the table. Only trouble I've had on this island is you, he said. Majori smiled. This seat taken? Archer asked. Unfortunately not, Majori said, a little sorrowly. Wondering what she might have meant, Archer sat down. Majori smiled, lifted her whiskey glass and took a sip. My wife threw me out, Marjorie said. She had decided to answer Archer's question before he could ask it. Archer nodded understandingly. Don't ask why, it's not the first time. I won't, Archer replied and took a sip of his beer. Majore seemed to look at his fingers as he did. How about you? What about me? Is there someone on the mainland waiting for you? I don't see a ring. There is. Lucky girl. How so? I've seen worse looking guys on this island, Mayori said with a wink. Don't think that's a surprise. I wrinkle from far less sunlight, Archer grinned. Majores nodded with a smile, then seemed to look over Archer's shoulder to the outside. That's about to change, though. Fall's coming. I felt that today, yeah, Archer confirmed. For a moment, they just sat in silence, drinking their beers. As Archer observed Marjorie's and her situation, he couldn't help but wonder about her domestic life, whether she or her wife was to blame for their apparent fallout, nagged at his curiosity. Yet, there was a feeling that Marjorie's may have been seeking someone to confide in. Thus, Archer waited. Your girl, how's she taking you being here? Marjorie's began instead. Archer shrugged his shoulders. I don't know, really. She seems to be all right with it. But to be fair, I haven't been completely straight with her, Archer heard himself say, almost in an out-of-body experience. He couldn't believe he was telling someone he barely knew. Perhaps it was he who needed a shoulder to cry on after all. She doesn't know you're here for good, Marjorie said with a grin. No, she doesn't. She doesn't know a whole lot about me, Archer said sternly. Marjorie's became serious wondered for a moment and took another sip. What's her name? Halaya. Halaya, be straight with Halaya. Tell her how you feel. Tell her who you really are. Yeah, Archer said. I don't know, he concluded. Marjorie scoffed. Look, Isabel didn't throw me out because she doesn't know who I am. Three years ago, I was serving in Stania, when three enemy fighters caught me by surprise. Alone. I might look like a strong girl, but you know it's a different ball game. You couldn't take on three men coming at you at once. What about me? They didn't kill me. I wanted them to. I don't have to tell you what they did to me, but I told Isabel. The same day, Marjorie's recalled. Archer was speechless in front of her drunken outburst. She knows exactly who I am, she concluded, and finished her drink. Why'd she throw you out then? Archer asked after a pause because we have a baby, and I'm not the mom, and I can be a real dick sometimes. I know. You put me in cuffs and all I did was get beat up, Archer said. Marjorie's looked at him with empty eyes, the liquor clearly having taken a toll on her. Perhaps he had gone a little too far. Then, out of nowhere, she started laughing. Archer smiled. Right, look, I've got to go win her back. Marjorie's began as she rised from the table. But before I go, I need your phone number, she said. Archer frowned. You sure that's a good idea, given your circumstances? I don't want to be a fallback, Archer grinned. Marjorie's grinned back. We've got security camera footage from the night of your assault. The angle's not good, so face recognition is a no-go, but you could show it around base. If they really are soldiers, like your friendly neighborhood bartender here says, someone's ought to recognize them, Marjorie's explained. Archer's eyes widened. That was one hell of a revelation. The potential value of the footage was massive. Access to the security camera footage could indeed provide crucial leads in identifying the individuals behind the attack, as well as help determine if there was any external threat to the facility. Gratefully, Archer agreed and exchanged numbers with Marjorie's. Great! And hey, talk to Halaya, Marjorie said as she walked out. I'll think about it, Archer said, as he finished his beer and waved goodbye to Marjorie's.
Archer walked over to the bar and ordered another craft from Tom. Barely had the door behind Marjorie's closed when it swung open again. The entrance revealed another familiar face, one he had missed dearly for over a week. In the split second before recognizing her, he had nearly mistaken her for Halaya due to the striking similarity in their facial features and physique. However, the distinct blonde hair set her apart. Corporal Jennings entered the bar, her long blonde hair tied in a cute ponytail, and she wore a beige bomber jacket that gave her a casual and approachable appearance. It was a pleasant surprise to see her again, and Archer couldn't help but feel a sense of relief and comfort at her presence after being apart for over a week. She exuded an aura of warmth and familiarity that was like a breath of fresh air in Archer's world. Archer returned Jennings' smile, but he could sense that something wasn't quite right. There was a hint of tension in the air, and he couldn't help but wonder what had brought her here. Van Riek Archer, sir. Jennings said as she climbed to a stool next to Archer on the bar. Archer grinned and extended his hand. Romeo, he said as Jennings frowned and lightly shook his hand. She smiled questioningly. Romeo? As in Romeo and Juliet? Yes, miss. That's a rare one. My parents were romantics, Archer said and sipped his beer. What are you drinking? He followed. Um. Apple cider, usually, Jennings said cautiously. Tom, the corporal's having an apple cider on my tab, Archer hollered to Tom, who was talking to Billy the fisherman on the other end of the bar. Coming right up, Van Riek, Tom said with a smile. He brought it over swiftly and winked at Archer. Thank you, sir, Jennings said as she received her drink. Archer sighed. What did I tell you about, sir, corporal? <laughs> with all due respect, sir, I'm not going to call you Romeo. Jennings giggled under her breath. Archer smiled. Archer will do just fine, Archer said. Jennings nodded. All right, Archer. I didn't tell you my name for nothing either. All right, Aisha. You remembered, Jennings said. And in an instant, Archer was convinced not a lot of people had done so with her. It made him feel sorrowful. He nodded, and for a moment they drank in silence. What brings you here at this hour? Archer said, and glanced at his watch, which was close to one in the morning. I, uh, broke up with my boyfriend, Jennings said. Archer nodded and took a long sip of his beer. I'm sorry, was it serious? I don't know, I hoped so. Was it something he did? No, it's more something you did. Something I did? Well, your arrival. Our shifts got all messed up. We don't see each other anymore. Ah, workplace relationship. You know Williamson from the Armory? I know, Williamson from the Armory. Well, him, Jennings said sorrowfully. Light bulb went off in Archer's head. Williamson had been transferred to his afternoon shift while Jennings worked the morning shift with Major Fulroy. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to mess it up for you, Archer said with a grin and finished his beer. Jennings finished hers. You can buy me another as reimbursement. For the next hour, Archer and Jennings engaged in a lively conversation, all the while enjoying their way too many drinks. Archer learned that Jennings was five years his junior and had spent most of her life on the island of Phoenix, apart from a three-year venture to study biology at the University of Converse, and when that hadn't panned out, six months in the Military Academy of Converse and a six-month deployment in the more peaceful regions of southern Stania. As Archer and Jennings continued their conversation, it became apparent to Archer that their similarities extended beyond their shared love for Gridiron. They both had lost their parents as teenagers, with the weight of adolescence resting heavily on their shoulders alone. Yet Archer couldn't help but recognize the stark contrast in their military experiences he understood that men often found camaraderie more easily within the military, while women often had to confront unfounded doubts and sexism. The fact that Jennings had persevered and earned such a high-value post at World's Terminal, no less, left Archer with a deep sense of respect for her determination and resilience. 
Tom had a tough time convincing his regular patrons to leave the bar, and it proved equally challenging to persuade Archer and Jennings to call it a night. Eventually, with some reluctance, they made their way outside. Once on the sidewalk, it became apparent that both were way too drunk to drive home, and both lived relatively close by, so the two of them decided to head in the direction of the better part of town. The night air was cool and the streets were dimly lit, offering a somewhat cosy atmosphere for their late-night conversation. Archer and Jennings shared stories, talked about their past experiences, and gradually the tension that had been building over the last week began to dissipate. As they strolled through the quiet streets, Archer couldn't help but feel a growing connection with Jennings and a sense of warmth he hadn't experienced in a long time. Suddenly, Archer and Jennings found themselves standing in front of the old church and its adjacent cemetery. The church was a modest, aged structure made of weathered white wood that had seen the passage of many years. It stood with a certain grace despite its age, and even in the dim moonlight, its exterior seemed well kept. Archer noticed the classic charm of the architecture, with a small steeple and a welcoming, if slightly worn, façade. The cemetery was equally compelling in the moon's soft glow. It stretched out behind the church, a tranquil space in stark contrast to the vibrancy of life it bordered. The grass was meticulously maintained, and gravestones stood in close proximity, revealing the final resting places of many. It was clear that generations of island residents had found their eternal peace in this small piece of land, and the cemetery seemed a testament to the passage of time and the memories of the island's inhabitants. Archer estimated that there were easily two to three hundred graves in the relatively small area, emphasizing how connected the people of the island were to its history. As Archer gazed beyond the cemetery's edge, he saw the cliff drop away dramatically. The moonlight reflected off the calm waters of the Atlantic Ocean below, creating a mesmerizing play of light. In that moment, he felt an overwhelming sense of isolation. The ocean stretched out endlessly before him. He had never been so far from home or from Halaya. This might be a little too soon, but do you want to meet my family? Jennings asked out of the blue. Archer was taken aback by the unexpected question, and he looked into Jennings' blue eyes with a mix of curiosity and caution. After a moment of contemplation, he nodded slowly. Jennings gently took his hand and began leading him toward the cemetery. The air was filled with an eerie sense of serenity as they walked through the rows of gravestones. They came to a halt in front of a substantial rocky headstone, almost evenly in the geographical centre of the cemetery. The headstone bore the inscription, Bruce and Francesca. Jennings, beloved husband and wife, father and mother. The dates on the stone revealed that they had both passed away a decade ago, almost to the day. Archer then noticed a smaller gravestone directly adjacent to that of Bruce and Francesca Jennings. It read, Tyson Jennings, and the death date was the same as that of the parents. What stood out was that Tyson had been born just half a year before his passing. The little gravestone told a heartbreaking story of a family's tragic loss, and Archer couldn't help but feel deeply moved by the sight. Archer turned to Jennings and looked to hear teary eyes. Car crash, Jennings said without turning to Archer. Coming to pick me from school, she continued. Archer said nothing. Finally, Jennings turned to him. Sometimes I speak to them, she said absent-mindedly. Do you believe they hear me? I won't lie to you. I don't think they do either, but I can't take the chance. What if they do? Jennings asked with a trembling tone. Archer nodded slowly. Do you mind? she asked. Archer shook his head. As Jennings stood by her parents' gravestone, Archer listened intently as she recounted recent events to her late parents, speaking to them as if they were there with her. She shared about her recent breakup with Sergeant Williamson, whom she had clearly introduced to before. Jennings greeted her little brother, who had never had the chance to grow old. Her words were filled with love and sadness, and Archer couldn't help but feel an overwhelming sense of empathy and compassion for her. 
His gaze was locked into some distant point in the ocean, but really, he wasn't looking at anything. Perhaps it was the effects of the booze wearing off, perhaps something else. But Archer couldn't help it. His heart was broken. Half because of Jennings' rueful life. Half because he didn't know what to do with his. This is my friend, Van Reek Archer, Archer heard Jennings say. He's helped me a lot. He's not like a lot of the other officers who boss me around, she said. In Archer's logical brain, he didn't exactly know if that was a correct statement, as they had barely worked together. Perhaps Jennings meant on a personal level. I like him, she said, and Archer didn't have to piece a puzzle together to tell that Jennings was at a breaking point and about to make a bad call that he didn't know if he'd have the urge to resist. As Jennings turned toward Archer, he noticed a subtle twitch in her lips. She placed her arm on his shoulder and drew herself closer. Their eyes met, and for a moment, Archer felt a powerful connection, an almost magnetic pull between them. He was on the verge of stepping closer, allowing himself to get lost in that moment. But something held him back. Later, Archer wanted to think it was his own strong moral compass, his conscience, that stopped him from kissing the very beautiful woman that practically threw herself at him. But in reality, it was that deep, meaningful gaze that Archer so much loved about Alia that stopped her from kissing Jennings. We can't do this, Archer said. Jennings' eyes widened. Why not? I'm an officer. It wouldn't look good, Archer gave a half-truth. Jennings tipped her head, exactly in the same manner as Halia sometimes did. Archer couldn't have felt more guilty. You've got someone back home, don't you? Jennings said disappointedly. I do. And not once did you mention her tonight. I'm sorry, Archer said, as Jennings pulled herself away from him. No, it's all my fault. Good-looking guy like yourself. Always got some cat to fool around with, Jennings said, suddenly sounding everything but herself. It's not like that, Archer said, but he knew any explanation was useless. He hadn't only disappointed himself and Jennings, but Halia especially. Whatever, Jennings said, and pushed past Archer. Archer tried to grab her gently, but she pushed him aside. Aisha, Archer asked gently, but she kept on going back towards the road. Corporal Jennings, Archer used a more authoritative tone, but there was no stopping her. As Jennings walked away with brisk, furious steps past the church, Archer was left standing there, contemplating his own emotions and the promises he had made. In the midst of his internal struggle, he decided it might be best not to follow her and to put some distance between them. He considered it best not to talk to her again, as he didn't want to complicate his life further. What the hell? Perhaps it was best to just outright throw himself over the edge of the cliff. Archer felt the cold night air and pushed his hands inside his uniform pockets. He watched Jennings disappear toward the suburbs thought to give herself a bit of a head start as to not appear creepy. He'd eventually have to head in the same direction anyway. But as he took a deep sigh and scanned the cemetery surroundings again, something caught his attention. There, against the white exterior of the old church, was the silhouette of a man in a long coat and a ranger-type beanie. He stood there like a lone sentinel in the night, and his presence was unmistakable. Especially when Archer's gaze reached him, the man took off like a racer. Archer sprinted past the church, heart pounding, with only a fleeting glimpse of the man's figure as he descended the narrow steps nestled between two houses. Archer's instincts kicked in, and he followed the trail of fast but increasingly distant footsteps. He dashed through the tight alleyways, the sound of the pursuit echoing against the walls. With each of Archer's long, trained steps, the distance between the two grew closer. Seeing the man's figure, Archer could tell he was bigger than him, and gratefully, much slower. The fleeing man had clearly figured this out as well. Desperation gripped the man as he hastily pushed a trash can into the middle of the alley, attempting to obstruct Archer's path. Archer's heart raced as he tried to leap over the obstacle but his foot struck a discarded trash bag just as he took the leap. The slippery bag caused him to lose his footing, and he tumbled backward, landing hard on the pavement. 
The sudden fall sent a shock of frustration and irritation through Archer. Quickly regaining his composure and his feet, he pushed himself up from the ground, narrowly avoiding hitting the back of his head on the pavement. Time for games was over. Time seemed to slow down as Archer pulled his Glock from its holster, swiftly chambering around. Just as Archer rounded the corner, he spotted the man's coat disappearing as he made a desperate dash towards a late-model sedan parked under a lamppost. His heart raced, and he approached the corner cautiously, gun pointed ahead. As he turned the corner, he locked eyes with the man at the other end of the long alley. But before Archer could identify him or react, the figure slid into the back seat of the car, which accelerated away in a hurry. Archer's gun remained poised, aimed at the fleeing vehicle. Too far. With a heavy sigh, Archer lowered his weapon, watching the taillights of the speeding sedan disappear into the night. It had been too dark, way too dark, to make out the license plate. One thing was for certain. The car had been an unmistakable shade of green. Chapter 10 Archer didn't sleep at all that night. He didn't just lay with a pistol under his pillow. The whole night, he sat up clutching the cold, hard grip of the Glock. A whirlwind of questions and doubts. The appearance of the man near the church, his escape, the green sedan, and the overall sense of unease in his new environment all pointed to one unsettling conclusion. There was a traitor within World's Terminal. But the identity of this traitor remained a mystery. Was it Captain Rush who had displayed odd behaviour, or was it someone else lurking in the shadows? Archer couldn't shake the feeling that there were forces at play beyond his understanding, and his sense of vulnerability grew with each passing moment. Something he had missed, or something he hadn't yet been able to miss. Dawn approached with a faint glimmer of sun, Archer sweaty of anxiety and the slight hangover he was battling. His mind was a battlefield of thoughts and emotions. He knew he had to find answers, expose the traitor, and secure his position at World's Terminal. The people he had come to care about, like Corporal Jennings, whatever she thought of him now, were now caught in the crossfire of this dangerous game, and he couldn't let their lives be at risk. Moreover, if the traitor was working with outside forces, especially the Stanian regime, it wasn't just those close to him that were at risk. The whole world was at risk. Archer knew he couldn't keep it all to himself anymore, but who in the blue moon could he trust with this? By the time the sun was high enough, Archer had managed to catch about an hour of sleep during the early hours of the morning. It was far from restful, but it had provided him with a brief respite from his swirling thoughts. He exercised and took a long and soothing shower, allowing the warm water to wash away the physical and emotional fatigue that had built up over the past week. The sensation of the water helped him regain some semblance of clarity. He sat down on the couch with one of his trusted sandwiches and a bottle of painkillers and pulled out his notepad. A few hours before having to leave for his shift could be used towards determining who he could close out of his suspicions and who he could trust to share his suspicions with and who had betrayed him, and if they had also betrayed their country. Archer had to consider the three highest-ranking officers first, those who had access to all parts of the facility. By all means, Captain Rush was the most obvious choice. Odd behaviour and hostility towards Archer was a dead giveaway, but one question remained. Why? A seasoned special operator didn't start assaulting or killing fellow soldiers out of professional jealousy, Money, perhaps, which would mean Stanian involvement. And that was something Archer didn't want to believe in lightly. Rush's track record spoke for the life of a true Antnian patriot anyway. Archer contemplated the idea of Colonel Hugenagger being a traitor, but several factors made him doubt this possibility. Colonel Hugenagger held a distinguished rank and an impeccable reputation within the military. He had demonstrated loyalty and dedication to the service for many years, it seemed unlikely that a high-ranking officer with so much to lose would engage in treasonous activities. Besides, Archer's interactions with Colonel Hugenagger 
the colonel hadn't exhibited any suspicious behaviour or shown any signs of disloyalty. Trembling hands weren't exactly signs of treason, more likely alcoholism, which was more of a given after serving your country for thirty years. Archer considered Major Fulroy as a potential suspect, but again, why would he? He had been surprisingly forthcoming with his difficulties, which didn't align with the typical profile of a traitor. Major Fulroy had not exhibited any secretive or suspicious behaviour. He seemed like a committed officer who genuinely cared about the security of the facility and the nation. Outside of the three highest-ranking officers, Archer tried to think who'd have access to the most volatile materials. Lieutenant Wellesby was high-ranking enough and close to Huganaga to perhaps get access to his materials and keycard, but he didn't fit any traitor profile either. Captain Stiller, the gatekeeper of the Hammerstone missiles, came to mind, but he did not have a master key. Sergeants Carruthers and Williamson weren't high-ranking enough, Corporals Danvers and Carlson and their technician friends in the control room could probably have set up the false alarm, but they didn't have access to the high security. Corporal Jennings. Well, Archer just knew she had nothing to do with any of it. Archer sighed as he looked down at his notes. All he had was a glimpse of a green car and a bad feeling he couldn't shake. He had nothing concrete on anyone, for better or worse. And yet he'd have to trust at least one. Van Riek Archer changed into his uniform, holstered his pistol, and drove to World's Terminal. The weather was gloomy, cloudy, and the feel of an approaching autumn was imminent. Arriving at base half an hour before his shift, Archer decided to visit the cafeteria, all of which had become part of his routine over the past few weeks. Archer couldn't help but think about the ongoing mystery and the hunt for the traitor within the facility as he entered the bustling cafeteria. Archer noticed Major Fulroy seated at his usual table, and for some inexplicable reason, on a complete whim, he decided to trust the Major. He approached Fulroy, and as the Major noticed him, Fulroy pulled out the master key and slid it across the table. Archer picked it up as he usually did, and the two men exchanged a nod. Van Riek Archer, sleeping all right? Fulroy asked. Archer knew the answer was written all over his face. Not really, Major, sir. What's on your mind, Archer? Fulroy asked. Archer hesitated for a brief moment, but then decided to confide in Major Fulroy. He explained the lingering sense of unease he had, the feeling that there might indeed be a traitor among them, just as Colonel Huganaga had suggested during their first meeting. Archer recounted the attack he had experienced, as well as the encounter with one of the assailants who had managed to escape in an army-issued vehicle the night before. Archer opened up about the sense of being targeted, the fear that there was someone within World's Terminal plotting his elimination. He shared his concerns about the possibility of an internal threat aimed at facilitating a potential Stanian invasion of World's Terminal, emphasising the catastrophic consequences that would follow. Archer's voice was steady, but the weight of his words was palpable. The whole time, Fulroy listened without blinking his eyes. His gaze was steady, but clearly concerned, even confused. Archer didn't know what to think of it. After Archer nodded to signify he had gotten it all out in the air, Fulroy leaned back in his chair and looked out of the window. The room fell into a profound silence, only interrupted by the distant hum of activity within World's Terminal. Major Fulroy stared at the ocean, seemingly lost in his thoughts, digesting everything Archer had shared. The weight of the situation hung heavily in the air as they both contemplated the potential threats lurking within the facility. The silence was pregnant with uncertainty, awaiting Major Fulroy's response. Archer couldn't help but feel a growing unease as the seconds ticked by. I go to that church, Fulroy said suddenly. Archer frowned. I go to that church every Sunday and pray that something like this doesn't need to happen, Fulroy continued absent-mindedly. Archer wasn't completely following. He didn't know if Fulroy was either, but it became more and more apparent Fulroy sure didn't mind sharing personal details. Your accusations are serious and I hope you have some proof. 
Fulroy turned his full attention to Archer, leaning forward. Archer shook his head. He had no concrete evidence to back up his claims, other than what he felt and other than what he had seen. His suspicions about Captain Rush were founded on circumstantial observations, but were far from sufficient to accuse anyone of treason. I have a friend in the military police. They've got footage of my assault, Archer said. Fulroy stared at him, then nodded slowly. Good, good, he said, again seeming a little less on the edge. Keep your eye out. If you notice anything strange, let me know. Yes, Major, sir. Before you have anything more solid, though, let's keep this between us, Fulroy continued as he started to clear out the table. Don't tell anyone, not even the colonel, Fulroy said as he stood up from the table. Archer stared at the colonel, then nodded. Fulroy stood there for a moment, then just turned around and walked away. Archer felt a sense of relief for finally sharing his suspicions and concerns with Major Fulroy. However, the Major's response, or lack thereof, left him with more questions than answers. Archer realized that he needed to take matters into his own hands and gather concrete evidence to support his suspicions. The weight of responsibility and the urgency of the situation were becoming increasingly apparent, and he knew he had to act swiftly to uncover the truth. From four to eleven, Archer went about his shift as he normally would. He patrolled the facility, and frankly, he was starting to know its layout like the back of his pocket. He engaged with his subordinates, but no one gave him reason to suspect foul play from anyone's part. Operations at the base seemed tranquil as always. It waited, hopefully never to be useful. Despite Archer's attempts to focus on his duties, the events from the previous night kept creeping into his thoughts. The argument with Jennings and the mysterious figure at the church continued to weigh on his mind, making it difficult to concentrate fully. The need to maintain vigilance and ensure the security of World's Terminal was of paramount importance, especially given the suspicions and doubts that had begun to plague Archer's mind. While he had confided in Major Fulroy earlier in the day, the Major's response had left him with even more unanswered questions. Archer knew he had to remain cautious and gather concrete evidence to support his suspicions, but he also needed to maintain his role as the commanding security officer and fulfil his responsibilities. Then shit hit the fan. Moderately, but ominously. Archer had just settled into a chair in the cafeteria, sipping on a cup of hot coffee. The clock read fifteen past eleven, and Archer had grown accustomed to these moments of quiet solitude while preparing himself for the upcoming shift exchange with Captain Rush. However, the tranquility was abruptly interrupted by the arrival of a consular NCO, Sergeant Raymer, a roddy and buzzcut, slightly overweight but vigorous and trustworthy man. He burst into the cafeteria with a sense of urgency, causing many heads to turn and take notice of his uncharacteristic behaviour. Archer set his coffee cup down. His curiosity peaked as he watched Raymer approach him. Van Reek Archer, sir, Sergeant Raymer. Raymer introduced himself, although Archer was somewhat familiar with Raymer, whom he knew both Hugenagger and Wellsby employed as a message middleman. Lieutenant Wellsby needs to speak with you, sir. Raymer explained. Where is he? Archer asked, surprised Wellsby was still present at this hour. Your office, Van Reek, sir, Raymer said sturdily. It seems urgent, sir, Raymer added. Archer nodded and sipped the rest of his coffee. Well, let's go hear the good lieutenant out, Archer said calmly, but curiosity twinkling in his tone and rose from his seat. Archer didn't waste any time. He quickly followed Sergeant Raymer, making his way to the fourth floor of the facility. Upon his arrival, he was met with an unexpected sight. Lieutenant Wellsby, usually known for his calm and mild-mannered disposition, now appeared agitated and restless. He leaned against the doorway of Archer's office, his anxiety clearly visible in his posture and expression. It was a stark contrast to the usual demeanour Archer associated with Wellsby. Lieutenant Wellsby, Van Reek Archer, as requested, Raymer informed, and stepped aside, standing at attention as if to guard the two officers' meeting. Wellsby, quickly but formally, shook Archer's hand. 
Van Reek Archer, thanks for coming, Wellsby began. Captain Rush has called in sick. We'll have to ask you to stay and cover half of his shift. Major Fulroy will take over at 0400 hours, Wellsby informed. Archer processed the information Wellsby had just shared. It wasn't the request for Archer to stay for an extra shift that perturbed him, but rather the way Wellsby had delivered the news about Captain Rush falling ill. There was an unspoken tension in the lieutenant's words and demeanour. It had been half the story, if that. Both Archer and Wellsby exchanged meaningful glances, acknowledging that this situation required discretion and caution. Their silent communication was not lost on Sergeant Raymer, who promptly saluted and departed, leaving the two men alone in the hallway. With a nod, Wellsby gestured for Archer to follow him into the office, and they entered, closing the door behind them. The air inside the room felt heavy with unspoken concerns, and Archer braced himself for the revelations that were sure to come. The restless night sky above the vast expanse of the ocean, visible through the window, seemed to mirror Archer's own inner turmoil. The usual calm and serenity of the ocean at night was disrupted, much like his own peace of mind, leaving him with a nagging feeling that something significant was about to unfold. What is it? he asked, to urge Wellsby into speaking. Wellsby looked around at the empty shelves of Archer's office, which Archer hadn't even tried to fill in an effort to not get too attached, in case his post would end up short-lived. When Wellsby finally turned to Archer, he looked pensive, concerned and conflicted. You see, Van Reek Archer, during his service at World's Terminal, Captain Rush has never been sick. If he has ever been unwell, he's never mentioned it or taken a sick day. He called Colonel Hugenager personally, even at the Colonel's home, and informed him that he had a fever and wouldn't be able to perform his duties. The Colonel said he understood and confirmed that he'd make the necessary arrangements for Rush's absence, Wellsby explained. Archer nodded, urging Wellsby to get to the intriguing part that certainly was coming next. He paused, his expression growing more troubled. However, something in Rush's voice during that call concerned the colonel greatly. It was an unspoken unease, but it made the colonel decide to contact me, just in case. And I've known Rush for years. Personally, we get along great, not to mention his professionalism and dedication are well known. So, this situation is quite unusual, to say the least, Wellsby stated. Archer had expected something more alarming, but he understood the concern, especially considering his own suspicions. Wellsby nodded, as if he heard Archer's inner voice question, if that's all. So, what are we thinking? Archer asked after a pause. We aren't thinking anything, Wellsby said rather harshly. The colonel sent a car to check Rush's house. When they arrived, they found no one there. Not his wife, Ulla, and not their four-year-old daughter, Saija. It was as though they had disappeared suddenly. The house appeared as if someone had left in a hurry. We initially thought that maybe Rush's condition had worsened, perhaps he had checked into the hospital with his family. But after checking with the hospitals, that wasn't the case. Next, I personally made a call to the harbour to inquire about departures. But Rush has not left the island by boat or any other means, Wellsby continued, his voice tense. He then cleared his throat. So, what we're thinking? Wellsby said calmly, almost apologetically, is that we have an officer and his family missing at a time we believe someone within our ranks is working against us. Archer leaned in closer, his voice low and cautious. He decided to share the events of the previous day with Wellsby, explaining his concerns about Captain Rush's involvement in the assault against him. He described how he believed that Rush might be connected to the attack and, by extension, to the false alarm incident. In the worst-case scenario, Archer expressed his fear that Rush could be part of an attempt to aid the Stanians in invading the island of Finnis and compromising the security of World's Terminal. Archer felt a sense of urgency as the situation seemed to be unravelling rapidly and they needed to act swiftly to uncover the truth. Wellsby's reaction was one of deep shock and horror, much more so than Major Fulroy's had been. 
The gravity of the situation seemed to hit him hard, and he struggled to process the unsettling information that Archer had shared. It was clear that Wellesby was not prepared for this revelation, and that the implications were far more distressing than he had initially anticipated. I need to talk about this with Frank immediately, Wellesby referred to Colonel Hugenagger, throwing all formality out of the window. Archer felt the situation was quickly escaping his hands, but nodded. I'll drive to his house. From this moment on, Van Riek Archer, you are the acting commanding officer of World's Terminal until I return with the colonel, Wellesby stated, one foot out of the door already. Archer nodded. Before the lieutenant left, however, he turned. Watch out, Archer. All of this. It can't be a coincidence, Wellesby said, nodded, and left. Archer didn't have time to reply. He wouldn't have known what to say. He hoped it was all a big coincidence, that Rush really was sick, that there was no conspiracy, and the Stanian regime had no big plans for World's Terminal. But he knew he was lying to himself. Archer didn't have much he could do apart from monitoring the facility's safety, but he decided to do what little he could to gather proof of Rush's guilt. He picked up his phone and dialed the number he had received from Military Police Sergeant Majores the previous evening. As the dial tone ended and the line connected, Archer was met with the sound of a crying baby. In the background, he could hear the frustration in a woman's voice as she tried to soothe the infant. It was apparent that Marjorie's wife, Isabel, was struggling to calm their child. I'm sorry to awaken the family. Archer said, with as much of a grin as he could in those circumstances. Thanks to you, I still have one, Marjorie said convincingly gratefully, although Archer could hear the frustration in her voice. What can I do for you, Van Riek, sir? Marjorie added playfully. That's security cam footage. Any luck? We've been caught up, and honestly, I've been caught up with, Marjorie said, and clearly took the phone off her ear, letting Archer hear the full extent of a newborn's wrath. Majore's voice came back on the line. What's up? Majore's asked casually. Something's come up. The men who assaulted me are involved in something else, the solving of which is a little more urgent than getting beat up by yours truly, Archer said, trying to keep his voice collected. He didn't know if he was successful, especially when Majore's paused. I see, Majore's said slowly. We don't have anyone in the tech lab right now, but I'm going in for the 5 a.m. shift. You'll get the tape first thing in the morning, Majores said. It wasn't the answer Archer hoped for, but it was the only answer he was ready to push for. The identities of the men who could plausibly be Rush's henchmen was much less of immediate concern than finding the man himself. All right, thanks a lot, Sergeant, Archer said. Glad to hear about you too, he continued. He could hear Marjorie's smile. Thanks, Archer, she said. Archer hung up quickly. He had business to attend to. Archer knew that in the face of growing uncertainty and possible threats, a careful and subtle approach was necessary. He started with a thorough yet non-suspicion arousing patrol and preparation of the staff at the world's terminal. He hoped it was completely paranoid and unnecessary. He feared that it wasn't. First, he descended the stairway to the basement, and during his routine security check, he took a moment to advise the corporal on duty to remain vigilant. He kept his tone firm but not overly concerned, giving the impression that he was simply ensuring everyone was on their toes. His next stop was the control room, where he found Corporal Danvers on duty. It was the first time Archer had met him on shift. To him, Archer conveyed the same message, advising Danvers and his team to be extra sharp. He tried to keep his tone stern, more that of an officer trying to keep his men on a short leash, rather than that of an officer who knew something his subordinates didn't. With the growing uncertainty and the need for heightened security, Archer decided that a visit to the silo room was more than necessary. As he approached the first security check on his way there, he inquired about the whereabouts of Captain Stiller, the officer responsible for the silo. The sergeant at the security check seemed amused by the question, almost giggling as he replied that Stiller practically lived in the silo. Without wasting any time, Archer requested the sergeant to bring Stiller to him immediately. It didn't take long for Stiller to arrive. Permission to speak, sir, 
Archer requested formally, even though he knew in his role as acting commander he theoretically outranked the captain. However, he wasn't that familiar with Stiller, and the below-ground staff seemed like a completely different world altogether. Archer didn't want to overstep. Stiller nodded, and Archer signalled for them to move to the side away from eager ears. Archer explained the current situation to Captain Stiller, carefully avoiding the use of specific names not to cast a slur on anyone just yet. As the implications of the situation became clear to Stiller, a look of concern crossed his face. Archer emphasised the importance of maintaining the utmost security in the silo, especially given the circumstances. Stiller assured Archer that he would stay extra vigilant throughout the night, ensuring that nothing out of the ordinary could occur in the silo. The seriousness of the situation was not lost on him, and he was committed to keeping the silo safe. Archer, now reassured by his conversations with the staff, returned to the surface, left the main building, and made his way towards the armory. As he stepped outside, just before clock struck one in the morning, he couldn't resist casting a glance at the massive main building, standing there in its grandeur, a symbol of the importance of the facility. Its magnificence was enhanced by the illuminating glow of the nighttime lights. More impressive was everything hidden below it and what he needed to protect. The atmosphere in the armory was undeniably tense. Captain Rush's second-in-command, Sergeant Michaels, was engaged in a heated argument with Sergeant Carruthers. Carruthers, along with Sergeant Williamson, had volunteered to stay overnight, and the question of leadership during a crisis had caused a dispute between them. Archer, keen to avoid any disruption in this crucial area, politely sided with Michaels, acknowledging his rightful position during this shift. Carruthers reluctantly accepted this decision, though his disappointment was evident. As Archer left the armory, he received a friendly pat on the back from Williamson. The gesture was somewhat perplexing, and Archer couldn't quite discern the intent behind it. Archer pondered whether Jennings could have shared the details of their encounter from approximately 24 hours ago with Williamson. It seemed unlikely, as the timing and circumstances didn't quite add up. Not likely, he thought. Not impossible, however. Archer headed out the armory. He realized he had forgotten to honor his commitment with Halaya to call at midnight. Perhaps it was the tense situation, the changing of shifts or the guilt he felt about Jennings, but he decided to nonetheless call her on the way back to the main building. But the moment he stepped back out into the night air, everything else in the world lost its meaning. The main building, which had just minutes earlier been illuminated by a thousand lights, had gone dark. He gazed up at the imposing structure, outlined only by the faint moonlight. It was as if the heart of the facility, the central hub of their operation, had suddenly ceased to function. Everything seemed eerily quiet. The usual hum of activity and lights that bathed the building in a warm glow was replaced by an unsettling void. Archer wasted no time in response to the unexpected darkness. He bolted towards the main building with an urgency that drove him like a tightly coiled spring. His hand reached out for the radio on his belt, but before he could even make contact with the device, one of the corporals stationed at the front door of the building sprinted towards him. Van Rijk Archer, sir. What the hell is going on here, corporal? I don't know, sir. The power just went out and... The corporal began, but just then, the building's lights came back on like a quickly lit match. What the fuck? Archer muttered and took out his radio. Control room, what's going on? Archer said as the corporal led him inside the building. No response. Alert the strike team and close this door after them. Nobody in or out without my permission, Archer said, and didn't stay put to hear an affirmative. Archer unholstered his glock and ran towards the stairway, signalling for a few guards to follow him. He took out his radio again. Control room, come in! This is Van Rijk Archer, control room, come in! Corporal Danvers, answer me, Archer said desperately. Archer and the guards rushed into the stairway and began their descent, the concrete steps echoing their hurried footsteps. As they descended into the darkness, Archer's mind raced with possibilities of what could have caused the sudden blackout. 
The absence of any alarms or sirens was puzzling. Then again, he remembered the sound of the wind howling outside caught his attention, and he thought about the comforting solution, if weather had played a role. The heightened restlessness of the waves in the nearby sea indicated a possible storm or other natural event on the horizon. The fact that the backup generators were functioning seemed to rule out sabotage, so perhaps natural causes, Archer thought hopefully. His hopes and dreams were crushed quickly as he heard Captain Stiller's voice on the radio. Van Reek Archer, we've got shots fired down in the basement. I repeat, we've got shots fired. As Archer and his team reached the door to the basement, the darkness around them was palpable and the tension was high. Archer wished he had returned to the armory to retrieve a rifle, but his Glock would have to suffice for now. He knew he couldn't waste any time, and their movements had to be precise and coordinated. With his Glock in hand, Archer gave a signal for one of the guards to open the door. He moved in cautiously, and the tense atmosphere escalated when he found himself face to face with one of the guards in the basement who had his weapon trained on Archer. It was a heart-pounding moment, but the guard, showing restraint, didn't open fire as he recognised Archer. This moment was a reminder that one wrong move could have been catastrophic in the current situation, and they had to maintain extreme vigilance as they proceeded deeper into the facility. Archer advanced down the hallway, aware that the situation was still uncertain. Everywhere was quiet. You could have heard a pin drop. Guards were stationed along the corridor, their weapons at the ready, but there was an air of confusion and tension that hung heavily in the atmosphere. Archer approached a restless but composed sergeant, who appeared to be the highest ranking in the hallway. Sergeant, status, Archer whispered softly. Van Reek, sir, I don't have anything to report, sir, the sergeant said restlessly, keeping his gaze down the hallway. Archer reached for his radio. Stiller, come in. I hear you. What's the situation on your end? Archer asked quietly. No sight of tangos, no gunfire in the past minute, Stiller responded. Where did the shots come from? Archer asked. He could hear Stiller confirm something with his subordinates. From the direction of the control room, Stiller said. There was a pause, but the line was still on. Archer could hear Stiller hesitate. What do you want me to do, Commander? Stiller asked. The guards next to Archer heard this as well. Archer's status as the unquestionable officer in charge had been solidified. He felt the weight of the world, literally, on his shoulders. We'll meet at the control room. I'll reach out to the strike team. You try to radio the control room on the way, but if no response, we'll breach together. Understood, Archer said. Yes, Van Reek, Stiller replied somewhat condescendingly. Everybody, on me. Archer said. Nobody hesitated. As the group of security personnel moved through the labyrinthine basement, Archer couldn't shake the feeling of unease that had been growing within him. They were on their way to the control room, their steps echoing in the dimly lit corridors. Archer had to trust that Captain Stiller and his team were coordinating their movements from the other direction, aiming to reach the control room simultaneously. There was no doubt about it. This was the shit hitting the fan. Just as Archer was about to radio the strike team, the echoing sounds of boots hitting the ground reverberated through the dimly lit corridors as Archer turned his head to see Sergeant Michaels leading a team of security personnel. Carruthers and a dozen other officers followed closely behind. Their synchronized footsteps and determined expressions conveyed their readiness for action. Sergeant Michaels signalled for a brief halt, and the group quickly formed a cohesive formation with Archer at the lead. They exchanged terse nods and signals, reaffirming their collective determination to protect World's Terminal. The moment Archer and the security team stepped into the hallway leading to the control room, their step was abruptly disrupted by a grim and haunting sight. There, sprawled on the cold, sterile floor, lay the lifeless body of a young sergeant, whose life had been extinguished prematurely. Two precise bullet holes in centre mass were the harrowing evidence of the deadly shots that had ended his existence. Military-style shots. 
the work of a cold, calculating hand. The young sergeant's hand was still firmly gripping his unholstered weapon. As Archer and the rest of the security team took in the heart-wrenching scene, the reality of the situation hit them like a tidal wave. While Archer had encountered death numerous times throughout his career, it was a fallacy to suggest that one ever truly got used to it. He had no idea what was coming. As the team of nearly thirty Antian soldiers lined up behind the battered control room door, anxiety hung heavily in the air. Fresh bullet holes ominously adorned the once secure entrance, serving as a chilling reminder of the violence that had unfolded within. Captain Stiller arrived with his nine men, and the collective anticipation was palpable. Archer gave a subtle nod, instructing Sergeants Michaels and Caruthers to bring a select few of their team members and breach the room ahead. Archer and Stiller would follow. The remaining soldiers would provide cover and support from behind. As the tension in the hallway reached its zenith, Archer initiated a silent countdown from three. The soldiers braced themselves for the imminent entry. With precision and coordinated effort, one of Carruthers' robust team members lunged forward, delivering a powerful kick that sent the already damaged door crashing off its hinges. He immediately advanced into the room with a rifle drawn, supported by Sergeants Michaels and Carruthers and five of their men who followed closely behind. Archer and then Stiller followed suit. The scene that unfolded inside the control room was nothing short of a nightmare. The lifeless forms of eight individuals were strewn about in macabre and unnatural positions. Blood was everywhere. Bullet shells riddled the place. The sheer horror of the sight struck everyone like a physical blow. One of the most shocking sights was that of Corporal Danvers, whose life had been violently extinguished. His body lay sprawled across the command panel, head twisted at an impossible angle. It had been almost split in half with what was clearly a burst of automatic rifle fire. His almost unrecognizable, lifeless eyes stared unblinkingly at a scene of chaos. His hand was almost touching the ominous red alert button, but not quite. The other lifeless bodies were equally disturbing, scattered around the room like grotesque marionettes. The extent of the violence was apparent from the bloodstains and the savage manner in which they had been positioned. The technicians had been absolutely ambushed and executed. It was a scene that defied understanding. The attackers had wreaked havoc within the control room, leaving death and destruction in their wake. Archer's team were seasoned soldiers who had likely caused death and destruction themselves, just like him. But no one was prepared for anything like this. Holy shit! Carruthers squeezed everyone's thoughts into one. Amid the devastating loss of their colleagues, Archer realized that there was no time to dwell on grief. They were under attack. Antnia was under attack. But just as he was about to issue orders to his men, Archer's attention was abruptly drawn to the security camera feeds displayed on the command panel. Something on the monitors had captured his immediate attention, a bit of movement that looked like it didn't belong. In the silo room. Stiller, who's in the silo room? Archer asked as he inspected the dark figure on the feed. Stiller stepped next to him and saw the feed. Johnson and Laws. But that's not either of them, Stiller said concernedly and reached for his radio. The figure walked cautiously, almost crouching, clearly looking from Hammerstone missile to another. The man had a piping bag in one hand, pistol in the other. Stiller attempted to reach the silo room by radio, but no response. No response, Stiller said, and looked into Archer's eyes. Archer thought for two seconds, then sprung into action. Stiller follows me. Pick two of your men. Carruthers, your team on us. Michaels, you and your team coordinates securing all exit points, Archer explained as he walked out of the door, Stiller following him while motioning for two of his sergeants to follow him. Carruthers and his men followed suit. Yes, sir, Michael said with a bit of a trembling tone. Archer understood the man very well. They had all operated behind enemy lines, deep in a zone they understood was riddled by war, blood, and gunfire. Never had they had to experience battlefields at home. And contact the colonel, 
Archer said as he walked, leading his group of chosen men down the hallway towards the silo room. Michael's affirmation drowned in the echoes of Archer's team's footsteps. The journey from the control room to the silo room at World's Terminal was a route that Archer had travelled repeatedly over the two weeks since he assumed his role as the commanding security officer. Normally, the walk took approximately five minutes. However, the fact that an intruder was in that room with access to the most destructive weapons known to man propelled them to reach their destination in less than a minute. Despite the rapid journey, Archer's perception of time seemed distorted, and it felt as if he had been leading his team for hours. The anticipation and anxiety seemed to stretch the minutes into an agonizingly long passage of time. The pounding of his heart reverberated within him, threatening to drown out all other thoughts and sensations. Archer's heart was racing with an intensity that seemed unbearable, each beat echoing in his head as he approached the massive concrete doors of the silo room. As the group reached the entrance to the silo room, Archer retrieved his master key, exchanged a tense glance with Captain Stiller, and activated the door-opening mechanism with the key. The moment was charged with apprehension, and the weight of what they might discover on the other side loomed heavily in the air. The massive concrete doors leading into the silo room opened with agonizing slowness, and as they revealed the interior, it became instantly apparent that the room had been infiltrated. The sight that greeted them was nothing short of horrifying. Lying lifeless on the ground near the entrance were two individuals, Johnson and Lowers. Archer recognized a chilling pattern in their deaths. Each had been ruthlessly shot twice, once in the jaw and then again in the forehead. This method was highly unorthodox. Most militaries preferred more practical approaches, such as two or three shots to the center mass. However, the signature technique displayed here was a hallmark of select, elite special forces units around the world. Most notably, it was trained and practiced in the caverns of Nilberg for members of the Starnian Republic's special forces. Archer signaled to Captain Stiller, instructing him to lead his men to the opposite side of the silo room. As they began to systematically sweep the area, Archer, Sergeant Carruthers and their fellow team members proceeded with extreme caution. Their movements were calculated, ensuring they made no unnecessary noise that might alert the enemy to their presence. Every corner was methodically checked as they advanced toward the far end of the colossal hall. Amidst the tense operation, one detail was strangely comforting to Archer. The roof of the silo room was not open. It appeared that the attackers did not have immediate plans to launch the missiles, which in itself was somewhat of a relief. Yet, this also raised an even more disconcerting possibility in Archer's mind. What if the assailants were intending to trigger an explosion, causing the missiles to detonate right here on the island, potentially unleashing catastrophic destruction and rendering the Antnian mainland practically defenseless against a Stanian preemptive strike? The implications of such a scenario weighed heavily on Archer's mind, intensifying the urgency of the mission. As they moved forward, Archer was prepared for the possibility of facing a highly trained and ruthless adversary, an opponent who was familiar with their own tactics and methods. The stakes were higher than ever, and the team had to proceed with the utmost care. Suddenly, amid the tense silence, Archer's keen ears picked up on a sound that sent a shiver down his spine. It was a distinct digital noise, akin to the clicking and typing of keys. He and Carruthers, their instincts finely tuned, halted in their tracks, straining to locate the source of the noise. Carruthers subtly signaled the direction from which he heard the sound, and it led toward the very last Hammerstone missile stationed at the end of the massive hall. The team proceeded cautiously in the direction of the sound, their eyes scanning the area. As they drew nearer to the final missile's launching pad, Archer caught sight of a figure crouched at its base. The intruder was dressed entirely in black, sporting operational clothing. The heart-pounding encounter triggered a brief but unsettling thought in Archer's mind, the fear that it might be Captain Rush signalling the worst of his suspicions. 
However, his relief was palpable when he realized that this man was much shorter and darker, not Rush. Yet an eerie sense of familiarity persisted, making the situation all the more perplexing and unsettling. As Archer's team cautiously advanced, the enigmatic man must have sensed their approach. He abruptly halted his actions, rising to his feet with a sudden alertness. When the man turned to face them, it took only an instant for Archer to recognize him by the distinctive scar running across his left cheek. It was none other than Calvin Jones, the defense technology specialist who had been dispatched from the mainland to work on the motion sensors installed on the cliff face. The revelation hit Archer like a bolt of lightning. He understood that Jones's peculiar manner of speaking was not merely an idiosyncrasy. It had been a calculated facade to conceal his true identity and origin. Beneath the veneer of an unassuming technology expert lay a man who hailed from Stania, their potential adversary. The gravity of the situation suddenly weighed upon Archer, knowing that they had an infiltrator and a skilled one at that, right within the heart of Antnia's deepest, darkest and most vulnerable secret. As the tense standoff unfolded in the silo room, Archer and his team leveled their weapons at Jones, poised for action. But the situation was far more precarious than Archer had initially realized. It was only when Captain Stiller and his men arrived, joining the confrontation, that Archer's sense of alarm reached its peak. With Jones standing before them, suppressed steer GB pistol in hand, Archer knew that the weapon wasn't aimed at just anything. It was trained on a box of C-4 explosives positioned at the base of the last Hammerstone missile. The gravity of the situation became painfully clear. A single gunshot could ignite the C-4, unleashing a chain reaction, and even if it did not result in a nuclear explosion, a crazy wildfire in that very room would at the very least release radioactive materials and render the island, and pretty much the entire South Atlantic Ocean, a no-go zone, much like Chernobyl. Archer's mind raced as he tried to navigate the high-stakes scenario. He saw some of his team members trigger fingers itching, their faces sweaty and trembling. Everyone hold your fire, Archer said, his glock aimed at Jones's head. Archer's hands trembled, Jones's didn't. Back off, Archer told his team. They did as told, slowly. Archer cleared his throat and tried a peaceful approach if there ever was one. If there ever had been a need for one, it was now. Nomen meum van riek archer ab antnio exercitu. Es in antnia quam si non dederis, iactus eris. Archer attempted in Jones's native Stanian Latin that he spoke a little. Jones's expression shifted. He smiled, almost sadistically. Archer knew there was only one way to stop him, and he needed to be precise. He's going to kill us all, Archer heard Carruthers say, almost like the voice came from another world. No, he's going to destroy the world, Stiller said, terrified. Archer tried to close out the surrounding noises. He tried to steady his breath as well as he could. He saw Jones's finger start twitching towards the trigger. Archer knew he had to act, and he had to act now. Jones's grin widened into an expression of pure evil, something so primally terrifying Archer couldn't believe it. With a single shot from Archer's glock, the moment of tension erupted in the silo room. The gunshot reverberated through the massive hall, creating an eerie, deafening echo. In that split second, Calvin Jones crumpled to the ground as though his strings had been cut. The bullet had struck him right in the spinal cord, swiftly severing all brain activity. Most importantly, Jones hadn't had a chance to fire his pistol. A heavy silence enveloped the team. It was a deafening quiet, one that felt far longer than mere seconds. Carruthers and his team moved in on the downed man, carefully extracting his suppressed pistol and securing his bag, which turned out to be empty. Another member of the team moved in to handle the delicate task of extracting the C-4 explosive from the missile's launching pad. Captain Stiller stepped closer to Archer as both men holstered their pistols. One hell of a shot, Stiller commended. I've never seen one quite like it, he concluded, and nodded to Archer in respect. 
Archer nodded back. Archer couldn't help but be surprised by his own actions. He had managed to neutralise Kelvin Jones swiftly and effectively, and quite frankly had never heard of anyone pulling off the spinal cord shot, at least in such circumstances. Well, the circumstances weren't very common anyway. While there was a huge relief in the air, Archer couldn't fight the overwhelming sensation. It wasn't just the devastating loss of life they had undertaken that bothered him. There was a profound sense of loss, not just for the lives that had been taken, but for the confusion and unanswered questions that loomed. The foremost question in Archer's mind was how Calvin Jones had managed to infiltrate the facility unnoticed. Additionally, the motive behind Jones's actions remained a mystery. It was unclear what his plan had been and why he had chosen to pursue such a reckless, one-man mission. It was evident that blowing up World's Terminal would be disastrous for Antnia, but Archer found it difficult to believe that this was Stania's ultimate endgame when they had the potential for far more devastating actions. Suddenly, the pieces of the puzzle started to fall into place in Archer's mind, and he couldn't ignore a chilling realisation. As he saw the team secure Jones's suppressed Steyr GB pistol, he remembered the tragedy in the control room. Stiller had reported loud gunfire, and the technicians had clearly been shot with an automatic weapon. Archer's eyes widened, his jaw dropped. Only one conclusion fit the picture. There had been a second attacker. Chapter 11 Colonel Huganagger sat in his office, whiskey glass on the table. He didn't mind his most high-ranking subordinates seeing him sip on it. Van Rieck Archer, Major Fulroy and Lieutenant Wellsby sat before him, all with stern and concern all over their faces. But they knew just as well as him the pressure he was under. None of them had got a second of shut eye. Wellsby looked as pale as a sheet after staying up all night. Fulroy, who usually dressed impeccably, had left for the facility in such a hurry his insignia was upside down. Morning sun was high above the island, but autumn air was ever-present and the horizon was dark. The room looked ominous, half-lit. All four men stared at the phone that lay on the table, its presence a stark reminder of the hierarchy and chain of command they operated within. Colonel Huganaga had a weighty responsibility. He was obligated to report all events and findings to his superior officer, the commander of the Antnian Armed Forces, General Barthamus T. Lorne. General Lorne was a legendary figure, an icon in Antnian history. He was essentially the second most powerful individual in the nation, perhaps on the continent, second only to Antnian President Christian R. Kleffer. Both men were revered, and there were numerous stories and legends surrounding them. One of these tales told of General Lorne single-handedly thwarting a Stanian invasion of mainland Antnia, a feat that Archer found almost too incredible to believe. However, he knew that such legends rarely came out of thin air. As the phone on the table finally rang, the atmosphere in Colonel Huganaga's office grew tense and the room was filled with a palpable sense of anticipation. General Lorne had personally appointed Huganaga to be the commanding officer of World's Terminal, an honour that also carried a heavy burden of responsibility. The facility was considered the most secure in the world, yet it had been infiltrated on Huganaga's watch. The breach weighed heavily on him, and he couldn't help but feel as though he had failed in his duty to protect it. Colonel Huganaga steadied himself by taking a long sip of whiskey and picked up the phone. Colonel Huganaga wasted no time with introductions or pleasantries as he spoke with General Lorne. Instead, he immediately delved into his report, providing the General with a detailed account of the events that had transpired at World's Terminal. He relayed the information he had received from Van Rieck Archer, who had been present during the incident, as well as the context and background provided by Lieutenant Wellsby and Major Fulroy, who had arrived at the scene shortly after Archer gunned down Calvin Jones. Archer listened to Colonel Huganaga's detailed report with a sense of detachment, as though he were observing the events from an outside perspective, although it all had been reality for him just hours earlier from the blackout to the gunshot that ended Calvin Jones. Everything after that had transpired so fast, and they had made disturbing findings. 
As soon as Jones hit the ground, the silo room was investigated thoroughly, and no other saboteurs were found. Yet Archer had immediately voiced his suspicion that there had to have been another attacker, as not only had the control room technicians been killed with an automatic weapon that was not in the possession of Jones, Jones simply couldn't have reached the control room unnoticed, which made Archer believe there still was a traitor within their ranks. Conveniently, all security footage from the night had been destroyed, a fact that proved Archer right, yet it didn't do anything to prove it, since there wasn't any proof. Huganaga told Lorne all of this, leaving nothing out. Calvin Jones's true identity was quickly found out. A tattoo on his left shoulder that had been attempted to be removed with lasers was the final confirmation. It was a snake coiled up in the shape of an S, swallowing a sword the mark of a Stanian commando. Facial recognition quickly traced Calvin Jones back to Joan Galleons, a special operator that the Stanian regime had planted into the Antonian defense system years earlier for this single purpose. Archer could almost visualize the scene at the other end of the phone line as General Lorne processed this shocking disclosure. Lorne's weathered face, etched with years of experience and countless battles, displayed a mix of emotions determination, concern, and an unwavering commitment to Antnia's security. The realization that the Stanians had successfully planted an operative within Antnia's defense system was a grave revelation. The enemy's strategic foresight was chilling, and it demonstrated the need for unwavering vigilance and scrutiny of their own ranks. The security breach had been a catastrophic failure that could have dire consequences for the entire Mid-Atlantic region. The revelation about Calvin Jones, or rather, June Galleons, was nothing short of shocking. The audacity of his infiltration was almost beyond belief. To think that he had managed to use his cover as a defence technology specialist to gain access to the silo room, disable the motion sensors, and dig a concealed tunnel within the cliff face was a testament to the Stanian commando's cunning and meticulous planning. The details of his preparations were as disconcerting as they were mind-boggling. Archer, along with the rest of the Antnian officers, couldn't help but be both fascinated and horrified by the thought of galleons hiding within that wall for two weeks, biding his time for the perfect moment to strike. The evidence found in the hole, including the accumulation of human waste and energy bar wrappers, provided a chilling account of his concealed existence within the very heart of World's Terminal. As Archer considered the extent of Galleon's infiltration, he couldn't help but cast an uneasy glance around the room. The stark realization that there was still a traitor lurking among their ranks hung heavily in the air. The room was filled with officers who had dedicated their lives to defending Antnia, yet one of them had betrayed that solemn duty. The atmosphere was charged with suspicion, and Archer knew that trust had been fractured. There would be no rest until the traitor was identified and removed from their midst. The security of World's Terminal and the entire nation of Antnia demanded nothing less. Archer couldn't help but ponder who among them was concealing the sinister secret that threatened their homeland. Huganaga's briefing was interrupted briefly. Apparently, Lorne was asking clarifying questions. Huganaga confirmed with his three officers that the weapon that had been used to kill the technicians had been determined to be a HK-416, which was generally used by the Antnian army. The confirmation that the weapon originated from their own armory sent shockwaves through the officers. Lieutenant Wellsby contributed the disconcerting detail that one such weapon was missing from the armory. This revelation aligned with what Archer had been told earlier by Sergeant Williamson, and it only deepened the sense of foreboding that had gripped them all. Huganaga passed this information to General Lorne, and for a while it was apparent the General kept his cusses inside and resorted to silence. Colonel Huganaga continued with the next most pressing matter at hand, the sudden disappearance of Captain Rush. The fact that not only Rush, but also his wife, Rebecca, and their young son had gone missing added an ominous layer to the mystery. Archer's intuition had already cast suspicion on Rush, as he believed that Rush had ordered the attack on him. 
The pieces of the puzzle seem to align all too neatly, though a concrete connection between Rush and the infiltration of World's Terminal remained elusive. It was difficult to accept that this could all be a series of bizarre coincidences. Captain Rush simply fit the picture a little too well. The room brimmed with a heavy sense of foreboding as everyone contemplated the potential implications of Captain Rush's vanishing act. Archer, Major Fulroy, Lieutenant Wellsby and Colonel Huganaga shared the same unspoken question. Had Rush orchestrated these events? Or was he another piece in the intricate puzzle that needed to be unravelled? Next in order was clearly a series of orders from Lorne to Huganaga, as all the three officers sitting before the colonel heard him say over and over again over the next minutes was, Yes, sir. His face displayed a mixture of concern and determination, as the burden of these impending duties settled heavily on his shoulders. Put me on speaker, Lorne said, and Huganaga flinched. Huganaga put the receiver down and pressed a button, and Lorne's voice filled the room. You're here with Security Chief Major Glenn Fulroy, my personal adjutant, Lieutenant Lloyd Wellsby, and the newest member of our chain of command here at World's Terminal, Van Reek Romeo Archer, Huganaga announced very formally. Van Reek Archer, Lorne said immediately. This time Archer flinched. He had not been expecting to speak directly to the most powerful military officer in the country, especially in these circumstances. Then again, the circumstances completely explained it. Yes, General Lorne, sir, Archer said calmly, even though hands shook. We all know this is far from over, but without your skill and gallantry beyond the call of duty, we wouldn't be able to have this conversation at all. Your country is grateful for your services, and once this is all over, they will not be without reward, Lorne said proudly. Archer felt his skin turn bright red as the other officers grinned at him in an almost brotherly manner. Great job, Lorne concluded. Thank you, sir, Archer could only say. Gentlemen, Lorne then continued over the speaker, shifting his attention. Your nation expects great things from you. The ADS Nicholson has been diverted from its current mission in the Stanian Sea and will provide you with additional personnel by the end of the day. But I don't say this lightly. The fate of our nation rests in your hands, Lorne said. The mention of ADS Nicholson's imminent arrival brought a sense of relief to Archer and the others. This massive vessel, the largest in the Antonian Navy, was not only capable of accommodating a substantial military force, anywhere from 2,000 to 5,000 soldiers, but it was also well-equipped for sea-to-land fire. It was a symbol of strength and a beacon of hope for their defences. However, amidst the relief, a shadow of concern loomed in Archer's mind. If there was indeed a traitor within their ranks, someone who could potentially relay critical information to the Stanians, time was of the essence. The need to secure their defences and uncover the identity of the infiltrator was more urgent than ever. Lorne knew this as well. It's of course possible a traitor in our ranks could learn of this and pass the intel on to their Stanian brethren, which means we need to find the traitor fast. Start from this rush. Finding him is of the essence, Lorne said. Archer could hear Lorne deliberately avoided saying Rush's rank in case the man truly was a traitor. In addition, the island has to be closed. World's terminal has to be secured. Under these circumstances, we cannot expect anything other than for the enemy to be planning a full-scale invasion of the island, Lorne said. An astonishing silence erupted in Huganaga's office. Finally, Huganaga nodded clearly. Yes, sir, Huganaga said. Lorne asked for frequent updates, wished them well, and the line went dead. A heavy silence hung in the room as the officers contemplated the gravity of their situation. The pressure was on, and they understood that the safety of World's Terminal and the entire nation of Antnia depended on their actions. Huganagas cleared his throat by emptying the remaining contents of his whiskey glass in a single gulp. Nunyin, Huganaga said in convincing Antnian Finnish. Gentlemen, as you heard the general, it is possible that Stania is planning an invasion of the island of Finnish and the world's terminal. We'll have to stop it, Huganaga said. 
all three officers nodded in unison. From this moment on, Major Fulroy takes full control of World's Terminal. Forget about the shifts. Security is on you. Get everyone working on fortifying positions and making sure there are no weak spots in the fencing. All machine guns, traps and security checks. Triple them. Understood, Huganaga said. Fulroy stood up, saluted with an affirmative, and left the room. Wellsby, full background check on everyone. Any links to Stania or other questionable connections, report immediately to me. Don't exclude anyone, Huganaga said. Wellsby said he understood and left the room. Huganaga turned his steady gaze to Archer. Archer, you find Rush. Yesterday, Huganaga said sternly. Archer stood up, but just as he was about to salute, he heard his phone cling. A message notification. He could have died of embarrassment. My apologies, sir, Archer said. Check it, Huganaga said. There was strange suspicion in his voice. It was clear Huganaga doubted everyone at that point. Archer reached for his phone and saw two texts, from Sergeant Marjorie's of military police. I know it's a mess over there, but here's the footage, the first text said. The second message held a picture, the two assailants that had attacked Archer, running away from the scene. Archer himself was seen on the pavement in the background. What is it? Huganaga asked. Do you recognize these men, sir? Archer asked and gave Huganaga his phone. Huganaga zoomed in on the screen with two fingers. Archer could see he recognized the men instantly. Raul Menendez and Martin Phillips, he said, as he pointed to the taller and shorter man, respectively. The name said nothing to Archer, but he had a good guess. Former team members of Captain Rush, Huganaga confirmed. Archer nodded. Now, if ever, it was clear Rush had a lot to do with Archer's attack. Almost certainly the infiltration. Go, Huganaga said, with more determination in his voice than ever. Find him. Archer stepped out of Colonel Huganaga's office. His determination was palpable. He knew that he had a daunting task ahead of him, but the weight of the situation pressed upon him. Closing the door behind him, he took a moment to collect his thoughts. Leaning against the wall, he lowered his head and allowed himself a deep breath. Since shooting and killing the Stanian commando, he hadn't had a moment to gather himself. In the silence of that corridor, Archer's mind raced. The disappearance of Captain Rush, along with the implications of the infiltration and the involvement of known individuals like Raul Menendez and Martin Phillips, were all swirling in his thoughts. He knew he had to act quickly, but he also acknowledged that finding Rush wouldn't be an easy task. Almost impossible, if that. Archer's phone rang, almost from divine intervention. He glanced at the caller ID. Archer hesitated, wondering what assistance Tom the bartender could possibly offer in the midst of such a serious and complex situation. However, something told him there was more to it. Tom, it's a bit of a mess here. Can I call you back? No, Van Reek. You really can't. What's going on? I've got a friend of yours in the back room of my bar. Who? He says I can't say over the phone, Tom said. Archer had a hunch. I'll be there in ten minutes. Chapter 12 Archer was taken aback by Tom's words, struggling to believe that the guest he was about to meet could be who he suspected. The situation seemed to throw a wrench into everything he had deduced so far. It presented a puzzling and intricate puzzle, one he was eager to solve. Meeting this individual right then and there could potentially hold the key to unravelling the mystery and preventing a full-scale Stanian invasion of the island. Fueled by curiosity and determination, Archer wasted no time. He hurried to his car quickly started the engine and sped out of the military base with a sense of urgency, eager to get to the pub and meet the mysterious guest. As Archer sped toward the pub, his mind couldn't help but drift back to Halaya. It had been hours since he'd thought of her. The image of her face had flashed before his eyes just as he pulled the trigger of his glock on jewel galleons. In that intense moment, he couldn't help but wonder what Halaya was doing at that very instant while he ended another life. Perhaps she was peacefully sleeping, or maybe she was staying up late, 
worried because he'd missed another call of theirs. The thought of her had been conflicting for him, for weeks. Now it was a constant source of strength and motivation for Archer. He knew that his life would be empty and meaningless without Halaya by his side. Archer made a silent promise to himself as he navigated through the winding roads. He vowed that once this harrowing situation was resolved, he would lay bare the entirety of his life to Halaya. No secrets, no mysteries. He would share every detail of his experiences and emotions with her, regardless of the outcome. First, he had to save a nation, though. As Archer drove into the town of Phoenix, he couldn't help but notice the palpable tension in the air. The streets, which were typically bustling with off-duty soldiers, were now conspicuously empty as everyone was on high alert. All personnel were assigned to their strategic locations, with the majority stationed at World's Terminal itself, but a heightened military presence was also noticeable at the military police station and the shutdown harbour. The somber town Archer had grown more attached to as weeks went by had now fallen into an even more eerie silence, with only the occasional hushed conversations among those locals who dared to venture out. The early afternoon sun was hidden behind thick, ominous clouds in the autumn sky. A feeble glare occasionally broke through, casting an eerie light on the town. The sea that stretched toward the mainland appeared agitated, its waves crashing against the shore with restless energy. In the distance, a line of pitch-black clouds heralded the approach of an impending storm. The atmosphere was thick with anticipation and everyone could sense that something significant was about to happen. Archer parked his car in front of Tom's bar, the rocky pavement crunched beneath his tyres as he came to a stop. As he stepped out of the vehicle, a thought flickered through his mind, like a distant thunderclap on the horizon. He may have felt a solitary raindrop land on his cheek. Uncertain, he looked up at the foreboding sky where heavy, overcast clouds loomed ominously, blocking the sun's rays. It was difficult to tell whether it was an actual raindrop or just a product of the tense atmosphere, a foreboding precursor to the storm that threatened to break. His focus was quickly diverted as he spotted something even more intriguing. Parked at the far end of the wide alleyway next to Tom's bar, an eerie sight awaited him. Another green sedan, identical to his own, sat in silence. Archer couldn't help but wonder, could this be the same car he had seen that mysterious man slip into after narrowly escaping him near the church? The resemblance was uncanny, and it stirred a feeling of apprehension within him, and a feeling of certainty that he knew exactly who Tom's guest was. As Archer entered the bar, a hush fell over the few patrons inside, most of them being local fishermen, including Billy and Bob. All eyes turned toward him, and the sudden silence made it clear that news of the incident at World's Terminal had spread quickly through the small fishing town. Archer knew they were curious and likely eager to ask questions, but he didn't give them the opportunity. He strode purposefully to the bar, where Tom, the elderly bartender, stood behind the counter. Tom's usual warm and friendly expression was replaced by one of concern. His weathered face looked paler than usual. Tom leaned in and almost whispered. Your friend is a mess, Tom muttered in a deep voice. I gave him a bottle to take the edge off, he continued. Archer nodded. Where is he? Back there, Tom replied and pointed to the room behind him. Archer looked around at the patrons. Tom shook his head. They don't know about him. I brought him around the back, Tom said. Archer nodded again. Did he say anything? Archer asked. Only that he'd only speak to you, and if anyone else comes through that door, he's going to shoot, Tom said. Archer nodded once more. Hang around with Bob and Billy for a bit. Stay away from behind the bar, all right? Archer asked. Tom looked at him for a moment, confused, but then nodded. He grabbed two bottles and headed to Bob and Billy's table, offering them a free refill for being great, regular customers. Archer could hear others dispute this and demand a gift for their loyalty as well. Slowly, Archer stepped around the bar. 
The door leading to the back room of the bar was a weathered and worn piece of wood. Its once vibrant colour had faded over the years, and the surface bore the scars of countless bumps and scratches which only added to its character. Archer approached the door and placed his ear against its surface. Despite the initial silence, he had a strong sense that someone was inside. He knocked gently on the door with his index finger, creating a soft, muffled sound that would only be audible to the person on the other side. The response was immediate. He could hear movement, someone shifting their weight, and there was a distinct metallic noise as if the person was handling something. Archer's instincts kicked in, and he placed his hand firmly on the grip of his glock holstered at his belt. He was ready for whatever might happen next, but above all, he hoped that this unexpected guest was willing to talk. Archer cautiously pushed the door open, allowing it to swing slowly into the dimly lit back room. Little light came in from the back exit window that was covered by a rustic paper curtain. The room was small, narrow and utilitarian, with faded, peeling, dark wallpaper on wood. Shelves among the walls hosted refillment for Tom's bar. Against the corner by the exit, on an old, weathered chair, sat a man in a grey, sweaty hoodie, black utility pants, and well-worn but expensive combat boots that had seen better days. Government issued. The man who wore them looked dishevelled and suffering, his face obscured by a bushy beard and curly dark hair. His facial features appeared paler and more haggard than usual, reflecting the weight of recent events. But there was no mistaking his identity, Captain Sean Rush. Despite his ragged appearance, Rush's eyes betrayed a sharp vigilance. They held a mixture of concern, fear and unwavering focus. His hands, though weathered and worn, were remarkably steady. In one hand, he clutched a nearly empty bottle of vodka by its neck. The other hand held a browning high-power pistol, and it was pointed squarely at Archer's center mass. As Archer assessed the situation, a series of thoughts raced through his mind. The pistol in Rush's hand was far from standard issue for the Antnian armed forces. Most of them had been phased out years ago. The fact that Rush still had it indicated it was likely a personal firearm, devoid of any serial numbers or traces, a trait common among special operators who valued secrecy and untraceability. If Rush intended to kill Archer, he would certainly choose such a weapon. Archer's self-awareness struck him like a cold gust of wind. He had suspected Rush of wanting him dead, and now he had willingly walked into a potential trap set by Rush. He realized he was at a significant disadvantage. Rush had a drop on him, and no matter how much vodka he had in his system, Rush was an elite soldier. Archer wouldn't beat him to the draw, not with his glock holstered. Archer beat himself up for not entering the room with his gun already drawn. Then again, if Rush had wanted Archer dead, he could have already made it happen. The cold, reddening eyes of Rush stared into Archer's but Archer couldn't interpret the inspectful gaze. Rush gave him an answer himself. Slowly, he lowered the high power. Close the door, Rush said quietly. His voice was raspier and weaker than before. Archer cautiously closed the door behind him, never taking his eyes off the worn and haggard captain. As Archer observed Rush, the man before him appeared to be a far cry from the fierce soldier and commanding officer he once knew. Rush looked miserable and appeared to have gone through a harrowing ordeal over the past 24 hours. At this moment, Archer sensed that the tables had turned. Rush held the Browning high-power pistol in his lap, displaying a noticeable weakness. This duel was one that Archer could easily win. The temptation to draw his own weapon and press Rush for answers was strong. However, there was something about Rush's demeanour that made Archer hesitate. He was convinced that although he had undoubtedly found Sean Rush, he had not found the man that betrayed them. It wasn't me, Archer. It wasn't me, Rush said, as if he had heard Archer's thoughts. Archer didn't want to believe him. For weeks, Archer had been sure Rush was out to get him. For an hour, Archer had known for certain that Rush was an agent working for the Stanians, but his tone was convincing. Why should I believe you? 
Archer asked, his voice harsh and rugged. Because I tried to have you killed, but I didn't kill Danvers or the others, Rush replied with no hesitation. Archer couldn't fully comprehend his response, especially the first part, but he had to focus on the infiltration of World's Terminal. Then who did? I don't know, but they have my family, Archer. They have my boy, Rush exclaimed almost frantically, but still under his breath. Archer couldn't help but be shocked by the revelation that Rush's family was being held hostage. The idea that a loved one's life was in danger was horrifying and unsettling. He could only imagine what he himself could be coerced to do if her liar was held against her will and out of his reach. Despite his shock, Archer couldn't dismiss the possibility that this might all be one big bluff or a ruse. The only evidence he had was Rush's word, and in a situation like this, it was challenging to know who to trust. However, for some reason, Archer had a gut feeling that Rush was telling the truth. Maybe it was Rush's overall demeanour, the fact that he hadn't taken the opportunity to kill Archer despite being armed, or the desperate yet focused look in Rush's eyes, the kind of look that only someone who feared for the lives of their loved ones would have. Tell me everything, Archer commanded. His tone was rigid, and without noticing, he had started clutching the grip of his Glock even harder. Rush's gaze lingered on Archer for a moment before he let out a deep sigh and took a long gulp from the bottle of vodka. The alcohol seemed to fortify him, and he cleared his throat before speaking. A week before the first red alert and your arrival on the island, I received a message from an unknown party. They claimed they were watching me and my family, just that. At first, I dismissed it as the work of old enemies who had somehow tracked down my address. While that was serious in its own right, it wasn't entirely unheard of for someone in my line of work. So I didn't report it immediately because I had to consider the possibility that if this was connected to any of my old operations, it could potentially put my former teammates in danger. I needed to think about it, Rush explained. Archer nodded, urging Rush to move on. Rush's voice carried the weight of the immense burden he had been shouldering. He continued, then, when the day of the red alert, or false alert, whatever you want to call it, happened, I received another anonymous message. This time, they said that the red alert was going to be the first part of a three-part operation. They gave me specific instructions to ensure the smooth progress of this operation. And to convince me, they sent me pictures, one of my wife at work and another of my son at daycare, Rush explained. He was going to continue, but Archer stopped him. What operation? Why didn't you report this? They were watching my family, Archer, Rush almost yelled. I couldn't tell anyone shit, man, he continued in a quieter voice. Archer stared him down, then nodded. He couldn't honestly say he'd have acted any different. They told me that the first red alert was essentially a test. It was meant to evaluate the functionality of the facility's alarm system and how easily it could be triggered remotely. I happened to be on shift that day, which is likely why they singled me out for crap. They gave me explicit instructions to sweep the facility and report back on every detail of how we conducted our procedures. Essentially, they wanted to know our vulnerabilities. The threat was clear. If I didn't comply, my wife and son would be harmed, Rush said. I had no choice but to do exactly as they told me, Archer. He continued with obvious shame in his voice. Archer nodded. He couldn't help but feel sorry for the captain. The weight of his compliance with the demands was evident in Rush's voice as he grappled with the terrible choices he'd been forced to make to protect his family. Why did you go after me? Archer asked. The second part of their operation. They, whoever they are, informed me that following the Red Alert incident, the army would naturally increase security measures at World's Terminal, that's when it became clear to me that whoever was blackmailing me had insider knowledge within the military. They sent me a file on you, Archer, and gave me orders to eliminate you, or, at the very least, incapacitate you to ensure that the facility's defences would not be strengthened, Rush explained. Or else? Or else my family would be harmed. So you sent Menendez and Phillips to kill me, Archer stated, as if he knew it for fact. His face told Rush was clearly surprised Archer knew his henchmen's names. 
Then, the slightest of smiles visited Rush's face. This is exactly why these people wanted you dead. You're good, Rush said. Archer didn't correct him. He had learned of Menendez and Phillips thanks to his great social skills in making military police sergeant Marjorie's feel better about herself rather than great detective work. Rush didn't need to know that part. Well, I didn't tell them to kill you per se. They owed me. Stole Huganaga's 75-year-old McNichols whiskey, and I didn't tell him. Probably saved their careers. They retired last year but stayed on the island. I told them to follow you. Said you've been trying to get in bed with Rebecca, Rush explained. Archer had to assume Rebecca was Rush's wife. And you told them to give me an educational beatdown. Yeah, I probably should have added you're a former operator on your own right. Menendez's eye looked real nasty, Rush grinned, but his smile quickly returned to an even more somber frown. Archer frowned back. Where are they now? Menendez and Phillips, Archer asked. Out back, Rush said surprisingly, and pointed towards the door that led to the alleyway where Rush's green sedan was parked. He quickly got to his wobbly feet, prompting the still on alert archer to strengthen his grip on his gun. Rush looked at him, him head to toe. If you still don't believe me, soon you will, he began. Let's go see Menendez and Phillips, he ominously concluded, and opened the back door to the alleyway. Archer hesitated. Could this be what Rush was planning for? Get him in the alley, drop his body in the trunk, and drive away quickly. No, it couldn't be. If Rush wanted Archer dead, he'd have done it, and done it with a suppressed pistol. For whatever reason, Archer decided to trust Rush. Besides, he was eager to meet again the men who had attacked him at that very bar two weeks prior. Archer followed Rush out into the alley. A sense of apprehension filled the air. The gloomy, overcast sky above hinted at the impending rain, and the first few drops fell, just enough to be noticed, but not enough to soak the ground yet. Archer observed the desolate and nearly empty alley, dimly lit by the grey light of the overcast day. Archer approached the military-issued sedan parked in the alleyway, one exactly like his own. Considering that Rush had just consumed a bottle of vodka, Archer circled around to the driver's side ready to embark on this uncertain journey. However, Rush headed to the rear of the vehicle, to the trunk. Archer's eyes widened. At that moment, he knew he was late for any discussions with Menendez and Phillips. With a mix of curiosity and dread, Archer approached Rush as he examined the trunk of the military-issued sedan. Rush, with a vigilant gaze, scanned their surroundings. And then, he made the startling move to open the trunk revealing a grisly tableau that took Archer by surprise, despite his expectations. Stuffed within the trunk like morbid cargo were the lifeless forms of Raul Menendez and Martin Phillips, both starkly cold and motionless. Their throats had been gruesomely slashed. Even more unsettling were the contorted and broken legs, which bore evidence of deliberate efforts to cram the bodies into the limited space. The horrific scene sent shivers down Archer's spine, and he could only hope that this cruel treatment had occurred post-mortem. Instinctively, Archer instinctively closed the lid with a forceful thud while checking to make sure no one had seen a thing. The situation was volatile as it was, and there was no need to make it even worse. Who did this? Archer sighed. Rush, in response to his unspoken cues, gestured for them to relocate to the back seat of the car, where they could continue their conversation privately. They squeezed into the car's rear, sitting side by side in the cramped space. Raindrops occasionally pattered on the car's roof. If you guessed Raul Menendez was the man following you at the church, you were right. But after you blew his cover and the three of us escaped in this, Rush spoke and visibly signalled to the car, himself and the two bodies in the trunk. I was instructed to leave you alone and move directly to part three of the operation, he continued, which was helping an infiltrator attempt to blow up the whole island, Archer said somewhat impatiently. Rush vigorously and somewhat drunkenly shook his head. No, I had nothing to do with that, I swear. Listen, I understand from your point of view what I've told and what I'm going to tell you. 
I am the bad guy, a traitor to his country. But I swear, everything I've done, I've done for my family, Rush explained. It sounded like he was trying to convince himself more than Archer. How's that working out for you, Archer thought. Then what, he said out loud. All I was to do was deliver a copy of the master key and go about my shift normally. I was told there would be another red alert, and I would see something that I'd need to close my eyes from, Rush explained. Or else, Archer repeated. Exactly. My family would be hurt, Rush said once more. But you called in sick that day. Yeah, I had a change of heart. I thought if I stayed home with my family, I could keep them safe, and these people couldn't execute their plan at World's Terminal. Two birds, one stone, Rush said. Archer didn't have to ask how that had worked out. Rush's eyes were teary. I called in sick and walked to the park. I left the copy of the master key in a trash can inside a phaser wrapper. But instead of going home, I decided to stick around and follow whoever showed up to their lair. I thought once there I could alert Sergeant Majoris and end this whole thing at once, Rush sighed. Good idea, Archer urged Rush. The story had taken an intriguing twist. I sent Menendez and Phillips to watch over Rebecca and William, Liam, my son, Rush added. Archer nodded impatiently. He wanted to hear more about Rush's plan to follow the mysterious blackmailer. Tears had filled the rough captain's eyes as he continued. Later, none of them picked up my calls. Rebecca, Raoul, nor Martin. I ran back to my house. Nobody was home. But my car wasn't exactly how I left it. That's when I found them. Rush said, and pointed to the trunk once more. Archer followed with an intrigued gaze. I went into panic. I tried to call Huganaga, but he didn't answer. Since I now knew who the blackmailer was, I suppose their plan had been successful and Stanians were in World's Terminal, Rush said. Archer's jaw had clicked open. Rush still continued. So I just ran around, trying to find my family. I didn't know what to do. I couldn't trust anyone. Then I remembered they wanted you gone, so you couldn't be one of them. So I went into the bar you frequented, and you know the rest, Rush concluded his story. Archer had to take a second and shake his head to regain his composure. Did you just say who the blackmailer is? Who the traitor is? he asked. Rush's eyes widened as he realized he had simply skipped the name. Right. It was already dark in the park where I left the key copy, so I didn't see his face. But he wore an Antnian uniform with no insignia, had glasses and a brimmed hat. I remember that because it looked so weird. The glasses gave me a hint, but I knew for sure when I saw the name on the mailbox of the house I followed him to, Rush said. Archer still had no clue who they were talking about. Robert Gilroy, Archer. Sergeant Gilroy sold us all out to the Stanians, and that son of a bitch has my family. Chapter 13 At first, the notion of Gilroy as a traitor seemed inconceivable, but as Archer reflected on the details and circumstances, a disconcerting pattern began to emerge. Archer hadn't seen Gilroy act suspiciously. Then again, Archer hadn't seen Gilroy but in passing since his first day at World's Terminal. Not a whole lot of chances to observe. Sergeant Gilroy was an experienced and trusted soldier at World's Terminal, and his young age seemed to be the only hindrance preventing him from a promotion. His role as Major Fulroy's personal adjutant granted him access to classified information, which in itself was a significant advantage for someone seeking to sabotage the facility. Furthermore, with his proximity to Major Fulroy, Gilroy could have effortlessly influenced the decision to enlist Calvin Jones or Joan Galleons, the Stanian operative, for the critical task of enhancing the cliff face security and thereby helping him infiltrate the facility. As Archer pieced together this puzzle, he began to grasp the opposition's calculated approach. They hadn't solely focused on eliminating Archer. Instead, they had seized upon the opportunity presented by his security re-evaluation to infiltrate the facility from within. The gravity of the situation weighed heavily on Archer's mind, and the implications were profound. Sergeant Gilroy's betrayal, if proven true, was nothing short of catastrophic. 
As Archer absorbed the weight of Rush's revelations, a growing sense of urgency enveloped him. The gravity of the situation became abundantly clear. Not only was Rush's family in peril, but the entire island faced a severe threat as long as Sergeant Gilroy remained at large and had the potential to maintain contact with his Stanian contacts. The consequences of Gilroy's betrayal and his role in facilitating the infiltration of World's Terminal were far-reaching and dire. The safety and security of the entire facility, the defence of the island, and the lives of countless personnel hung in the balance. Archer knew that immediate and decisive action was necessary to rectify this dire situation and avert a potential catastrophe. We need to go, Archer said, as he opened the door and slid out to the alleyway. The slight rain had stopped, but perhaps only momentarily. The mid-afternoon sky had substantially darkened prematurely. You're not turning me in, Rush asked as he followed Archer, who headed for his car. Turning Rush in immediately had crossed Archer's mind, yes. He had been ordered to find Captain Rush by Colonel Huganaga himself, and by proxy, the order did come from General of the Army Barry Lorne, not powers that Archer wanted to find himself fighting. Then again, the order had more specifically been to find the traitor, which Archer now knew wasn't Captain Rush. And Rush could definitely help in capturing Sergeant Gilroy, especially since Archer knew at this moment he didn't want to cause any widespread panic by alerting World's Terminal and alarming Gilroy or his co-conspirators to act early. On whatever they were planning. Not yet, Archer said and stopped at the end of the alleyway. But once we've got your family safe and Gilroy in cuffs, I'll bring you to Huganaga. He decides your fate, Archer continued coldly. Rush stopped and stared into Archer's eyes. Archer remembered the pistol that was in Rush's pocket. Instinctively, Archer moved his hand again a little closer to his holster. He still couldn't completely trust Rush, but he believed him and Rush sensed it. Rush nodded. All right then, Rush said. Archer nodded towards his car and they slid in. As Archer drove through the narrow, rain-slicked streets of Finnis, he began to recount the harrowing details of the previous night's incident to Captain Rush. The windshield wipers rhythmically swept away the Atlantic rain that had gathered on the windshield, adding a rhythmic backdrop to their conversation. Rush listened intently, his face etched with fear and guilt. The weight of what could have transpired seemed to bear down on him heavily. Archer's vivid descriptions of the eight lifeless bodies in the control room that had apparently been left there by Sergeant Gilroy left Rush visibly shaken. The loss of life weighed heavily on his conscience. It was a fact that Archer couldn't completely shake, though. Sergeant Gilroy was an adjutant for a reason, an academic. Archer couldn't picture Gilroy at the other end of the rifle, cruelly putting a stop to all those lives. But you couldn't really know anyone. Archer had just as blatantly miscalculated Rush's hostility. Despite the grim circumstances, Archer could detect a glimmer of relief in Rush's eyes as he recounted the critical moment when Archer had intervened and neutralised Jown Gallians, the Stanian infiltrator. Rush expressed genuine gratitude for Archer's swift action, acknowledging that the situation could have spiralled into something far more catastrophic. Same sort of relief was visible on Rush's face when Archer revealed the mothership of the Antnean Navy, the ADS Nicholson, was on its way to provide support to the island. Whether the Stanians were planning an invasion of the island or not, its likelihood would greatly subside with the arrival of such huge reinforcements, as long as they came fast. So what's the plan, Van Rijk? Captain Rush asked somewhat ironically as they neared the better part of town, near which Sergeant Gilroy lived. I don't really have one, but if we're going into a safe house provided to the Stanian commandos by who essentially is the greatest traitor in the history of our nation, we'll need some backup, Archer said. Rush vigorously shook his head. We can't involve anyone else. We move in as a flock. They're going to kill my family. If they haven't done it already... Rush said somberly. Two more people, Archer said. Rush stared him down. We can't trust anyone from World's Terminal. Who knows who else is involved with this, Rush said concernedly. 
Archer nodded. I know exactly who to call. Archer and Rush parked the car in a community parking lot, a safe distance from Sergeant Gilroy's house. Archer retrieved his binoculars from the trunk, their lenses shining briefly as they caught the fading light. He raised the binoculars to his eyes and focused on Gilroy's house, studying it carefully. The house was modest, with white panelling, similar in design to Archer's own home, but slightly smaller, perhaps a testament to hierarchy. It was neatly maintained, suggesting the presence of a conscientious academic homeowner. Positioned with its back to a cliff, the house was cast in shadow, even as the weak sunlight filtered through the overcast sky. The surroundings were eerily quiet, with no signs of life except for the green, military-issued sedan parked in the driveway. As Archer peered through the binoculars, he couldn't help but feel a sense of foreboding. The ominous grey clouds gathered overhead, hinting at the impending rain. The earlier few drops had been but a prelude. Despite the early hour, darkness loomed, casting a sombre atmosphere over the neighbourhood. Archer knew that they were treading into dangerous territory, but there was no turning back now. Your friends better get here soon, Rush said. It's going to rain like hell soon. It always happens here this time of year, Rush confirmed Archer's suspicions. Like his words had been an omen, they heard the distinct sound of tyres approaching. A green SUV, larger than Archer's car, but sharing the same colour, pulled up beside them. The vehicle was emblazoned with the words, Military Police, in bold lettering along the side. Corporal Andre Browning, sporting a sharp uniform and a cap, emerged from the driver's seat. Beside him, Sergeant Susan Marjoris, dressed in a similar uniform but lacking her jacket, stepped out. The bags under her eyes confirmed Archer's suspicion that he had called her at home. Archer exchanged a quick glance with Rush, and the expression on his face conveyed the age-old tension that often existed between special operators and military police. Archer grinned, while people often think special operators are the toughest damn SOBs in the military who keeps them in a leash. Military police. Sergeant Major stepped in front of Captain Rush and saluted him. The sight was somewhat comical, as the neatly dressed Marjorie's was a testament to service regulations, while Rush, in his trashed pants and hoodie, looked more like a hobo. Captain Rush, Sergeant Marjorie's and Corporal Browning, Phoenix Military Police Department, at your disposal, Marjorie's said formally, but her tone was a little tongue-in-cheek, yet serious. Rush nodded. We've met, Rush said, offering his hand. The two shook hands. Unfortunately, Rush added, an archer couldn't but picture Marjorie's wrestling Rush to the ground during a troublesome night at Tom's bar. Marjorie's smiled as Browning approached the two, but Rush nodded in the direction of Archer. It was a nod of respect, a change of command of sorts. Archer couldn't but nod back, respectfully. Van Reek, what do you want us to do? Browning then said. I'm assuming you brought reinforcements. Archer asked rhetorically. A few moments later, Archer, Rush, Marjorie's and Browning had armed themselves from the trunk. Archer had chosen his weaponry carefully, opting for his Glock sidearm for its reliability and ease of use in close quarters. To complement his handgun, he had also taken a baton for non-lethal options and donned a tactical vest for added protection. Marjorie's was armed with an MP9 submachine gun, a compact and efficient weapon suitable for indoor engagements. Its rapid rate of fire made it well suited for the anticipated close quarters confrontation. Browning, on the other hand, carried a cruiser-class Mossberg shotgun. Rush, despite his request for a rifle, had to rely on his Browning high-power pistol. While Corporal Browning might have smirked at it due to its name, Rush's weapon remained a formidable choice for personal defence and close combat situations. Trust and camaraderie mixed with tension and unease as the group prepared for the unknown threat awaiting them at Sergeant Gilroy's house. If any, of course. Marjores and Browning take the back door. Rush, on me. Count to a 100 from now, then breach. Lethal force only if necessary. Rush's family is priority number one. Capturing Gilroy second, everything else comes next, Archer instructed.
With a single, shared nod, the group got a move on. The group moved stealthily through the neighbourhood, taking advantage of the dark, overcast afternoon to maintain cover and avoid detection. Their movements were deliberate, stopping behind trash cans, hedges and corners to periodically survey their surroundings, ensuring they remained concealed. The dark afternoon definitely helped. As they neared Sergeant Gilroy's house, around a hundred metres away, Majoris and Browning split off from Archer and Rush. They moved with quiet efficiency, navigating through a neighbour's yard and discreetly climbing over a fence. Archer and Rush continued to approach the house from the front, their movements synchronised to minimise any noise or visibility. Hiding behind Gilroy's green, military-issued sedan, Archer and Rush braced themselves for the assault on the house. The tension was palpable as they silently counted down in their heads. For a moment, Archer took a deep breath. It was always like that before a breach. He had done the same a hundred times. Deep breath and nice thoughts. Lately, the nice thoughts had been Halaya. As the count in Archer's head reached ninety-five, the duo nodded and sprinted toward the house. Rush executed a forceful dropkick, shattering the door off its hinges. Simultaneously, Archer could hear the distinctive sound of Browning bashing in the back door with the grip of his shotgun. The moment Archer entered Sergeant Gilroy's house, any lingering doubts about Gilroy's involvement in the unfolding events rapidly dissolved. Within seconds of entering, a single gunshot rang out from somewhere nearby, and a bullet ricocheted off the doorframe, causing Rush to stumble backward. He quickly took cover behind a mirrored closet, which provided concealment, if not solid cover. Meanwhile, Archer retreated from the doorway, seeking refuge outside around the doorframe. His adrenaline surging, Archer attempted to cautiously peer over the doorframe, trying to assess the situation. However, the immediate response was another shot, which narrowly missed his head by a mere two inches. Archer remained hidden behind the doorframe, unable to pinpoint the source of the shot, but the rapid and erratic movements inside the house were becoming increasingly intense. It was clear that they had entered a highly volatile situation. Suddenly, a primal yell erupted from Browning, and the staccato rhythm of Marjorace's MP9 submachine gun started rattling, unleashing a deadly fusillade. In the midst of this chaotic symphony of violence, Archer discerned an unknown male voice crying out, unmistakably in the throes of his final moments. As Archer cautiously peered over the doorframe, the scene unfolded before him. In a hallway adjacent to the small lobby, he saw a dark figure lying lifeless on the floor. It was not Gilroy. Instead, a buzz-cutted man clad in all-black attire. In one hand, he gripped a knife, and in the other, a Steyr pistol. Most notably, his bare forearm bore the unmistakable tattoo. Another Sternian commando. The revelation sent a chilling shockwave through Archer. It was clear that the Stanians had a more significant presence on the island than they had initially suspected, and the threat was closer to home than anyone had anticipated. Amid the intensity of the situation, Archer finally had a moment to survey the house's architecture. As he cautiously peered over the corner, he observed Captain Rush, who remained crouched in the closet at the far end of the lobby, seeking whatever cover he could find. Across the hallway on the right side, the lifeless intruder lay on the floor. To the left, from the front door, there was another room situated adjacent to Rush's hiding spot. Archer couldn't discern its purpose from his current position, but it appeared to be a small room, possibly a bathroom, given the proximity of the door and its handle. The handle started moving. The door swung open suddenly and forcefully, catching the unsuspecting Rush square in the forehead. Rush didn't lose his grip on the pistol, but the blow momentarily disoriented him, leaving him dazed. Stepping out of the bathroom was a man, his pants hastily pulled up but still halfway down. His tattoo-covered legs were exposed, bearing an eagle holding the Stanian flag. Rush tumbled to the floor from the impact, while the dishevelled commando reached for a gun holstered in the back of his partially lowered pants. He seemed completely oblivious to Archer's presence, focused on his own pistol. 
As the man fumbled to retrieve his weapon, an older Steyr SP, Archer sprang into action. With a swift and deliberate motion, he raised to his feet and raised his glock. Desperately attempting to turn and confront the threat, the commando's efforts were hampered by his half-drawn pants. Without hesitation, Archer squeezed the trigger three times in rapid succession. The man's chest erupted in a spray of crimson, and he crumpled to the floor face down, his own pistol slipping from his grasp. The room was left in eerie silence, save for the panting and the scent of gunpowder lingering in the air. In a mere five seconds, two lives had been abruptly extinguished, a cruel reminder of the harsh reality that was often faced in the line of duty. Archer had encountered this kind of violence before, and while the memories of the enemies he had dispatched always lingered, he had learned to reconcile his role as a protector of his country and its people. Evil had made its choice, and it fell upon him to take action, no matter how unsettling or regrettable it might be. You good? Archer asked from the downed rush, who nodded while trying to collect himself off the floor. Archer kicked the guns away from the two corpses and stepped towards the hallway, riddled with bullet holes from Marjorie's MP9, Archer assumed. He cautiously moved forward, keeping his glock aimed down the dimly lit passage. As he neared the kitchen area at the far end, a figure stepped into view to his left from behind a corner. The sudden appearance of another person raised the tension, causing both Archer and the newly arrived figure to instinctively point their weapons at each other. The faint wisp of smoke still lingered around the muzzle of Marjorie's MP9. Recognising each other in the dimly lit hallway, they gradually lowered their weapons their faces etched with the relief of having survived the intense encounter. All clear, Marjorie started, then looked over her shoulder the way she came. But Browning took a hit, she began. Only then, Archer heard Browning's low wailing. The group quickly moved to investigate Browning's situation, led by Marjorie's. They entered a spacious living room with a grey couch and a television. A broken plate and pieces of meatballs had scattered between them. The shattered back door, leading to a small backyard in the shadow of the cliff, was on the floor. Next to it, Browning lay on the floor, his uniform torn at the left shoulder, blood flowing from the injury. Although the wound appeared to be quite survivable, Browning's painful groans revealed the extent of his suffering. Marjorie set her weapon aside, dropping to her knees to tend to her wounded comrade. She retrieved her med kit and bandages. What happened? Archer asked. Rush anxiously walked back and forth behind him, providing substantial cover, but definitely nervous at not seeing his wife and son anywhere. The weirdest and luckiest thing in all my career, Browning said with a voice full of agony. I broke the door, the dude was on the couch, eating. He goes for his gun on the couch, I fire. Click, nothing happens. He tries to shoot me, nothing happens. He goes for the knife. Still stuck in a meatball, he stabs me in the shoulder. Majores comes in. He bolts, Browning explained and gasped as Majores cleaned his wound with alcohol. Shot him through the wall, Majores exclaimed, a little ashamed. I saw Browning go down and panicked. I could have hit one of you, Majores said while patching Browning up. Don't worry about it now, Archer said forgivingly. Where the hell is Gilroy? Where the hell is my family? Rush said, having stopped his pacing. Just then, Archer's attention was diverted from the injured Browning as he noticed the peculiar arrangement of the television and the table supporting it. The table was at an unusual height, positioned at hip level, and the floor displayed noticeable marks that indicated it had been moved back and forth. The room, dimly lit with the fading daylight, made it challenging to discern details clearly. However, Archer could just barely make out the outlines of a door frame concealed behind the television. Riddle me this. Why would anyone cover their bedroom door with a TV? Archer asked, mostly rhetorically as he stepped closer to the television. He and Rush moved it aside as Marjorie's and Browning followed from the floor. Moving it revealed a doorknob. The door frame was ever so clear. The group shared a look. Instinctively, Browning tried to turn down his wailing, while the others prepared their weapons. With a decisive kick, 
Archer sent the door crashing open and the team swiftly aimed their weapons into the room. However, there was no immediate threat inside. Not a living one, anyway. In the centre of the room, on a plastic sheet covering a magnificent Persian rug, lay the lifeless body of a man, in the nude. Under his light hair, a single gunshot wound stared at Archer on the forehead, another on the jaw. A puddle had formed under his head, and although red covered his face as well, the glasses didn't give a chance to miss his identity. Sergeant Gilroy. It seemed obvious the traitor had been silenced by his co-conspirators. By his feet, a brimmed hat that matched the description of the one worn by the blackmailer was placed nearby. The hat seemed to be almost like a smoking gun, saying that yes, Gilroy is the traitor you're looking for. However, at that moment, Archer couldn't help but feel a sense of unease. It was a passing thought, but he couldn't ignore that the hat was almost a little too convenient. If not for the dead body on the floor, the rest of the room would have been impossible to miss. It was evident that the room had originally served as a bedroom, but it had been repurposed by Gilroy and the Stanian commandos for their clandestine activities. The walls were lined with an array of computers and servers, each piece of equipment more sophisticated than the last. The room was an undeniable hub for hacking and electronic infiltration. There were multiple monitors displaying intricate codes and data, as well as an impressive number of servers, which were most likely used to host various malicious programs. The technical equipment was clearly designed for hacking and intrusion into secure systems, making it a potentially potent tool for breaching the alarm systems at World's Terminal. The sight of this setup sent a chill down Archer's spine, realising the extent of the threat they had been facing and the level of deception that had been carried out right under their noses. It was a grim reminder that the enemy they were dealing with was both highly skilled and well-prepared, with an arsenal of tools to exploit weaknesses in their defences. But as Archer surveyed the room and pieced together the events, he couldn't help but feel that something was amiss. While the evidence seemed to point to Gilroy as the traitor and the Stanian commandos using his house as a base for launching false alarms and infiltrating World's Terminal, there were subtle inconsistencies that tugged at the edge of his consciousness. First, there was the hat, the very item that Rush had seen the blackmailer wearing. It felt almost too convenient, as if it were strategically placed to confirm Gilroy's involvement. Then there was the peculiar way in which the door was hidden behind the television, almost like a secret passage. Seemed hasty and weird. And most notably, despite the evident complexity and time-consuming nature of the computer operations that had taken place in the room, everything appeared strangely untouched. There were no signs of consumables, no clutter or mess, and a general sense of order and cleanliness that felt out of place. The room's pristine condition, apart from the lifeless body on the floor, raised a question in Archer's mind. Was everything as it appeared, or was there more to the situation than met the eye? But before Archer could put any of this into words, their attention was abruptly diverted by the sound of a muffled grunt. Instinctively, they all turned their heads toward Corporal Browning, who was seated on the couch, clutching his wounded shoulder. Browning quickly shook his head, a universal expression of confusion readable on his face. Not me, it said. As tension mounted in the room, the silence was shattered by another sound, a muffled this time female voice screaming from somewhere below them. It was a voice that Archer could tell had a profound impact on Rush. All colour had escaped his face. Rebecca, his wife. The strain was evident in Rush's expression as he struggled to maintain his composure. Archer and Rush reached down to grab the plastic covering the floor beneath Gilroy's lifeless body. Together, they moved the body out of the way, revealing the floor below. Archer began to inspect the floor by pressing down on various spots, and he noticed that it felt significantly softer in the middle. He pointed this out to Rush and Marjorie's, and they all seemed to understand that there was something beneath the surface. They pushed the majestic Persian rug aside, unveiling a concealed hatch clearly leading to a basement below living level. The trio exchanged glances. 
Marjorie's leaned in to whisper into Archer's ear. I think I saw a ground-level window outside, Marjorie said. Archer nodded. It was the best tactical decision available. Marjorie's call to inspect a potential window into the basement from outside was a practical one, and Archer had full confidence in her ability to carry out this discreet reconnaissance. It was apparent Rush's wife, and perhaps his son were held downstairs, but was someone down there with them? They needed to know. Majoris left the room and quietly explained the plan to Browning before going into the backyard. She moved quietly, ghost-like, and proceeded to slip outside through the same frame that had previously held the back door, which now lay on the floor. As they anxiously awaited Marjorie's return, Archer couldn't help but notice the turmoil in Rush's expression. He could sense the desperation and impatience in Rush's demeanour. He wasn't sure if Rush could hold himself back much longer. Archer knew he had to maintain confidence in Rush's self-restraint, hoping that he could remain composed for just a minute longer. Then, fate stepped in. Out of the blue, a more distinct cry for help emerged from beneath the floorboards, piercing the tense air. It spurred Rush into immediate action, and his response was swift and resolute. In a seamless motion, Rush crouched down, forcefully swung open the concealed hatch, and descended the staircase into the shadowy depths below. Archer instinctively attempted to halt his impulsive move, but to no avail. In the drop of a hat, Rush had disappeared out of his sight. Archer couldn't help but follow. In a rush to follow Rush approximately three metres down the staircase, Archer's senses struggled to adapt to the abrupt transition from light to darkness. As he cautiously but rapidly descended, he began to piece together the layout of the space. The stairs ran alongside the basement wall on the left, while to the right, a vast, open area stretched out. Despite the limited visibility, he managed to discern Rush's silhouette turning towards the hall at the bottom of the staircase. Squinting through the dimness, Archer identified a faint glimmer of light emanating from a ground-floor window situated in the upper right corner of the apparently empty space. Majores had been right. This faint illumination revealed the presence of two figures huddled together in a protective embrace. A woman and a small boy. Rebecca! Rush nearly screamed. Rebecca tried to answer, but her voice was muffled. Archer deduced they had been tied and... Archer could hear the boy cry something. Most importantly, they were alive. For a second, Rush seemed to be stuck in time and space. The woman and boy made another sound again, and Rush stepped towards them off the staircase. Only then Archer realised they weren't just primarily screaming at the sight of Rush, but trying to tell him something, of someone. On pure instinct, Archer looked at his feet and saw a figure under the bottom of the staircase. Just then, the silhouette of a man stepped out from the shadows of the staircase. Archer saw the figure held something in his hand. As he raised the hand, a glint of light hit it. You couldn't mistake that metallic glow. A steer GB pistol. Archer didn't hesitate. Positioned about halfway down the staircase, he took a leap, not in the sense of a graceful jump, but more of a forceful plunge. His target was the pistol held in the commando's left hand. Archer landed directly on the man's back, right in the centre of his target. In a whirlwind of motion, he seized the commando's head with his right hand, and with his left hand, he attempted to pull the gun from the man's grip. As Archer's momentum carried him downward, the gun discharged, the sharp crack of the gunshot echoing through the basement. By the sound, the bullet luckily struck the staircase. A sickening thud ensued as the two hit the floor. The force of the impact had shattered the man's jaw and inflicted catastrophic damage to his head. The grotesque thud of the man's head colliding with the floor reverberated in the basement. Despite the horrific injury, the commando displayed an alarming level of resilience and vitality. He was far from incapacitated, and Archer could feel him struggling beneath his weight, still posing a considerable threat. In the tumultuous struggle that had unfolded in the dimly lit basement, Archer's focus remained unbroken. 
The terrified screams of the woman and the young boy were a distant backdrop, drowned out by tunnel vision. Archer strained to maintain control, pushing against the commando with all his might. Despite his own strength, it became apparent that the commando was larger and more robust. Desperate to gain the upper hand, the commando fought fiercely, attempting to roll onto his back to improve his position. As the situation seemed to teeter on the brink, Archer noticed Captain Rush, who had now recovered his wits, approaching the struggling duo. However, a dangerous glint remained in the commando's eye, and he made one last audacious attempt to employ the firearm he still clutched in his left hand against Archer. Yet, before he could carry out this last play, Rush's precise kick struck the commando's wrist, forcibly dislodging the gun and leaving his hand mangled. Archer recognized the pressing need to decisively incapacitate the threat. Without hesitation, he withdrew his right arm from the commando's back and, channeling all the power of his crouched body, delivered a crushing elbow strike directly to the man's neck. The impact was devastating, shattering the commando's neck and instantly ending all past, present and future resistance. After the intense and frantic struggle, the flood of adrenaline that had surged through Archer's veins was finally beginning to subside. He lay sprawled on the basement floor, breathing heavily, his body weary from the exhausting ordeal. He felt Rush reach to him. With what little strength he had left, Archer reached back and clasped Rush's hand, conveying through the firm grip that he was indeed all right, despite the intense battle that had just unfolded. Exhausted and out of breath, Archer watched as Rush rushed to his family. With urgency, he set to work, swiftly untying the knots that had bound them. As soon as they were freed, the woman and young boy flung themselves into their husband and father's waiting arms, embracing each other with an emotional intensity that words could scarcely capture. Daddy! the boy exclaimed. In that instant, all guilt Archer had ever felt for dispatching enemy fighters died. Moments later, they gathered under the overcast sky outside the dimly lit house. The occasional raindrops fell upon them again, a reminder of the storm that was inevitably reaching. The waning late summer afternoon was giving way to evening, and the sun's feeble attempts to break through the heavy clouds were futile. The horizon loomed ominously. For Archer, for some inexplicable reason, it was evident that their long and arduous day was far from over. Sergeant Marjoris had called for backup, and two additional SUVs had arrived on the scene. Technicians had already isolated the site, and fortunately, the copy of the master key had been found in the computer room. Corporal Browning was being tended to by medical personnel, while Archer, despite a brief checkup by an EMT, declined any further evaluations. He had a mission to focus on, and there was no time to spare. He made a concise call to Colonel Huganaga, providing a succinct summary of the situation in as few words as possible. He had told everything that led to the confrontation at the house, but left out his doubts about Gilroy's involvement. He did appear guilty, and it did appear the Stanians had silenced Gilroy. If he truly was the traitor, the execution was worrisome. It indicated the Stanians were ready to move on to the next phase of the mission, which again indicated more Stanians were on the island. It did appear, it indicated. Archer didn't like the questionability, the uncertainty of those phrases, yet they haunted him. The colonel insisted that Archer bring Captain Rush to World's Terminal for questioning. Rush's ultimate fate would be determined once the current volatile situation was under control. Although Archer understood the importance of reuniting Captain Rush with his family, he also recognized the urgency of the situation at hand. There were many pressing matters that required his immediate attention, particularly the need to get to World's Terminal as quickly as possible. There, he could initiate a comprehensive investigation into Sergeant Gilroy's betrayal, the significance of the setup at Gilroy's house, and the involvement of his Stanian commando comrades. With a sense of duty, Archer approached the family trio who were currently engaged in conversation with one of Sergeant Marjorie's subordinates by the sidewalk and one of the recently arrived SUVs. 
Warming rain clothes had been placed on the two rescued hostages. Corporal, I need to speak with the captain, Archer said to the medic corporal, who promptly stepped a little further and left the family alone with Archer. Captain Rush, a word in private, Archer said. Rush looked around at his wife and his son, who both looked worried. They didn't want to lose Rush again. Rush looked at Archer questioningly, but then smiled and turned to his family. Rebecca, Liam, this is Van Reek Archer. He works with Daddy. Rush surprisingly introduced Archer, more to his son, apparently. Rebecca hesitated for a second, but offered her hand, and Archer firmly but gently grasped it. The look in her green eyes stayed on Archer's uniform for a second too long, and Archer realized he must have had some of the commando's blood on his collar. He could only hope the little boy had not seen it. Rebecca shook his hand with the kind of firmness that can only be taught by living in a military family. Archer couldn't help but feel a certain camaraderie with her that only fellow gingers could understand. Her face was dotted with freckles, and despite the signs of wear and exhaustion, her expression remained firm and resolute, reflecting her strength and determination to survive. As they made eye contact, she offered a warm and appreciative smile. My daddy says you're a hero, Archer heard a youthful voice. He cast his gaze downward and met the innocent eyes of little Liam. Despite his short stature, Liam bore an uncanny resemblance to Captain Rush, as if he were a miniature replica of his father. His hair, curly and slightly longer than his dad's, cascaded around his youthful face. At approximately four years old, he still had the charming innocence of a child who had yet to be burdened by the complexities of the adult world. My daddy says you saved his life, the boy said, and saluted Archer. Archer couldn't help but return the salute with a warm smile, but he was unsure of what to say. The only thing he knew for sure was that he had never been so proud to carry his uniform. Archer looked at Rush, who smiled back as for a brief moment all trouble and mystery that surrounded them had faded. I have to go with Van Reek Archer now. I, Rush began speaking to Liam, but before he could continue, the young one's intrigue took over. Are there more bad people on the island? There could be, and that's why Daddy has to go with the Van Reek, Rush said, more to his wife than Liam. Rebecca hesitated again, but nodded understandingly. Will I see you soon again, Daddy? You will, Rush said, and embraced his son once more. Archer truly hoped he could help Rush avoid any harsh sentencing and make truth of his promise. Swiftly, Rush leaned in to kiss his wife. Let's go, Archer said. Rush nodded. They started walking towards the parking lot as the medic corporal took Rebecca and Liam under her wings. Archer and Rush moved in solemn silence each lost in their own thoughts and processing the intense events that had unfolded. Captain Rush, a man of few words, subtly tapped Archer on the back in a gesture of deep gratitude. Archer understood the unspoken message, and the nod that accompanied it spoke volumes about the bond forged in the crucible of their recent mission. Archer felt bad that in some sense he was leading Rush to slaughter. Despite his good intentions, his recent actions could still be seen as treason. However, before they could reach their vehicle, a commotion erupted behind them. One of Sergeant Marjoris's corporals emerged from Gilroy's house and seemed to be in a hurry. His footsteps were quick and purposeful as he approached Archer and Rush, and his face carried an expression of urgency. Van Reek, sir, the corporal spoke to the uniformed Archer. Corporal? Archer asked questioningly. The corporal calmed his breathing, exhaled, and launched a worrying finding into the air. Van Riek, sir, Sergeant Marjoris asked me to tell you. There are four bodies inside the house, but five use plates on the table. Chapter 14 As Archer sped towards World's Terminal with Rush seated beside him in the darkening late afternoon, he couldn't help but feel a mixture of emotions. Protocol dictated that he should treat Rush as a prisoner, possibly handcuff him to the back seat. Practically, he was suspected of treason, 
Although Archer felt like with Rush's and the overall circumstances, Rush would survive with a dismissal from service. But recent events had added a personal dimension to the professional respect. Archer had witnessed the lengths Rush was willing to go to for the safety of his family. The feeling appeared to be mutual, as Rush clearly had great appreciation for Archer. The earlier hostility was gone, having been clearly dictated by the mission set for Rush by his blackmailers. Not only had Archer saved his life, but he had also played a pivotal role in ensuring the safety of Rush's family. Besides, Archer wanted to bounce his thoughts and theories off of someone before presenting them to Colonel Huganagger. So, what are you thinking? Rush asked, as the two turned onto the asphalt highway leading to World's Terminal. Archer frowned, surprised that Rush had sensed his inner turmoil. Then again, as an experienced operator himself, Rush had probably seen and taken inner notes of the same oddities Archer had. It was... weird, Archer said. The hat, the door, the room. None of it adds up. Or rather, adds up too well. Exactly. But it was Gilroy you saw, receiving the master key. Without a doubt. I didn't see his face clearly, but the glasses were definitely his. The hat was weird, but it was a colder night. The only thing I can't explain, his uniform had no insignia, Rush stated. Archer nodded. The absence of insignia, in Gilroy's case, three silver arrows should have decorated his collar, on Gilroy's uniform gnawed at him. Removing insignia would only go so far in concealing one's identity, especially when they made no effort to hide their face. The fact that they had trusted solely the cover of darkness was puzzling. Archer's mind grappled with a distant memory that the absence of insignia had triggered. It was a memory that eluded his immediate grasp, hovering on the edge of his consciousness, teasing him with its presence, but he just couldn't grasp it. Nonetheless, Rush began, the room in his house is a smoking gun. Against Gilroy, I mean. If someone did try to set him up, it's a huge operation and doesn't seem like something the Stanians would do. They've always been about grand gestures, big attacks, claiming responsibility. So we'll have to go from the assumption that Gilroy is guilty, Rush said. Archer nodded again, then grinned. Rush saw this in his rear view. What's so funny? Rush asked. Three hours ago, I was convinced you were the traitor, Archer replied. Rush nodded with a grin. Then you killed two people just because I told you I'm not. You have a way with words, Captain. Ten minutes later, Archer and Rush arrived at World's Terminal. The relentless rain had begun to intensify, adding to Archer's growing agitation. The weather seemed to mirror the uncertainty of the situation they were facing, neither fully pouring nor relenting. It was as if the heavens themselves were undecided. Upon approaching the gates of World's Terminal, they noticed that security had been significantly heightened with a makeshift fourth security checkpoint added to the facility's defences. This checkpoint was unlike the others and consisted of a barbed wire barrier manned by four heavily armed soldiers. It was located approximately 100 metres before the first proper security booth. Archer's vehicle came to a halt, and he observed a young private named Mullins, who had never crossed his path during his time at World's Terminal. This fresh-faced soldier couldn't have been more than 18 years old, and he seemed a bit out of place among the experienced personnel at the facility. However, despite his youth, Private Mullins approached the vehicle with a mix of formality and confidence. As Archer rolled down the window, he couldn't help but notice that the young private didn't have his hand resting on his pistol. Van Reek, sir, Mullins said formally upon seeing Archer's insignia. Paperwork, please, Mullins continued. Archer nodded and gave him his and Rush's pass and ID. Mullins checked it over, handed it back and nodded. One piece of advice, private, Archer said with a frown. Mullins seemed startled, like a deer in headlights. Yes, sir. When a vehicle approaches you, you put your hand on your gun, no matter the vehicle. I could have been anyone, Archer stated. Mullins nodded like a schoolboy, like one promising to never mess up again. Yes, sir, he said, and raised his hand in a salute. Archer quickly returned the salute, 
then nodded. Carry on then, Private. Be safe out here, Archer said as he rolled the window back up. As the car started rolling forward again, Rush shook his hand. We're getting old, Archer. Soon it's our kids fighting our wars for us. Say no more. Archer and Rush managed to navigate through the three security booths with relative ease and finally parked their car in the facility's parking lot. As they entered the lobby of the main building, Lieutenant Wellsby awaited them. His body language and demeanour, particularly when around Rush, made it clear that he was uncomfortable with the presence of a man accused of treason. Moreover, he seemed a bit taken aback by Archer's decision not to secure Rush in handcuffs according to protocol. Despite these concerns, Wellsby decided not to confront Archer directly. The difference in rank was minor, and Archer had repeatedly proven his capabilities. It was evident that once this ordeal was over, Archer would likely find himself promoted with two heraldic roses adorning his collar, mirroring Wellsby's own insignia. The security presence inside the already well-protected facility had clearly been doubled. Wellsby led Archer and Rush to the elevators and took them up to the fourth floor, where Colonel Huganaga's office was located. Upon their arrival, they found the colonel waiting for them with a glass of whiskey in one hand and his phone in the other. Wellsby announced their arrival and quickly left the room, leaving Archer and Rush alone with Colonel Huganaga. Archer closed the door behind them, and without any hesitation, Rush walked up to the colonel's desk, bringing his heels together in textbook military attention form. Colonel Huganaga, Captain Rush, I hereby surrender myself to any disciplinary action you find necessary. I will not fight the criminal charges presented upon myself, Rush began. Huganaga put the phone and glass down. My weapon is in my right pocket. I will now reach for it and turn it over. Rush announced. Huganaga frowned, slightly, as he too was surprised Archer had not disarmed Rush. Yet Huganaga saw Archer did not have his hand on his gun and decided to trust Rush all the same. Rush proved trustworthy. He pulled out his high-power pistol with two fingers and placed it on Huganaga's table. Colonel Huganaga took Rush's pistol from his desk, carefully inspected it for a moment, and then opened his desk's top drawer, placing the weapon inside with a metallic thud. Thank you, Captain Rush. I just spoke with Major Fulroy. He's on his way to escort you to the holding cells. He will ask a few preliminary questions, but unfortunately will have to hold you there for some time. This current situation demands more of our attention, but I appreciate your cooperation, Huganaga stated. Rush nodded. Archer remembered had not been to the holding cells of World's Terminal, although the holding cell of Phoenix Police Department was even too familiar for him. He thought to himself that he'd likely visit Rush at some point, if not to question, but to provide a little bit of update on his family's well-being. Just then, there was a knock on the door, and Major Fulroy stepped into the room. He had cleaned up since the morning, and his uniform had been neatly pressed. The Major's insignia, a single oak leaf, shined on his collar, this time in pristine order. Yet, Fulroy's face was stressed and worn. Archer deduced that the news of the betrayal and demise of Sergeant Gilroy, Fulroy's trusted personal adjutant, had reached the Major, bringing him a whole lot of mixed emotions. Fulroy nodded to Archer, saluted Huganaga, and then turned to Rush. The two men stared each other down in silence. Not a word was exchanged. Fulroy finally tapped Rush on the shoulder and directed him toward the door. As they passed Archer, Rush nodded in his direction, and Archer returned the gesture. The door closed behind them, and Archer couldn't help but notice that Fulroy was fiddling with the utility knife on his belt as he stepped out. It was evident that while Rush had won back Archer's trust, he had not yet earned the trust of Major Fulroy. The awkward scene and long-standing silence was finally broken by Huganaga, who cleared his throat. All right, Van Riek Archer. I suppose we have a lot of discussing to do, Huganaga said. Archer nodded and took a seat at the desk. For the next twenty minutes, he recounted his day, detailing the events that had unfolded. He began by sharing Rush's story, explaining how he had tracked Gilroy, 
the kidnapping of Rush's family, and the discovery of the bodies of Menendez and Phillips. Huganaga calmly mentioned that he had dispatched a team of operators to recover the bodies, and they would investigate whether the two men had indeed been killed by Stanian operatives. Archer then provided a detailed account of what had transpired at Gilroy's house, including the firefight, the rescue of Rush's wife and son, and Sergeant Marjora's discovery of the five empty plates. Both Archer and Huganaga acknowledged that this indicated the presence of more Stanian commandos on the island. The implications were concerning, and they discussed the possibility of an absolute worst-case scenario that someone might still be on the island to coordinate a potential full-scale invasion, most likely in order to again infiltrate the world's terminal to capture control of the Hammerstone missiles. However, Huganagar acknowledged that conducting a full-scale invasion would be incredibly challenging, especially with the imminent arrival of the ADS Nicholson, which was just hours away from reaching the island's port. Archer nodded in agreement, but there was a lingering unease in his expression, one that didn't escape Huganaga's notice. I can see something still on your mind, Van Rijk. Well, as I mentioned, a lot of this is too good to be true. Elaborate, Huganaga more ordered than asked. Archer spent the next five minutes discussing his suspicions with Colonel Huganaga. He detailed how everything about Gilroy's betrayal seemed almost too convenient, as if it were scripted. Archer pointed out various elements, from the mysterious hat to the missing insignia and the hidden computer room, which seemed theatrically concealed, not convenient at all. He acknowledged that these might be questions without answers, and Gilroy could be as guilty as it seemed, but he couldn't shake the feeling that something was amiss. Throughout the conversation, Huganaga remained silent, gazing into Archer's eyes and absorbing every detail. After Archer finished speaking, the colonel continued his silence for a moment, reached for his whiskey glass, and leaned back in his chair. We'll need to look into all this more closely, Huganaga said quietly. It might be nothing, but it might be a hell of a lot of something, he continued and nodded. Archer responded to the nod. He felt the exact same way and was glad the colonel understood him. In more ways than one, Huganaga had become a bit of a mentor if not a father figure during his short time on the island. Start from the house. I'll call ahead and let the MPs know you're in charge. Turn the place upside down. See if those computers were really used to hack into our alarm system and find Gilroy's uniform. If it's missing its insignia, fine. I can live with the fact he used a hat on a cold night, but if the insignia is there, or at least in his drawer, and the computer room is all theatre, the hat doesn't add up either, Huganaga said. Archer nodded once more. He didn't know what he would find at the house, but he seemed all the more convinced that someone had portrayed Sergeant Gilroy at the park where Rush lay hidden. That someone had set Gilroy up and slaughtered him like a sheep. There weren't any words of encouragement or farewell, leaving Archer with a keen awareness of the urgency of the situation. Archer understood that he had a mission to carry out, and it required swift action. With a nod of acknowledgement, Huganaga dismissed him from his office. As he exited the room, he exchanged a respectful yet concerned look with Lieutenant Wellsby, who was stationed at his desk just outside the door. As Archer passed the cafeteria, he couldn't help but realise that he hadn't eaten since morning. However, the pressing matters at hand left no room for a break. He knew that his priority was ensuring the safety and security of the island until backup would arrive in the form of ADS Nicholson. With a Stanian commando apparently loose on the island, Archer had no time to lose, and he determinedly headed towards his car in the parking lot. The weather had made up its mind, and it had taken a turn for the worse. As Archer stepped outside, he had to pick up the pace, almost jogging to reach his car. The air had grown colder, much earlier than it had in the previous days and weeks. The late afternoon had shifted into early evening, and the dark, heavy clouds obscured the last rays of sunlight. Raindrops pelted the asphalt and concrete around him with growing intensity, like setting the stage for what felt like an ominous opera's final act. Inside his car, he started it and took a moment to breathe and warm himself up. He again contemplated calling Halaya, 
He wanted to tell her everything about his life, what he did, and who he was. In this web of mystery that he had found himself in, it bothered him that he himself had kept the person he cared the most about was in the dark. For some inexplicable reason, he wanted to invite Halaya to the island to see it for herself. For an even more unexplainable reason, the island that disgusted him at first had become a second home. Perhaps it could be that for them both. He swore to himself that he would make that call as soon as the day's tumultuous events were over, if they ever were. Archer's car smoothly exited the parking lot, and he navigated through the first two security booths without any issues. However, as he approached the third and final checkpoint, he noticed a shift change in progress. Soldiers, dressed in long, thick and practical green raincoats, saluted as some left, and others arrived to take their positions. Among them, Archer quickly recognised the corporal in charge of checking passes and IDs. He let out a sigh, feeling a surge of frustration. Aisha Jennings. She was the one who had planted doubts in his mind about his relationship with Halaya in the first place. He didn't need any more stress at this moment. Archer shook his head, hoping to avoid any unnecessary confrontation. As Archer pulled up to the security booth and lowered his window, Jennings flinched, but quickly recovered and acknowledged him with a nod, but her demeanour seemed indifferent. She appeared somewhat pale and disinterested, leaving Archer to wonder whether her attitude was a result of their previous argument, her own stress, or some other factor entirely. Papers, Van Reek, sir, Jennings said absent-mindedly. Archer did as told. I didn't mean to hurt you, Aisha, Archer said. I know I did, but I want you to know I didn't mean to, he continued while Jennings inspected his papers. She gave them back. Checks out, Van Reek, sir. Drive safely, Jennings said respectfully. But Archer couldn't miss the deliberate coldness in the choice of her overly formal choice of words. Archer sighed, perhaps too visibly. He looked back at Jennings and saw her gaze was clearly looking somewhere beyond him. Something on your mind, Corporal Jennings? Archer asked as politely and calmly as he could in those circumstances. At first, it seemed like Jennings hadn't even heard Archer's question. Her gaze was stuck on his eyes, but somehow it looked like she still wasn't looking at him, like he wasn't even there. Her mouth moved as if she was going to say something. But then, with a sudden jolt, she snapped back to attention and gave the order to lift the barrier. As it began to rise, Archer couldn't help but feel that Jennings had intentionally ignored his question, leaving him puzzled and frustrated. You will reply when spoken to by a superior officer, Corporal Jennings, Archer commanded. His tone surprised even himself, and it was evident that Jennings's fellow soldiers on guard duty had also heard it amidst the sound of rain hammering the booth's roof. Drive safely, Van Reek, sir, Jennings said formally, but coldly and audibly. Jennings met Archer's gaze, her expression a mix of embarrassment and frustration, devoid of any formalities. Nothing formal about it. Archer drove past Mullins, who allowed him to pass without stopping, and saluted. Archer didn't return the salute. His mind was still at the third booth. Jennings's cold demeanour lingered in his thoughts. Her gaze was eerie, almost unnatural. She seemed a shell of who she had been. He wondered if her frosty reaction was solely due to his previous rejection, or if she had realised something more, something left unsaid. Her unspoken thoughts weighed heavily on Archer's mind as he continued driving, and he couldn't shake the feeling that there was more to the situation than met the eye. The possibility that she might be somehow involved with the Sternian presence on the island crossed his mind, but he quickly dismissed it as implausible, and if she had uncovered any pertinent information, he believed she would have shared it with a superior officer such as himself or Major Fulroy, given her close working relationship with the latter. Archer's rational side told him that the most likely explanation for Jennings's demeanour was the recent breakup with Williamson and his subsequent rejection. The emotional turmoil from their personal relationship might have weighed heavily on her, causing her to act cold and distant, 
Nonetheless, he couldn't help but feel there was something more beneath the surface that she had left unsaid. As Archer neared the town of Finis, his eyes were drawn to a flickering source of light in the distance. At first, he mistook it for a streetlight, but it quickly became evident that it was more than that. The flickering light was enveloped in smoke, which rose ominously into the night sky. Archer's heart sank as he realized the direction from which the smoke was emanating. The sound of Archer's car engine roared as he sped into town. The night had descended, casting the town in an eerie darkness that was only broken by the orange glow of the raging flames. Archer maneuvered through the narrow streets with precision, his heart racing. He had to get to the source of the chaos, find out what had caused this disastrous fire. As he approached the town centre, the ominous sight became apparent. The heart of the town was ablaze. It was Tom's Bar, a cherished local establishment that had been an integral part of the community for generations. Archer had spent many a night in that place, sharing drinks, laughter and stories with the townspeople. The memories made within those walls were now vanishing into the engulfing fire, the walls of the building crackling and falling in an agonizing symphony. People rushed frantically in all directions, their faces filled with panic and despair. Some tried to carry buckets filled with water to the scene, while others simply gazed at the inferno in disbelief. Firefighters were on the scene, doing their best to combat the blazing monster with powerful streams of water, but it was apparent that they were fighting a losing battle. The intensity of the fire, the searing heat, and the towering flames made it clear that this was no ordinary blaze. In an ironic twist, the rain that had begun falling was doing little to extinguish the fire. Despite the raindrops falling from the heavens, they evaporated before they could even touch the flames. Archer's concern deepened as he observed the futility of the efforts to control the fire. The situation was far from ordinary. It was too orchestrated, too well executed to be a simple accident or an act of arson. This wasn't the result of a drunken brawl or a disgruntled individual seeking revenge. It was a calculated destruction, a display of military-grade precision. The evidence suggested that someone had intentionally set the bar ablaze using something far more sinister than ordinary ignition fluid. Perhaps something military-grade. On the edge of the sidewalk, Archer spotted Tom, the beloved bartender of the ill-fated establishment. He didn't seem to care about the rain that fell around him. His gaze was transfixed, locked onto the heart-wrenching scene unfolding before him. Archer parked his car, hastily exited, and pulled on his own raincoat. He rushed to Tom's side and laid his hand on Tom's shoulder. Tom flinched ever so slightly, but as he turned and recognised Archer, his face, though smeared with soot and streaked with rain, transformed into a subtle yet appreciative grin. Van Riek Archer, always at the scene of the crime, Tom said humorously. The crackling of the fire almost buried their voices. I'm sorry, Tom, Archer said compassionately. Tom spread out his arms awkwardly, as if he was trying to say something with his hands. It's not the walls that I'm worried about. I've got insurance, Tom began, with Archer wholeheartedly expecting a remark about the memories made in the bar that were now lost. But the vintage display for 125, year old McNichols I just received in the mail yesterday. One of a kind collector's item. And it's in the back room, Tom explained nodded towards the charred back side of the bar and smiled. Archer couldn't help but let out a scoff that sounded a little like a laugh. Still, the sight of Tom's bar engulfed in flames was undeniably a heartbreaking one. Archer's love for the island had definitely started in that very bar. He couldn't help but feel a deep pang of sadness as he watched the blaze consume the cherished space. The firefighting efforts seemed to be making headway and the fireman reassured the gathered crowd that the blaze could be contained, minimizing the risk of it spreading to nearby buildings. Archer couldn't help but appreciate that the bodies of Menendez and Phillips had been retrieved by Colonel Hugenager's team before the fire's outbreak. The presence of these bodies, albeit lifeless, provided a potential lead and a crucial piece of evidence 
that could be instrumental in uncovering the truth behind the ongoing crisis. As Archer stood at a safe distance from the flames, his thoughts circled around two crucial questions. Who had set the fire and why? The suspicion lingered over the fifth man at Gilroy's dinner table, the elusive Sternian commando who remained at large on the island. The motive to distract them. It was a theory that held weight, and the urgency of tracking down this commando had intensified significantly in light of the arson that spewed before him. But distract them from what? Just then, Archer got his answer in the form of a phone call from Colonel Huganagger. Archer nodded to Tom and went into the slight rain cover provided by the edge of a nearby corner store's roof. Archer answered the call. Are you at the Gilroy house? Huganagger asked without introduction. No, Archer began. There's a bit of a situation. Tom's bar is on fire. I'd be an idiot not to assume this is some sort of distraction. He put his suspicions into words. For a second, there was an ominous silence on the line. I'm pretty sure you're exactly right, Archer. What do you mean, sir? There's a bit of a situation on the sea as well. I just got word from the ADS Nicholson. They had been contacted by a Stanian Navy major by the name of Otto Claudius, if that rings a bell, who claimed the Nicholson was on Stanian waters. That's bullshit, and they know it, Archer replied instantly, without registering the name mentioned. Once he did, it sent a shiver down Archer's spine as memories of his days serving with the Antnian rangers in Stania flooded back. Claudius was no ordinary figure. He was a man of high and feared reputation, who had a formidable history of brutality and unwavering loyalty to the Stanian regime. It was a deadly combination of ruthless efficiency and unflinching allegiance that made Claudius a name to be dreaded. In Stania, Claudius was a trusted operative who executed the orders of the authoritarian leaders without a hint of compassion. He was infamous for his disregard of human life, sending his men to their deaths without a second thought if it served the greater purpose dictated by his superiors. It was this cold-hearted pragmatism that allowed Claudius to carry out harrowing missions and conquests with relentless determination. Claudius was recognized as a conqueror of not just towns, but entire cities, leaving a trail of destruction and chaos in his wake. The invasion of an island, in comparison to his past endeavors, would be a piece of cake. Be as it may, it appeared on the Nicholson's radar that a Stanian vessel had entered their immediate vicinity. The Nicholson asked the vessel to divert course, but Claudius radioed them and reported he had been authorized to open fire unless the Nicholson would divert course instead. He didn't do it, did he? He did, Huganaga confirmed. Archer couldn't believe it. A Stanian vessel had opened fire on the flagship of the Antnian Navy on international waters. Casualties? None, fortunately, but Claudius was successful in what he was trying to do. The Nicholson had to divert course slightly, but they did so to avoid being fired upon again. As they did, the smaller Stanian vessel cruised ahead of them. Towards the island of Finnis, Huganaga said. His words hit Archer like a bowling ball to the genital region. Archer came out from under the roof and rushed towards his car, waving a goodbye and his apologies to Tom. Needless to say, I need you in the harbour. All personnel present have been alerted. Military police are on their way. If there is anything we can do to stop the Stanians from invading the island, we have to try, Huganaga said. His voice was absurd. He couldn't believe his own words. Neither could Archer. He just nodded to himself as he started the car. On my way, he said, and hung up. He did a fast U-turn, sliding on the wet road, and headed for the harbour. His heart was racing like never before. Throughout his career, Archer had always been the one on the offensive, the one leading the charge into hostile territory. He had been the operative executing daring break-ins and infiltrations, operating behind enemy lines in faraway lands. The theatre of war had typically been a distant realm, a place where he was sent to confront the enemy and carry out critical missions. But today, something had irrevocably shifted. The war was coming home. 
Chapter 15 Archer navigated his way through the narrow streets arriving at the small harbour. Darkness had descended like a heavy curtain over the coastal town. The normally tranquil harbour, known for its picturesque views of moored boats and tranquil waters, was now a stark contrast to the postcard-worthy scenes it usually offered. As he pulled up to the harbour, Archer was immediately struck by the frenzied activity. The area was abuzz with activity as a multitude of military vehicles descended upon the scene. He quickly counted somewhere between fifty and seventy armed soldiers, positioned in various strategic locations, their fingers poised on triggers, ready for the unexpected. Despite the readiness, there was an unmistakable sense of unease and disorientation in the air. While each soldier held their weapon with a firm grip, there was a prevailing uncertainty about where to direct their vigilance. The stark truth was that none of them truly knew what they were preparing to face. But amidst the uncertain glances and whispered conversations, every gaze seemed to be drawn to a particular point on the horizon. In the distance, Archer could discern the faint yet unmistakable glimmer of light. These were not the friendly illuminations of the ADS Nicholson, barely visible tens of kilometres away, but mostly cloaked in the inky blackness of the night. Instead, the focus was on a smaller vessel, which had extinguished all its lights. The vessel was making a determined advance, growing closer with each passing moment. Despite its relatively short distance, perhaps five kilometres, it was moving at a speed that seemed almost supernatural, leaving no doubt about its rapid approach. Amid the hectic and apprehensive scene of the crowded harbour, Archer emerged from his vehicle. The heavy rain continued to fall, creating a cold, wet atmosphere that only added to the tension in the air. It didn't take long for Archer's keen eyes to spot military police sergeant Marjoris. She stood among a group of personnel, her posture radiating authority and determination. Next to her, Archer noticed Corporal Browning, his arm cradled in a makeshift sling. What's the situation? Archer asked without introduction and without acknowledging Browning's presence although he wanted to. Him being there despite his injury was a testament to the courage of an Antnian soldier. Every hand was needed on deck now. The Stanian vessel is approaching fast, Browning confirmed. Our defences? We've got a harpoon on the way, Marjoris said in turn. Archer nodded in agreement as he listened to Marjoris's plan. The harpoon land-to-sea missile was indeed their best course of action in this situation. This highly specialised weapon, designed for both land and sea-based launch, held tremendous destructive power. One of the key strengths of the Harpoon missile was its impressive range. It could strike targets at a distance of up to 140 kilometres, which made it highly effective for engaging enemy vessels from a safe standoff position. In addition, the missile had a remarkable speed, reaching velocities of up to 240 metres per second as it closed in on its target. The Harpoon missile was equipped with a highly explosive warhead designed to inflict maximum damage upon impact. It was specifically engineered to be capable of crippling or sinking enemy ships with a single, well-placed strike. The precision and lethality of the Harpoon made it an ideal choice for neutralising incoming naval threats. While the decision to launch such a weapon was not one to be taken lightly, the impending threat from the rapidly advancing Stanian vessel left them with little choice. Archer recognised the gravity of the situation and the need for decisive action. At that moment, he realised he'd be the one who'd have to make that call. You're in charge, Majoris said, turning to Archer as if she had heard his thoughts. Archer nodded. What do you want to do? she continued. Archer stared at the incoming vessel for a brief moment. Archer grappled with a heavy decision. He was well aware of the atrocities committed by the Stanian regime and the depths of cruelty exhibited by some of its operatives, like Otto Claudius. But not all were like him. Most were men just like Archer, brainwashed to take orders from a man like Claudius. The impending invasion posed a dire threat, and time was rapidly running out. 
if they wanted to prevent the occupation of the island and protect the lives of its residents, and most importantly, the far more deadly weapons hosted in World's Terminal, they needed to act swiftly. Archer knew he couldn't afford to second-guess his decisions in the face of such a critical situation. Get the harpoon ready, and get me a connection with the vessel, Archer ordered, his tone firm. Margeres nodded. You heard the Van Reek. Come on, let's go, she ordered the soldiers around them. As orders echoed through the harbour, a flurry of activity ensued. The urgency in the air was palpable, and everyone moved with purpose. The sound of an approaching armoured truck filled the air, and Archer knew it was carrying the vital harpoon missile launcher. The truck advanced toward the dock, and Archer watched as the launcher was carefully positioned at the head of the dock, ready to engage the approaching Stanian vessel. Military personnel and harbour workers collaborated seamlessly to prepare the harpoon missile for launch. Archer observed the process with a mix of admiration for the efficiency of the operation and the gravity of the situation at hand. In the distance, the menacing silhouette of the Stanian ship drew closer, its relentless speed accentuating the urgency of the situation. Archer's mind raced. He wanted to try diplomacy, but knowing the Stanians and the unrelenting reputation of Otto Claudius, he might have to give a firing order. Soon. Just then, a soldier that Archer didn't even check the rank of brought him a radio from the same booth where Archer had begun his journey at the island of Finnis. Archer took the radio. The line is open, Van Riek, sir, but they aren't answering, the soldier said. Archer nodded and lifted the microphone to his lips. Stanian vessel. This is Van Riek Romeo Archer of the Antnian Armed Forces. You are on Antnian waters and I have been authorized to sink you unless you turn around and return to your port of origin. Immediately, Archer commanded, with not a single drop of hesitation in his voice. Everyone's attention was drawn to Archer. No one doubted him. He meant every word. Yet the speaker stayed quiet. It crossed Archer's mind that Stanians were notorious for their imperfect English. It was possible they simply didn't understand what he was saying, for a brief moment, Archer looked for the right words in the Stanian's native tongue. Hockest, van Riek Archer, exercitus antniani, verte vel peribitis, he said as convincingly as he could. The weight of uncertainty hung heavy in the air as the minutes ticked by, and the harbour of the island of Phoenix seemed to hold its breath. The only sounds were the rhythmic drumming of the rain on the ground and the ceaseless, restless sea unfurling before them. Archer, like everyone else, remained on edge, waiting for a response from the incoming vessel. The entire scene felt like the climax of a suspenseful thriller, where the fate of an entire island was poised on a knife's edge. Then, a moment of hope, however fleeting, pierced the tension. The roar of the approaching vessel's engine, which had been steadily closing the gap between them and the island, ceased abruptly. It was as if the world had paused to listen. Perhaps, Archer thought, they had finally understood the gravity of the situation and had begun to alter their course. Perhaps the looming threat of military action had spurred them into compliance, or perhaps their hesitation had been due to a language barrier, and they were now working on turning their vessel around. Perhaps, perhaps, perhaps. The word perhaps seemed to echo in Archer's mind. It encapsulated the uncertainty that still gripped him around everything in recent days. In the midst of the tension-laden silence that had gripped the harbour, a sudden eruption of sound startled everyone. The voice that emanated from the radio was a stark contrast to the eerie stillness, a deep and menacing timber that instantly sent shivers down Archer's spine. Though the voice did not identify itself, Archer's instincts told him it could belong to none other than Major Otto Claudius. Van Riek Archer, Claudius began. I'm afraid you're too late, he continued. With the radio in hand, Archer stepped closer to the armoured truck where the soldiers stood at the ready, fingers hovering above triggers. Despite Claudius's ominous words that resonated from the radio's speaker, Archer raised one hand in the air. He signalled the soldiers not to fire just yet. 
Instead, he wanted to hear what Claudius had to say, to gauge the situation as much as possible before making a decision that could potentially lead to a deadly confrontation. But then, in the midst of this high-stakes standoff, Archer's gaze locked onto the approaching Stanian vessel, which had now come to a stop. At the rear of the vessel, something unprecedented unfolded. The vessel's rear end appeared to be opening, and from within emerged a flurry of speedboats. At first, it was two, then three, and in rapid succession, more and more speedboats spilled forth from the vessel's hold. Eras, Van Rieke, Tempus est tibi perire, Antnia peribit, the voice from the radio spoke. People around Archer, those skilled not in Latin, informally asked the Van Rieke to translate despite all hierarchy. Sergeant Marjoris nor Corporal Browning were one of those people. They knew exactly what Otto Claudius had just said. Archer's eyes widened in disbelief, mirroring the collective astonishment of those around him. All present held their collective breath, their eyes locked on the sudden influx of a dozen speedboats, each manned by at least as many figures. And then the radio crackled once more, Mortem ad Antnia. Nobody needed a translation for that. And then the entire fleet of speedboats cried at the top of every man's lungs, a primal war cry that sent chills down everyone's spines. Not only that, it reached them so fast, told a told about the narrowing distance between the approaching speedboats and the coastline. And finally, the unmistakable rattling of gunfire erupted from the sea. Muzzle flashes illuminated the approaching boats. The distance was great, but ricochets bounced off the rocks below the deck. Time for talking was done. Fire! Archer screamed at the top of his lungs. The soldiers manning the harpoon missile launching truck reacted with precision, their training kicking into high gear. Focused on the Stanian main vessel, which had already been left in the wake of the speedy speedboats, they locked their target in their sights. As the missile's launching sequence initiated, there was no deafening explosion, only a distinct, fiery swoosh that reverberated through the air. It swiftly soared into the sky, propelled by its turbojet engine, leaving behind a trail of smoke and fire. For an instant, the gunfire that had punctuated the tense standoff fell silent, replaced by the thunderous roar of the missile's ascent. Soldiers on both sides watched with bated breath as the harpoon missile traversed the distance over the sea, its course unwavering and deliberate. In the span of mere seconds, the incoming missile struck the Stanian vessel head-on, resulting in a colossal explosion that painted the night sky with a brilliant, fiery inferno. The fate of the vessel was sealed beyond doubt as flames and smoke billowed from the wreckage, signalling its imminent descent into the depths of the ocean. The explosion illuminated the harbour, casting eerie shadows and a fiery glow upon the faces of those witnessing the devastation. Though the vessel continued to burn fiercely, it took mere seconds for its mass to start gradually sinking beneath the surface of the sea. The harrowing moment that followed the destruction of the Stanian main vessel was marked by a disconcerting silence. Both the Antnian and Stanian forces were paralysed momentarily, their collective gaze fixed upon the fiery wreckage. However, the silence was abruptly shattered as a cacophony of gunfire erupted from the sea. Archer ordered everyone into cover as he heard the unmistakable sounds of machine guns. For a brief, heart-stopping instant, the tracer bullets, glowing streaks of death, sliced through the darkness, connecting the shooter to their prey. They first struck the deck of the dock, but machine gunners soon became evident as they swiftly adjusted their aim. A sudden burst of bullets tore through the soldiers who had operated the missile launching truck just moments ago, their heads disappearing into thick red clouds. Amid the chaos and carnage that unfolded around Archer, men fell left and right, those too slow to rush into cover, some dead, some injured. Their screams penetrated consciousness like a nightmare. Soldiers took desperate cover behind the armoured trucks, their faces etched with dread. In the midst of this harrowing onslaught, Archer grappled with a profound unease. 
This was a terror unlike anything he had experienced before. He had been to many hellholes, but nothing quite like this. He was suddenly burdened with self-doubt, questioning his own leadership capabilities. The stark realization struck that there were only a handful of officers capable of rallying troops into battle on the island. The nature of world's terminals need to know operations left them with a scarcity of experienced leaders in situations like this. Despite the overwhelming fear and uncertainty, a glimmer of hope emerged. At least two Antnian soldiers had mounted the towers of the armoured trucks, their machine guns spitting deathly retorts towards the approaching speedboats. The gunner above Archer's head returned fire like a bat out of hell. Archer peeked over the cover of the truck and saw the return fire strike one of the oncoming vessels, causing it to capsize in a spray of chaos. Perhaps, amid the turmoil, there was still a fighting chance for survival. As the barrage of bullets continued to rain down around Archer, a chilling close call took his breath away. A single tracer round sliced through the air, passing perilously close to his head. In that split second, he watched as the machine gunner in the tower next to him slumped lifelessly. The same fate befell the man in the armoured truck behind Archer. With a deep, resolute breath, Archer made a conscious decision. If this was the day he met his demise, he would do so in a blaze of glory. He harboured an intense anger, a righteous fury that surged within him. It was directed at the cruel regime that had moulded its people into instruments of destruction and death. In that moment, he felt as though some higher power had placed him on this island with a purpose, to ensure that the enemies of its people faced retribution. Resolute and fearless, Archer ascended to the machine gun tower. He moved aside the body of his fallen countrymen, and his hands found the hot, unyielding grip of the HKMG-5. His eyes fixed on the approaching speedboats, mere hundreds of metres away. They were uncomfortably close, but in that proximity lay their vulnerability. Without hesitation, Archer squeezed the trigger to its fullest extent and held it there. The machine gun roared to life, unleashing a torrent of fury. Amid the relentless onslaught, a primal scream erupted from Archer's lips. His senses were consumed by the deafening roar of his own machine gun. His eyes fixated on the closest speedboat, a swift vessel inhabited by black-clad commandos. The deluge of lead tore through the vessel and its occupants. The murky rain that poured down from the heavens made it challenging to discern the gruesome details, but the outcome was unmistakable. Archer had dealt a crushing blow to the enemy's ranks. The speedboat's hull was cleaved open, its interior a grisly mosaic of shattered limbs, torn flesh and twisted metal. Chaos reigned, and the vessel was capsized, a victim of the merciless tempest of violence that had consumed it. The unforgiving sea eagerly devoured the remnants. In that thunderous moment, Archer's indomitable will and unyielding firepower had served as a scythe of retribution. The atmosphere had shifted. The Antnian soldiers, once hunkered down, began to rise and return fire, even with small arms. The incandescent tracers streaking across the shoreline and the harbour's dock pierced the darkness making the rain appear inconsequential. On board the approaching speedboats, the Stanian commandos were forced to seek refuge at the vessel's lowest points, their black-clad figures barely visible against the inky night. A commando operating one of the speedboat's mounted machine guns found himself in Archer's crosshairs. The trigger was squeezed, and in the blink of an eye, the commando's head was obliterated, his lifeless body sent hurtling off the rear of the speedboat. Archer's vision swiveled towards another target, the middle of the vessel. His finger tensed on the trigger, ready to unleash a storm of bullets. But in that critical moment, a cold and metallic click resounded in the chaos. Momentarily, he was left defenceless as the enemy speedboats continued their relentless advance, drawing nearer with each passing second despite the returned fire. The chaos and turmoil of the battle raged on, with Archer determined to stay atop the armoured truck as a beacon of resolve for his men. 
He fervently searched for more ammunition, knowing that his leadership was pivotal in this dire moment. Suddenly, a deafening explosion erupted with earth-shaking force, close enough to send a seismic shockwave that almost threw Archer off the top of the truck. He turned his gaze to the right and was met with a horrifying scene of destruction. The armoured truck adjacent to him had been reduced to twisted wreckage. Two soldiers lay sprawled across its remains, lifeless forms of sacrifice to the inferno. A corporal nearby shrieked in agonizing pain, her lower leg torn from her body. Archer's attention was drawn to one of the Stanian speedboats, which had come to a halt around fifty meters from the shoreline. His heart raced as he identified the shape of the object held by a commando standing aboard his boat amidst the chaos, an RPG-7 rocket launcher. The weapon was being reloaded, and Archer knew that he was its next victim. Without a moment to lose, he whirled around and leaped from the top of the armoured truck just as the world behind him was engulfed in an enormous explosion. The shockwave seized him in mid-air, propelling him through the rain-soaked night, and he collided with the side of a nearby SUV. He landed with a heavy thud, his ears ringing from the concussive force. Struggling to regain his bearings with blood rushing from the top of his head, Archer's gaze shifted back towards the dock, where several Antnian soldiers were rushing to defend it. But their valiant efforts were cut short as a sudden storm of bullets descended upon them. One by one they fell. In a nightmarish tableau of black-clad figures wielding the distinctive AK-12 assault rifles of Stanian special forces, the unthinkable was made vividly clear. The island of Phoenix was being invaded. Antnia was being invaded. Chapter 16 Colonel Huganaga sat in his dimly lit office on the fourth floor of World's Terminal, the weight of the world on his shoulders. It was well past his usual departure time of 4 p.m., but he had been prolonging his stay as of late, finding solace in the familiar surroundings of his workspace. Going home was a prospect that held little appeal, for it had become a place where nobody eagerly awaited his return. The daylight outside had receded, and a relentless rain tapped a melancholic rhythm on the window pane. With the majority of his work for the day completed, he found himself idly holding a crystal glass containing a rather generous pour of whiskey. In his other hand, a pen rested. He contemplated writing a letter to Derek, as he had many times before. The words just didn't wind themselves. Each sip of whiskey brought a momentary respite from the relentless mental burdens he carried. It was a ritual, a solace that he sought within the confines of his office. As the gatekeeper of one of the most potent and destructive weapons on earth, his responsibilities weighed heavily upon him. Recent events hadn't made it any easier. Suddenly, Huganaga felt the floor around him shake. The earth seemed to tremble beneath him as the deafening roar reverberated through the building, causing the windows to rattle violently. Startled and disoriented, Huganaga's grip on his glass and pen faltered and they plummeted to the floor. With a sudden surge of adrenaline, the colonel leapt to his feet, his heart pounding in his chest. He was drawn towards the source of the deafening blast, which appeared to originate from the sea on the mainland side of the island. Panic and confusion intertwined in his mind as he hurriedly moved to the window, his hands trembling as he grasped the curtains and pulled them aside. In the distance, roughly ten kilometres away, the shoreline was illuminated by a massive conflagration that seemed to consume the sea itself. Flames danced ferociously, casting an eerie orange glow against the darkened horizon. A colossal burning wreckage jutted from the water, a haunting testament to the magnitude of the disaster that had just occurred. It was an image of chaos and destruction that defied explanation. The sudden tumult had not gone unnoticed by his subordinates. As the reverberations of the explosion subsided, his office door swung open, and Lieutenant Wellesby, his usually composed demeanor replaced by an air of urgency, rushed into the room. The two officers were drawn together to witness the unprecedented and surreal scene unfolding before them. What the hell is that? Wellesby asked quite rhetorically, but Huganaga had an answer nonetheless. The Stanian vessel. 
Archer must have destroyed it, Huganaga said, and hoped Archer had a damn good reason to open fire. While he had come to trust Archer, and an invasion of Antnean soil was to be stopped by any means, you didn't just sink opposing vessels without reason. Amid the chaos, a distant but distinctive rattle of automatic gunfire began to echo across the shoreline. In the obscurity of the evening, the tracers from the sea acted as eerie beacons, intermittently illuminating the coastline with their fiery streaks. Although their visibility was hindered by the thick, rain-soaked veil that shrouded the landscape, Huganaga and Wellsby, with their elevated vantage point, were able to discern the distant shoreline. The tracers, which initially travelled from the sea towards the land, now began to reverse direction. Gunfire erupted from a position on the shoreline, causing the sounds of battle to intensify. The air reverberated with the harsh staccato of automatic weapons, and the sporadic flashes of tracers provided intermittent glimpses of the fierce engagement taking place in the distance. The officers could only watch in tense anticipation, their expressions etched with concern and bewilderment as the ongoing firefight on the mainland side of the island unfolded before them. Binoculars, Huganaga demanded. Wellsby turned around to the desk and brought out an old pair of binoculars Huganaga kept in his drawer. They had belonged to his father and travelled with him on every deployment. Huganaga lifted them to his. Colonel Huganaga raised the binoculars to his eyes, carefully adjusting them to get a clearer view despite the darkness and the considerable distance. The shock on his face was tremendous as he observed the unmistakable silhouettes of the speedboats. Lowering the binoculars in disbelief, Huganaga exchanged a wordless glance with Wellsby. Sir, what is it? We're being invaded. What? We're being invaded, Huganaga repeated in disbelief. Radio to the harbour immediately, he then ordered. Without uttering a word, Wellsby rushed to the desk and swiftly began manipulating the radio, attempting to establish communication with the military checkpoint at the harbour. Huganaga could feel the mounting tension in the room as he waited for Wellsby to relay the critical information. Instead, Wellsby turned to Huganaga with dead eyes. What did they say? Huganaga asked. Wellsby just shook his head. The outer line is dead, Wellsby finally uttered. What does that mean? Huganaga asked. In that instant, before Wellsby could answer, the world went black. Wellsby disappeared from Huganaga's sight, leaving the colonel momentarily disoriented. His initial absurd thought was that a stray bullet had hit him in the back of the head through the window, and he was now dead. No, that was impossible. The sheer distance of ten kilometres made it an implausible scenario. A growing sense of dread washed over him as he recognised that something far more ominous was at play. The distant gunfire faded as his jaw dropped. Sir? Wellsby asked from within the darkness, trying to keep his voice calm, but it wasn't. Here, Huganaga said, his voice trembling even more. The realisation struck him with a chilling certainty. The power from World's Terminal had gone out, and even more concerning, the backup generators clearly weren't working. The disorienting aftermath of the explosion left Archer struggling to regain his composure. His ears were still ringing from the blast, and his vision was blurred as he lay on the cold, rain-soaked asphalt in the harbour. The tactile sensation of the ground beneath him, the rain on his face, and the sight of lifeless bodies strewn around him gradually spurred his return to focus. As the haze lifted from his mind, the cacophony of gunfire became increasingly distinct and his vision sharpened, though it was a harsh reminder of the grim reality he faced. But although his mind was back in the game, his body didn't want to cooperate. He attempted to rise with the aid of an SUV door, but his feet didn't listen to his brain. The scene before him grew increasingly dire. The first Stanian speedboat had successfully reached the dock, and Archer watched with a sinking feeling as a group of four black-clad commandos disembarked. They opened fire upon the Antnian soldiers who were scrambling for cover behind the vehicles, tending to their wounded comrades. The situation was deteriorating rapidly. 
In the midst of the chaos, several more Stanian soldiers, in the process of clambering onto the dock, were receiving assistance from their boatmates. The disparity in numbers and the overwhelming force of the invaders cast a shadow of despair over Archer's hopes. If the remaining Stanians successfully made landfall on Antnian soil, the battle would quickly end before it began. There was no chance they could be held off long enough for the battleship ADS Nicholson to bring reinforcements unless the Stanian boarding could somehow be stopped. As if in response to Archer's unspoken plea, a rapid-moving figure suddenly emerged into view from behind him. It was none other than Sergeant Marjorie's, her uniform drenched from the relentless rain and splattered with what seemed to be blood. But her face radiated determination as she carried a large and formidable-looking pipe-like object in her hands. Marjorie's acted with a profound sense of purpose. She swiftly knelt behind one of the nearby SUVs, her sinewy shoulders bearing the weight of the mysterious device. It wasn't until this moment that Archer discerned the nature of the weapon she held, an Apilus, a single-shot rocket launcher designed for anti-armor purposes. A glimmer of hope flickered across Archer's face, his mouth curling into a triumphant grin as he realized Marjorie's audacious intent. The tension in the air seemed to hold its breath as Marjorie set herself to fire the rocket. A colossal explosion of fire and smoke erupted from the Apilus. The rocket streaked across the distance, hurtling towards the far end of the dock. Upon impact, it wrought devastation upon the Stanian commandos already present on the dock, as well as those striving to embark. They were sent flying skyward, torn into fragments smaller than grapes. The sound of relentless gunfire and cries of desperation briefly subsided as the nine dozen Stanian commandos in the remaining nine boats sought cover within the scattered rocks along the shore. The detonation of the dock had disrupted their meticulously planned invasion, turning the assault into a scene of mayhem. The massive explosion had sent shards of wood and dismembered human remains hurtling through the air at astonishing speeds, creating an environment of gruesome destruction. The obliteration of the dock acted as a significant impediment to the Stanian forces' strategies, forcing them to take cover amidst the rocky terrain. The shoreline, although not an insurmountable obstacle, offered the Antnian soldiers a significant advantage. With a better firing position and increased cover, the defenders now had a chance to hold off the invaders until the ADS Nicholson's arrival, which would inevitably spell the end of the Stanian assault. Archer couldn't help but smile. His heart swelled with hope as he saw Marjorie's drop the Apilas and rush over to assist him. Random shots rang out into the night, a frenzied exchange of fire between the Antnians and Stanians. Yet, in comparison to the earlier pandemonium, it felt as though a profound silence had settled over everything. Archer's ears rang, and the world appeared eerily quiet as he readied himself for the ongoing battle. Van Reek, are you all right? Marjorie shouted as she approached Archer. Her voice was barely distinctable, but Archer nodded as he tried to lift himself up. Yes, Sergeant, hell of a shot, Archer commended. Marjorie nodded and helped Archer to a sitting position. Seeing her up close with his vision now returned, Archer couldn't help but notice the gruesome sight she presented. Her uniform, especially the chest area, was stained with blood. Despite the disconcerting appearance, Archer couldn't discern a distinct wound or injury. Are you hit? he asked. Marjorie's expression shifted to a deep frown and she glanced down at her chest. It isn't mine, she said. Marjorie's gaze shifted over her right shoulder towards the harbour booth. Archer couldn't help but follow her gaze. Next to a military police SUV by the harbour's booth, it was Browning, lying in a twisted and unnatural position, his chest a horrifying, unrecognisable mess. The sight sent a shiver down Archer's spine, and the gravity of the situation sank in even deeper. I was going to give him CPR, Marjorie's began, but I didn't know where to put my fucking hands. Sir, she said, voice trembling. 
A burst of anger went through Archer, and in that moment he decided he was going to find the people behind this and make them regret their birth. You did what you could, Sergeant, Archer said. We have to alert World's Terminal. I'm sure they've already heard this shit, but still. See if we can get any reinforcements from there before the ship arrives, he continued. Majores stared into his eyes for a second, then shook her head. No, the line is dead. I thought you knew. What do you mean the line is dead? All comms are down. There's no dial even. Best case scenario, the Stanians have cut all phone lines. Worst case scenario, World's Terminal is without power, Majores explained. Archer sighed. Then someone has to be the messenger, he said. You should go, he continued. Majores shook her head. With all due respect, sir, you should go. But these are my men. With all due respect, sir, these are my men. Yours are at World's Terminal, Majores said. Sergeant Majores was right in her assessment. The personnel at the harbour mainly consisted of military police, harbour guards, and other town personnel who operated under the jurisdiction of the military police, which placed her in charge of them. Her prior actions had already demonstrated her leadership and combat capabilities, making her the perfect choice to hold off the Stanian commandos from advancing further into the harbour. It was evident that she was highly respected by the men she led, and they would follow her orders without question. On the other hand, Archer's strike team, positioned at World's Terminal, was under his command. This gave him the flexibility to decide whether to bring them to the harbour, and he realised that their presence could indeed be a game-changer in the ongoing conflict. Moreover, he recognised that, in the worst-case scenario that the Stanians advanced beyond the harbour, he had to ensure that World's Terminal remained protected. In addition to confronting the invading Stanians, capturing the traitor who had been aiding them was of paramount importance. They needed to stop this insider from assisting the Stanians any further. Just as Archer considered his next steps, a sudden explosion rocked the area, causing a devastating impact. One of the armoured trucks stationed near the remnants of the destroyed dock was struck, leading to a catastrophic explosion that sent three Antnian soldiers hurtling through the air. Another soldier, engulfed in flames, panicked and ran wildly before collapsing into a twitching, lifeless form. You need to go now, sir, Marjorie said. Can you walk? she asked. Archer nodded. I think so. Help me up, Archer said. Marjorie's lent a hand to help Archer regain his feet, and he quickly unholstered his glock. In a silent exchange of nods with Marjorie's, who reached for a downed rifle, they coordinated their efforts to regain control of the dire situation. Archer, as swiftly as possible, rounded the military police SUV that had offered them cover and made his way to his parked sedan, which was positioned away from the heart of the chaos. With the car's engine still running, he jumped into the driver's seat and placed his Glock on the passenger seat. He saw Majores providing orders and instructions to a group of military police officers to maintain a defensive position. In the distance, he could finally make out the illuminated outline of the ADS Nicholson approaching slowly but steadily. Archer sighed in relief. He knew that the losses suffered were heart-wrenching, but the troops holding the harbour were their last hope, and if they could withstand the onslaught for just another half hour, it would represent a substantial victory for Antnia. With determination, Archer backed away from the harbour and set the car in motion, driving toward World's Terminal. Now, all he had to do was to make sure World's Terminal was secure. SDR, quickly, Huganaga said, as he turned on the flashlight he had just found from his top drawer. The SDR, or simply short-distance radio, was a specialised communication device crafted by Antnian military specialists with the exclusive purpose of serving World's Terminal's unique needs. This compact radio, no larger than a common lighter, had been developed to be used under the most improbable circumstances when all power and conventional communication systems failed. Now, in this pitch-black and disorienting darkness brought about by the power outage, Colonel Huganaga was frantically searching for his own SDR. 
As he fumbled in the inky blackness, his hands grazed across his cluttered desk, documents and personal effects scattered chaotically. Lieutenant Wellsby retrieved his own SDR and threw it across the dimly lit office to Colonel Huganaga. Control room, this is Colonel Huganaga. What's the situation down there? Huganaga asked into the radio, fearing for the worst. To his great relief, Corporal Carlson came on the line. We're out of all power here, sir. Cameras and sensors are dark, Carlson said. His voice was crackling and full of fear, but Huganaga couldn't blame him. He hadn't sensed this sort of fear himself, ever since fighting a Stanian regime assassin hand-to-hand -hand in the deserts of Nileslabad nearly 15 years ago. Can we get the hydropower working? Huganaga asked. If we can get someone in there, sir. Nobody there is answering, not even on the SDR, Carlson replied. Carlson immediately regretted it. Instruct your men to use the SDR to contact different sections. Everyone into defensive positions, Huganaga began. And you, Carlson, you need to go into the generator room, Huganaga commanded. He didn't say so lightly, but he trusted Carlson as one of his best technicians. Both Huganaga and Carlson were well aware that this mission held the potential for danger. Enormously so. If the generators had indeed failed, the logical conclusion was sabotage. And where there was sabotage, there usually was a saboteur. Yes, sir, Carlson said with obvious hesitation. Huganaga thought of giving some encouraging words, but he didn't know any. He just laid the SDR on the table. The kid's going to be all right, sir, Wellsby said. Huganaga nodded. Contact Captain Stiller on the SDR and make sure he knows everything that's going on. Let's hope someone from the harbour is on the way to give a report, Huganaga said. Wellsby nodded in turn and reached for the SDR. Just then, an enormous burst of machine gun fire shattered the relative silence within World's Terminal. It was followed by the rapid staccato of smaller arms fire. The reverberations of gunfire tore through the night, but this wasn't a distant battle occurring at the harbour. It was much closer, right within the secure perimeter of the facility itself. The realisation struck Huganaga and Wellsby like a bolt of lightning. Their eyes met briefly, a silent exchange of mutual alarm, before they turned and sprinted back to the window. As they gazed out into the pitch-black darkness, their hearts sank. Several muzzle flashes briefly lit up the area surrounding the three entry checkpoints, illuminating the horrifying scene outside. Oh my God! Huganaga couldn't help but audibly exclaim his thoughts. The scene that unfolded outside the facility was a nightmare brought to life. The remotely operated machine guns, previously used to guard the facility, had somehow turned against the Antnian soldiers stationed outside. These automated sentinels, designed to protect the perimeter, had now become instruments of death, mercilessly cutting down the very personnel they were meant to safeguard. The horrifying tableau left approximately five dozen lifeless Antnion bodies strewn across the compound's front lines. Amid the carnage, a few cries of agony managed to pierce through the relentless gunfire, only to be abruptly silenced by singular and coldly efficient assault rifle shots. Beyond the now blood-soaked checkpoints, three ominous black Humvees, their dark-clad occupants standing beside them, slowly advanced towards the final gates of World's Terminal. The black-clad commandos opened fire with their AK-12 assault rifles, targeting the few remaining Antnian soldiers who had valiantly tried to defend the front yard. As the last Antnian defender fell, Colonel Huganaga felt the weight of his worst nightmares descending upon him. The very heart of World's Terminal had been breached, and the enemy was now firmly within their stronghold. This isn't an invasion. We're being taken over. In the dimly lit control room, Corporal Carlson's trembling hands slowly released their grip on the remote controls for the machine guns. These same machine guns, designed to protect the facility using the same SDR technology he had just used to lie to his commanding officer and essentially his father figure, had just been used to slaughter his fellow Antnian soldiers, colleagues, friends, his brothers. Tears streamed down his face, 
falling onto the control panel as he openly wept. The room was filled with a sense of betrayal and despair as the very technology that was meant to defend the facility had been manipulated to aid the enemy in infiltrating their defences and carrying out a massacre. Only moments ago, the control room had been a place of camaraderie where friends had gathered to operate the security measures that protected the facility. Now, it was a haunting scene of devastation, with the lifeless bodies of his fallen comrades scattered across the room. Again, the phrase, if you had a gun against your head, had taken on a chilling reality for Carlson. Carlson turned to face the shadowy figure illuminated by a single flashlight, a person he had always trusted and respected deeply. However, all the kindness and camaraderie that had defined their relationship had been revealed as deceit. The cold, unfeeling steel of a pistol held in the big and strong, uniformed hand pressed against Carlson's forehead, a final act of betrayal and cruelty. It's done, Carlson wept. Good. And Huganaga? He thinks I'm on my way to start the hydropower. Good, the cold voice commended. With a squeeze of the trigger, the pistol discharged, and Carlson slumped in his chair, joining the fallen soldiers he had once fought alongside. Chapter 18 Captain Stiller found himself in a surreal nightmare, lying within a concealed niche in the basement of World's Terminal. His eyes stared uncomprehendingly at the unimaginable scene that had unfolded before him. He had dedicated years of his life in service to his country confronted the darkest corners of the world, yet nothing had prepared him for the invasion of his homeland, his home. The invaders had breached the impenetrable defences of World's Terminal, a place that should have been impervious. The sheer audacity and ease with which it had occurred defied all logic and reason. Stiller lay in the shadows, surrounded by the lifeless bodies of his men, who had been slaughtered like helpless sheep. The bodies were scattered throughout the hallway, a gruesome testament to the overwhelming advantage the Stanian invaders had held. The captain had fired back. He was certain he had hit at least one of the Stanians, but their numbers and firepower had been too great. The realization that the invaders were likely heading for the silo room, where the Hammerstone missiles were housed, sent a chill down Stiller's spine. He couldn't afford to remain in hiding. He was going to do something about it. But as Stiller was about to get a move on, he was momentarily interrupted by a chilling, all-too-familiar sound. It was like the distinct noise of massive rocks being moved by some otherworldly force, emanating from the direction of the silo room. This sound was etched into his memory, a sound he had heard multiple times during his career at World's Terminal. He knew that sound well, for it was the very noise of the missile silo's colossal doors being maneuvered open. This task had often fallen within his purview, and he had been the one responsible for manipulating the controls of these doors, specifically the ones on the surface. The significance of these massive doors was immense, as they concealed the Hammerstone missiles beneath them. Once those doors were open, it took nothing more than a simple press of a button to unleash a power capable of reshaping the world as they knew it. Stiller stood frozen in shock, his mind racing with the implications of what he was hearing. The realization struck him like a thunderbolt. The Stanian invaders were not only within World's Terminal, but were gaining access to the silo room, putting the apocalyptic power of the Hammerstone missiles within their fingertips. His heart wanted to grab the first gun on the floor and charge into the silo room but he knew he could take down a few Stanians at best and delay their mission by a few seconds, if that, before being gunned down himself for nothing. His head knew that rushing headlong into the silo room, guns blazing, would be an act of futile bravery. It might momentarily disrupt the Stanian invaders, but it would not prevent them from achieving their goal. Instead, he needed a strategy, a plan of action that could meaningfully impede their progress and buy precious time. As he pondered his options, the sudden flickering of a lamp in the blacked-out hallway caught his attention. It wasn't a stable illumination, but rather a brief, momentary surge of electricity that had momentarily rekindled the lamp's feeble light. 
Soon, other lamps in the hallway started to shimmer with faint, ghostly glimmers of light. Realization struck Stiller like a lightning bolt. The Stanians had to have started the hydroelectric generator in order to gain control of the missiles. Now, someone was manually operating it. The hydroelectric generator served a dual role. Its primary function was to ensure the operational readiness of the Hammerstone missiles, especially their launching controls. Yet, its secondary purpose was to gradually restore power to the various sections of the facility. The dim illumination he observed was a testament to the generator's effectiveness. Stiller nodded to himself with resolute determination. He knew he was in a dire situation and his chances of survival were slim. There was little he could do, and he was certain he would eventually be killed, but the more time he could play for Allied forces to reach World's Terminal, the better. Stealthily, he began to move in the direction of the generator room, stepping over the lifeless bodies of his fallen comrades. Outside, Archer moved towards the building just as stealthily. His heart raced with a mix of determination and fear. The missile silo doors stood wide open in the cliff end of the facility to Archer's left, an ominous sight against the backdrop of darkness. The gravity of the situation weighed heavily on him. Archer understood that initiating a missile launch was a complex process that required expert knowledge. Given the severity of the situation, the Stanians were likely to have brought their own experts with them. If the traitor from World's Terminal was among them, a missile launch could be imminent. The seconds were ticking away, and the fate of the island and its people hung in the balance. Still, Archer clung to a glimmer of hope. He hoped that the Stanians were currently scratching their heads trying to get into the missile launch mechanism, and this gave him a critical window of opportunity. But he was under no illusions that it would be enough to stop the Stanians on his own. Archer's heart pounded against his chest, the rapid beat a mix of fear and frustration. Every step he took towards the Humvees left behind by the Stanian commandos only deepened his sense of hopelessness. The overwhelming odds against him clouded his mind. He couldn't shake the feeling that no matter how fast he moved, time was slipping away too swiftly for him to stop the impending catastrophe. His only source of encouragement lay in the possibility of resistance from within the facility. As he neared the Humvees, the sense of impending doom loomed over him. The commandos had showcased unparalleled efficiency in eliminating a significant man advantage the Antnian soldiers had held. This clearly indicated the exceptional skill and training of the Stanian operatives. They were not just regular soldiers, they were the cream of the crop, the elite handpicked by the Stanian regime for this mission. Yet, even the best of the best make mistakes. A glint of light right in front of Archer startled him. A lone Stanian commando tasked with guarding the main building's entrance had unknowingly committed a mistake as ancient as the history of warfare itself. The end of a cigarette shined red. The glowing ember broke the darkness, a beacon revealing his position under the shelter of the building's shade, leaning against the large doorframe approximately twenty meters away from Archer's position. Archer didn't stop, he just steered his direction to his left, stealthily making his way toward the Humvee positioned halfway between him and the guard, he crouched, meticulous in his approach to get a better view of the unsuspecting commando. The lone guard stood alone, his AK hanging loosely over his shoulder, secured by a three-point sling. As he brought the cigarette to his lips, lifting his balaclava to take a drag, the soft glow of the ember highlighted his face. His young features carried a light shadow of stubble, exuding an air of carefree nonchalance, seemingly convinced that the area was secure and there was no cause for concern. Archer considered his options from behind the Humvee's rear. A shot from this distance would be easy, but if the enemy had placed more guards on the other side of the entrance, an alarming gunfight he was trying to avoid at this point would be imminent. He needed to enter the building unnoticed. His decision was clear. Archer put his rifle on the ground and pulled out his multi-tool. He snapped open the blade in his right hand and made a calculation. It was a likely success and it was a chance he had to take. As quietly as he could, 
Archer jumped out from behind the Humvee and started sprinting. He hoped the first few steps would be masked in the guard's hearing by the pouring rain, and the next second, the commando would waste in confusion. Archer sprinted as fast as he could. The commando saw him approach. He turned his head, cigarette in his mouth, and Archer could see the terrified flash in the man's eyes by the cigarette's red glow. The commando reached for his rifle, but Archer leaped the stairs, left hand reached out. With a swift movement, he clogged the man's mouth by pushing the cigarette into it with his hand. All light disappeared, so Archer proceeded by experience. He pressed the body against the guard so he couldn't reach his weapon properly. Archer saw the commando's eyes were filled with terror, but Archer didn't hesitate. In a split second, he raised his blade and punched it into the heart of the commando. In one movement, he pulled it out and stuck the blade into the guard's throat. He twisted and only muffled. Terrifying coughing could be heard from under the hand that still covered the commando's mouth. While the commando was still dying, Archer grabbed his body and dragged it behind one of the Humvees. He was dead before they got there. Archer checked the body but found nothing useful. He grabbed his rifle and stealthily advanced to the front entrance. He tried the door and found it open. He put his fingers below the door and pushed it towards himself as little as he could. Through the hole, he peeked in. A very, very dim light illuminated the large lobby. One of the generators was still working to his guess. Had to be the case, since the silo doors had been opened. To his surprise, he saw no commandos at guard. He didn't know exactly how to feel about it. He was glad his first stage of entering the building would be easier, but then again it most likely meant all Stanians would be in the basement leading to the silo room, and thirty-on-one odds weren't exactly great. Beneath the surface, Captain Stiller, his heartbeat thrumming with anticipation and anxiety, stood at the threshold of the generator room. The circumstances surrounding the attack on World's Terminal were grimly apparent. The Stanian invaders had assumed the threats had been neutralized, their efforts having potentially incapacitated, eliminated, or taken captive the defense forces. The absence of patrolling figures in the basement corridors was a small, fleeting comfort amidst the engulfing darkness. The illumination from the lamps was gradually increasing, creating a dim but discernible path, guiding Stiller's way through the desolate, eerie halls. All Antians he found on the way were long gone. For their sake, he clenched his glock tightly in one hand, his knuckles whitening as his fingers coiled around the handle of the generator room door in the other. It was an instinctive gesture, a feeble yet determined grasp at the reality that loomed ahead. The chaos that had unfolded within the confines of the facility was unfathomable. The method by which the commandos had infiltrated the supposedly impregnable world's terminal baffled Stiller. Rumors of a mole within their ranks circulated, casting a shadow of doubt over their collective trust. Stiller, among others, had been resistant to believe in the existence of a traitor amongst them. Yet, as he stood on the precipice of imminent danger, the spectre of betrayal couldn't be denied. But he had to focus on the task at hand. He could hear speaking from inside, two or three voices, maybe more. But one thing was clear, they were all speaking Latin. Captain Stiller gripped the door and heaved it open, allowing the stark light of the room to flood his vision. In an instant, his trained eyes darted around the illuminated space, soaking in the grim tableau that unfolded before him. The chamber, once home to critical backup generators, now lay in disarray. The backup systems were a smoking, jumbled mess, disabled and reduced to nothing but a line of useless mechanical wreckage. Amidst the ruin, one machine stood strong, the hydroelectric generator, untouched and operational. Yet, what stole Stiller's immediate attention was the sight of four figures within the well-lit room. Two men, dressed in dark-clad attire, were manually operating a crank, a stark contrast to the advanced technology that surrounded them. This archaic method, however, seemed to be their tool to keep the hydroelectric generator running. Two other guards, equally dressed in black, 
kept a vigilant watch on their surroundings, their rifles at the ready. Stiller's entrance drew their attention. The two guards' alert gazes locked onto the intruder, and in an instant they hoisted their rifles, positioning themselves for defence. Reacting swiftly, Stiller didn't allow the time for hesitation. His training and resolve were his tools. Point, fire, point, fire. Two swift and precise shots were all it took for the guards with raised rifles to collapse to the ground. But he wasn't done yet. The two remaining guards, witnessing their comrades fall, swiftly moved towards their rifles, leaning against the wall, intent on retaliation. Stiller's unwavering determination to keep at least one commando alive guided his next actions. Firing shots towards the wall beside the rifles, the bullets embedded themselves in the solid surface, a warning to deter the guard's approach. Prohibere, Stiller screamed at the top of his lungs with an unmistakable authority in his voice. The guards, momentarily frozen by the ringing gunshots and the bullets' impact, hesitated for a split second. Stiller seized the moment, firing two more shots, this time at the ground near their feet. The bullets struck close, causing the men to halt abruptly. Or I will shoot, Stiller added to the guards. Fear and understanding flickered in their eyes, their hands instinctively rising in surrender. Their silence echoed throughout the room as their raised arms signified their compliance. In the cold, dimly lit confines of the missile silo room, Major Otto Claudius found his patience waning. His eyes flitted over the massive warheads in the missile silos, each poised to unleash destruction upon designated targets. Sixteen locations across mainland Utopia were marked for obliteration, including major cities in Antnia, Ossington, and Lord Edward's Republic. In Claudius's view, these regions were infested with capitalists and dissenters who needed to be eradicated. Launching one Hammerstone missile at a Stanian city would serve as the pretext for their retaliatory strike, which would obliterate half the continent. To some, it was an unsettling plan, but to Claudius, it was genius. He had come up with it himself anyway. Besides, in war, there was always some level of collateral damage. Claudius's attention flickered to the control panel in front of him, where a mix of Stanian operatives was hard at work. Some were focused on the control consoles, attempting to maneuver the missiles into position. Others were securing the Antnian soldiers, who now lay lifeless or incapacitated. Claudius had always held his team in high regard, recognizing their competence. However, at this pivotal moment, he was growing increasingly frustrated with the situation. Their actions seemed to be undermining the meticulous planning he had devoted to this operation. Tragicomically, in their hasty assault on the Antnian technicians in the room, all had been killed. Now, Claudius's crew faced the daunting task of initiating the missile launch on their own. Their inside man didn't have a clue as to how to operate the missiles either. The controls continually flickered, sometimes functioning properly and at other times faltering, causing delays in their attempts. Claudius was exasperated. Those idiots he had dispatched to manually crank the hydroelectric generator were at the root of the problem. Their clumsiness and lack of skill had complicated what should have been a seamless operation. As if Claudius needed more trouble, the distant but unmistakable sound of rapid assault rifle fire echoed through the room, their sharp staccato cutting through the silence and catching everyone off guard. In an instant, the control panel that had been the focal point of their attention lost all power, plunging the room into an even deeper darkness. The dim lighting, which had provided the room with a faint glow, flickered and then extinguished entirely. The darkness was almost suffocating. The commandos turned on their night vision goggles, but all they could see was a fuming Major Claudius. He couldn't comprehend what had just happened. In the midst of their high-stakes mission to launch the Hammerstone missiles, the sudden loss of power was a catastrophic setback. Claudius contemplated the two likely explanations. Either the individuals sent to operate the hydroelectric generator had proven to be even more inept than he had imagined, or there were still Antnian survivors lurking within the facility. Ao, 
Claudius commanded. Two men, poetically named Amos and Ames, Claudius's most trusted soldiers, approached him and took stance. Gather your team, split into pairs, sweep the building, start from the generator room. Van Riek Archer had just passed through the lobby of World's Terminal when the lights went out once again. His eyes had barely adjusted to the dim light that had been briefly illuminated before fading into blackness once more. Not that he necessarily wanted to see. The lifeless forms of his fellow servicemen lay scattered across the floor. The painful truth was that many of them wouldn't rise again, their life forces snuffed out by the merciless assault of the Stanian commandos. In his path, he had encountered a few survivors, the wounded and the lucky ones who had managed to escape the initial onslaught with minor injuries. These comrades groaned in pain, their injuries a testament to the violence that had unfolded. Despite their suffering, they were fortunate enough to cling to life, but in the grand scheme of Archer's mission, they offered little aid. He had to prioritise his objectives, and saving the survivors, while noble, was not his immediate concern. The most pressing task was to prevent the catastrophic launch of the Hammerstone missiles. With grim determination, Archer pressed forward through the darkness, aiming for the cafeteria located on the far end of the facility. It was a place of solace, often frequented by the facility's staff, and he hoped that some more capable survivors may have sought refuge there, out of sight from the merciless intruders. Archer retrieved a flashlight attachment from the gear of a fallen comrade. This device proved invaluable, offering a dim, subtle illumination that allowed him to navigate the treacherous darkness while keeping a low profile. Adjusting the beam to its lowest setting, he pointed it downwards to prevent casting an overt light that might reveal his presence to anyone nearby. As he approached the entrance to the cafeteria, his heart racing in anticipation, a faint sound disrupted the silence. It wasn't a groan or a shuffle of movement, but rather a muffled, tense gasp, as if someone tried to hold their breath to avoid being heard. Someone was present and alert, a sign that there might indeed be someone within. At first, Archer took stance, ready to breach and fire, but something calmed him down. The voice, although tense and cautious, did not exude hostility or aggression. Rather, it seemed filled with fear and apprehension. Identify yourself, Archer acted on instinct and said strongly, but trying to keep his voice down and without moving from concealment. He heard the voice again, then just silence. Identify yourself, Archer repeated. He saw a head move behind a table. Peering carefully inside, his flashlight illuminated the darkened room. Behind a table, a figure stirred, prompting Archer's immediate attention. A pair of eyes emerged from the shadowy refuge. It was Sergeant Williamson, unmistakable with his blonde, dishevelled hair and oil-streaked overalls. In his trembling hands, Williamson clutched a butter knife in one and a Sig Sauer pistol in the other. He seemed shaken but unharmed, lacking any visible injuries. Archer, Williamson sighed in relief. The two approached each other. Briefly, Archer explained what he had seen outside. Williamson's eyes widened as Archer went on. Jesus, Williamson exclaimed at the end. Archer nodded. What happened to you? he asked. Williamson's expression changed to one of even more concern. Archer frowned. Talk to me, Sergeant. Sir. This is going to be awkward. Why? I came to look for Aisha. Corporal Jennings, I mean, Williamson exclaimed. Even in the dim light, Archer could see Williamson's face had turned bright red. In these circumstances, the drama between Jennings and Williamson should have been Archer's last concern. But with what he had been told by Corporal Ron at the security booth about Jennings' sudden disappearance, any clue was welcome especially if she had betrayed her country. I knew she was on security duty, so I went to look for her. They said she had left for the main building. I thought they meant she came in for a break, a coffee or something. So I came here, but as I did, lights went out and everyone started running. I kind of froze, Williamson explained. Why did you go look for her? Archer asked. 
Well, you know, we used to be a thing. I know. Yeah, so, I'd like it to still be so, sir, Williamson said, and said like he was dying saying it. Archer frowned. I thought you guys had something going on, Williamson said. Archer snorted and shook his head. He couldn't believe he was talking about relationships while two dozen commandos were seizing the building, and a flock of them had seized the harbour. I have someone, Archer scoffed as he turned around and started walking towards the door of the cafeteria. The fact that Williamson had noticed his friendship with Aisha made him feel guilty, and all the more confident that once these Stanian bastards were dealt with, he'd make sure nothing came between him and Halaya ever again. Sorry, sir, Williamson said. Where are we going? What's the plan? He continued as he followed Archer out of the cafeteria. I'll explain on the way, Archer said frustratedly. Regardless, he was happy to see Williamson didn't hesitate, but followed him without further questions. A few more men like that, and they might just have a fighting chance. The air in Huganaga's office was thick with tension, the dim light casting long shadows that danced to the rhythm of distant gunfire from the direction of the harbour. Not only that, somewhere in the building something was going down. Huganaga's weathered face reflected the turmoil within. The urge to join the fight, to lead his men in the thick of the chaos, clashed with the harsh reality of his age. His hands, scarred from years of service, gripped the edge of his desk knuckles whitening under the strain. Wellsby, the once meticulous accountant, now fumbled with the communication device. Marjorie, Damn it! Respond! he muttered, frustration etching lines on his usually composed face as attempts to contact Marjorie in the harbour yielded no response. Through the window, the approaching ADS, Nicholson painted an ominous silhouette against the darkening sky. The edge of Huganaga's lips twitched upwards for the first time in days as he realised the battleship was minutes away from firing range. Look at that, Huganaga remarked, his voice gravelly with a mix of exhaustion and hope. Wellsby, still grappling with the malfunctioning device, shot a worried glance toward the colonel. Huganaga's gaze remained fixed on the battleship. It's a chance. Let's hope it's not one too late. Captain Stiller's breaths echoed in the confined space of the generator room, a mix of sweat and tension permeating the air. His fingers tightened around the grip of his rifle, the cold steel offering a small comfort in the face of the imminent storm. In the dim light, the two Stanian commandos, their faces etched with the weariness of the battle and the demise of their comrades at the feet of this Antnean officer, stood at the mercy of Stiller's firearm. The sudden banging on the door sent shivers down Stiller's spine. He knew he was a marked man, a pawn in a deadly game. Yet, as long as he held hostages and stood guard over the generators, those missiles remained silent, a potential catastrophe averted. Aperi out, Mori! The Latin command reverberated through the steel door, a chilling reminder of the stakes. Amos, the Stanian commando under Otto Claudius's command, barked orders to his men. Half of the dozen-strong squad continued forward through the basement corridors with their methodical sweep of the facility, while the others, under Amos's directive, prepared to breach the door with C4. Stiller's jaw tightened as he pictured the procedure on the other side of the door. He didn't need to hear their conversations to understand the impending threat. The countdown to chaos had begun and Stiller, resigned to the inevitable, knew the door would be blown open. In a calculated move, Stiller motioned to the hostages, his eyes meeting theirs in a silent understanding. Stand by the door. The hostages complied, but the expression on their faces told Stiller they knew just as well as he did what their comrades were about to do. What are we going to do? Williamson repeated his earlier question, his voice a hushed murmur as he followed Archer to the stairways adjacent to the main elevator. Both men moved with a deadly grace, guns clutched in their hands, ready for whatever awaited them. Archer couldn't help but notice the subtle signs of Williamson's uncertainty, his inexperience in the art of gun battles and the grim act of taking a life. Yet, 
An air of calm determination surrounded the sergeant, instilling a quiet confidence in Archer. It was a trust born in the crucible of danger, where actions spoke louder than words. We need to round up any Antlion still kicking around in this mess. We're forming a makeshift team, and we're hitting back hard. We clear on that. Williamson, though less seasoned, nodded in understanding, his eyes reflecting a readiness to follow Archer into the heart of the storm. Good, Archer continued, his gaze forward as they ascended the stairways towards the jail section. Have you seen Major Fulroy? Archer inquired, his tone taking on a sharper edge. No, sir, I haven't seen him, Williamson admitted, his tone tinged with concern. Fulroy was supposed to interrogate Captain Rush, Archer continued, a flicker of frustration crossing his features. To Williamson, this was clearly a surprise, but he didn't dare question the Van Reek. Our first stop is the jail section. We need to find them both, but there's no time to waste. We're already late, so let's get a move on. As they manoeuvred through the stairway, Archer wrestled with an unspoken question. The name lingered on the tip of his tongue, an inquiry about Jennings. The atmosphere, already thick with tension, made the question awkward, and Archer chose to let it hang in the air, a weight between them that mirrored the uncertainty that surrounded their every move. As they ascended to the floor above, the acrid stench of gunpowder mingled with the metallic tang of tension. The realization struck both Archer and Williamson like a sudden jolt when they reached the jail section, the door had been brutally shot open. A pair of lifeless feet, clad in the familiar Antnean uniform boots, protruded through the cracked doorway. It was an unsettling sight, a grim testament to the ruthlessness that had swept through the facility. Stay behind me. Check your line of fire, Archer hushed, his tone carrying the weight of caution, and Williamson nodded in silent acknowledgement. Archer, with the precision of a seasoned warrior, approached the damaged door. Peering through the gap, he witnessed a haunting scene unfolding within. Two Stanian commandos, clad in battle-worn attire, methodically advanced through the jail section, AKs held at the ready. Archer's eyes narrowed as he took in the grim reality the jail had fallen into enemy hands. The ominous echoes of their boots on the cold floor resonated like a sinister prelude. Suddenly, one of the commandos halted, raising his weapon and firing two ruthless shots into a cell. A muffled scream reverberated, the sound of life extinguished in an instant. It was the execution of an Antnean soldier, defenceless and trapped. Williamson's expression shifted to one of terror, a reflection of the brutality that unfolded before them. Archer's eyes twitched with a dangerous intensity. There was a reason he was chosen for this mission a reason embedded in his capability to navigate the brutality of war. He kicked the door off its hinges, a sharp metallic groan cutting through the air. His rifle raised. Archer became the storm that the Stanian commandos had yet to face. Before the two intruders could turn to confront their unexpected adversary, four shots rang out in rapid succession. The jail hall became a symphony of sudden silence, as the commandos, caught off guard, crumpled to the floor as if their strings had been abruptly cut with freshly sharpened scissors. The room, once a canvas of brutality, now bore the mark of Archer's swift and lethal intervention. Damn, Williamson muttered. Archer shot him a silent signal, a terse reminder to keep quiet as they entered the jail. The atmosphere hung thick with the residue of violence, a pervasive reminder of the brutality that had swept through the cells. It was an undeniable reality. All Antnians, both guards and prisoners, had been executed. Advancing through the steel bar cell rows, the grim tableau in each occupied cell mirrored the others. The metallic tang of blood permeated the air, an unrelenting stench that clung to the walls. Archer navigating the gruesome aftermath, couldn't shake the worry that awaited them in Rush's cell. Reaching the last cell, Archer's worst fears seemed to materialize. There lay Captain Rush, the man now a mere shadow of himself, having endured unspeakable horrors. 
The cruel irony struck Archer as he thought of the captain's family, survivors of countless trials, only to lose him in this brutal fashion. Yet, something caught Archer's attention. Compared to the others, there was a noticeable absence of blood. Only a small stain marked Rush's hoodie, left ribcage. His eyes were closed, not open. A man like Rush would never go down with his eyes closed. And then, then there was a subtle movement, almost imperceptible. Rush's chest moved, a faint sign of life. Williamson, quickly, find the keys. Archer's command sliced through the heavy air as realization struck. In the chaotic dance of rain and shadows, Marjorie's and her remaining men sought refuge behind the shelter of cars and SUVs scattered across the desolate harbour. The rain, relentless and unforgiving, transformed the scene into a blurred tableau. The stalemate that had gripped the harbour persisted. The Stanian commandos, despite their numerical advantage, hindered by the rocky banks and the wreckage of the destroyed dock. Random shots pierced the air, a cacophony of violence that echoed against the backdrop of the storm. Marjorie's, crouched behind cover, took a moment to grieve the fallen Browning. He had been her closest friend besides her wife, and to be frank, Majoris was certain only she knew his biggest secret. It hadn't been a surprise, but still it had taken a lot of Browning to confine in her. All of that bravery was gone, and Majoris wasn't going to let his ultimate sacrifice go down in vain. All she needed was an opportunity. Then, like a divine intervention, the massive horn of a ship resonated through the chaos. The ADS Nicholson, an imposing silhouette in the rain-laden darkness, had arrived. The Stanian commandos shifted their attention towards the sea. Relief washed over Marjoris. The odds had shifted. Stanian personnel, this is Commodore Hugh Storwell of the Antnian Navy. You are surrounded. I am authorized to use lethal force. Throw your weapons into the sea or you will be killed the commanding voice echoed across the harbour. The tension thickened, and Marjoris knew the Stanians wouldn't surrender without a fight. Too bad for them. As if defying the warning, a couple of Stanian soldiers opened fire towards the approaching ship. The ADS Nicholson, still out of effective range for small arms fire, but not the other way around, responded decisively. The machine guns on the hull unleashed a torrent of lethal force, cutting through the rainy night like a javelin. Stanians collapsed into the sea, their figures swallowed by the darkness, panic rippling through those who remained. With the Stanian commandos disoriented and scrambling for cover, right into Marjorie's line of fire, Marjorie's seized the opportunity. Fire! she commanded, raising her glock. The night erupted in gunfire once more as her men unleashed a controlled fury upon the disorganized enemy. Shots rang out, finding their targets with deadly precision. Marjorie's Glock barked, almost taking the head off the leading commando. Two more fell under the hail of her bullets, and her dozen remaining uninjured men efficiently eliminated the rest. And as the concerto of gunfire faded, silence finally descended upon the battered harbor. For a brief moment, Marjoris could breathe again. For a brief moment, it felt like the rain was washing away the blood on her hands. But relief was fleeting. The cold reality settled in. World's Terminal was still under attack. Once the forces of ADS Nicholson got on solid ground, surely they could overpower the Stanians in the facility, but was it too much too late? The generator room trembled as a thunderous explosion tore through the door, transforming the once solid barrier into a mangled wreck. Shreds of metal and body parts scattered, a gruesome aftermath of the detonation that had obliterated the two Stanian hostages. Captain Stiller, quick on his feet, sought cover behind the generators, the deafening roar of the explosion reverberating in his ears. At this point, Stiller cared little for any collateral damage to the generators. In fact, he welcomed it. Damaged generators meant a potential impediment to the Stanians' ability to launch the missiles. The room, now a chaotic battleground, crackled with tension as a lone commando ventured in, unleashing a hail of gunfire. 
Stiller's retaliatory shots tore the attacker to pieces. More Stanian commandos emerged into view, and Stiller continued his lethal dance. Rounds from his weapon found their mark, tearing into the chest of two adversaries before an ominous click signalled an empty magazine. Stiller dropped the spent firearm, swiftly reaching for his Glock. Two more shots echoed and struck another commando before the rushing Stanians closed in on Stiller. They grabbed him from all sides, kicked him in the back, and violently pinned him to the floor. Stiller's defiant shouts filled the room, echoing against the cold metal walls. One of the Stanians, an officer by the looks of it, sneered. Latin? Amos asked. Yes, but I won't waste it on you, Stiller retorted, a hint of defiance in his eyes. The Stanian officer took offence and responded with a vicious kick, sending Stiller sprawling on the floor, but freeing one of his hands. How do we restart the generators? You can't. Why is that? Amos pressed. You're all dead, Stiller uttered with a strained conviction. Amos frowned at the defiance, but his satisfaction was short-lived. A sudden realisation struck him as he spotted a hand grenade rolling out of Stiller's hand. A primal scream escaped Amos's lips, but before it could fully form, it was cut like hot butter by the explosion that engulfed everything and everyone within ten metres. A distant explosion echoed from below ground, momentarily halting Archer in his tracks. The flickering and dimming of the lights cast a fleeting shadow over the scene, but the absence of a nuclear blast provided a modicum of relief. Regardless, the urgency of the situation demanded his continued focus. Light, Archer instructed Williamson, who swiftly recovered from the momentary confusion induced by the explosion. Williamson activated his flashlight, illuminating the makeshift medical area where Archer was diligently tending to Captain Rush's injuries. The injured officer lay sprawled on a makeshift bed, his ribs in need of urgent attention. It's a knife wound, Williamson observed, his tone matter-of-fact. Archer acknowledged the assessment with a curt nod. Unfortunately, he was all too familiar with the kind of knife that had inflicted the injury, and suspicions loomed heavy in his mind. Major Fulroy isn't in the jail section, Williamson added. Archer nodded once more, his expression a mixture of concern and contemplation. His mind had connected many dots, not all, but many. Too many to ignore, but that had to wait. All right, he's all set. I did what I could. We'll have to leave him here, though. He's no use to us like this, Archer stated, a sense of resignation in his voice. The reality of their predicament dictated harsh decisions, and leaving Captain Rush behind, albeit temporarily, was a necessary sacrifice. Before Williamson could respond, however, footsteps, measured and purposeful, echoed from the direction of the entrance to the jail section. Archer swiftly gestured for Williamson to stay silent once again. Both men raised their weapons, backs pressed against the cold walls. Williamson obediently extinguished his flashlight, plunging the area into darkness. The approaching footsteps drew nearer, a harbinger of potential danger. Archer's trained senses kicked in. Combat boots, two pairs, rhythmic and well-trained. He discerned the distinct movement of rifles, likely H and K's given the absence of the AK's signature rattle. However, the equipment alone conveyed little. What captured Archer's attention was the familiarity in the pattern of the men's movement. Recognition sparked in his mind, a puzzle piece falling into place amidst the chaos. Halt! Archer's voice sliced through the tense silence, the command echoing in the confined space. The footsteps ceased, both pairs frozen in an invisible standoff. In the darkness, a palpable tension hung in the air, a moment pregnant with uncertainty. April 1999, Utopian Hockey Championships, final game, Antnia versus Ossington. Who scored the winning goal for Antnia? Archer's voice rang out loudly, a challenge thrown into the shadows. A swift response came, breaking the silence. Nobody! We were like ducks stuck in tar! The verbal exchange lingered in the air. A test passed, but the standoff persisted. We lost that game, Van Reek. 
Another voice joined in, and Archer let out a relieved, almost victorious sigh. He took Williamson's flashlight, stepping into the dimly lit hall. There, emerging from the shadows, stood Sergeants Carruthers and Michaels. Archer's smile widened, a genuine expression of camaraderie. It's good to see you boys, he greeted them. Thanks for that reminder, sir, Carruthers quipped, a hint of humor in his tone. I was barely three, but it still stings, Michaels added. Archer chuckled. These were the kind of men he needed, soldiers who could find humor in the face of impending doom. Laughing at the face of an extinction event was the mark of a man who death himself was afraid to take on. Williamson joined in, the shared camaraderie breaking the ice. In that unspoken moment, the four men understood that was it. The four of them against, well, all of them. Archer surveyed his small, reunited team. There was no need for elaborate explanations. They all knew what they had to do. All right, boys, let's go save the world, Archer said. A gunshot echoed through the cavernous missile silo room, shattering the tense silence. A Starnian commando crumpled to the ground, his head colliding with one of the ominous missile launching pads. Otto Claudius, his stainless Jericho pistol lowered, released a primal scream that reverberated through the metallic chamber. The air of impending promotion, medals and eternal glory had swiftly transformed into the stark reality of total mission failure and the looming spectre of dishonor and execution. Claudius's fury, unbridled and palpable, sent a clear message to his men. They stood at a wary distance, unwilling to incur the wrath of their disgruntled leader, who now faced the harsh consequences of failure. In the hierarchical structure of the Stanian forces, failure equated to death, a fate accepted by every soldier in their ranks. They just hoped Claudius would come up with another plan before he ran out of men to take his frustration out on. Then, a flicker of realization crossed Claudius's face. First, a smile tugged at the corners of his lips. The smile grew into a wicked grin, and finally, laughter erupted, a chilling sound that echoed like a prelude to a psychosis. His men exchanged puzzled glances, suspecting that their leader had descended into madness. But Major Otto Claudius was anything but mad. His mind, clear and calculating, had concocted a desperate but legendary plan. If he was going down, he was determined to go down with a resounding bang. The biggest bang in history, in fact. Huganagar and Wellesby sat in a tense silence. The distant lights of vehicles turning on in the harbour offered a glimmer of hope, a sign that the Navy might be on its way. However, the weight of uncertainty lingered. It could still be too late. Wellesby, we're going to need to find a way to contact the Navy and let them know what they're facing. Huganaga declared, the gravity of the situation reflected in his words. Wellesby, understanding the urgency, nodded resolutely. The adjutant knew it fell upon him to exit the barricaded office and search the storage for a working long-distance radio. Huganaga, burdened by the weight of command, couldn't bring himself to issue the order, and Wellesby spared him from that decision by heading off on his own. But as Wellesby approached the barricaded door of the office, a sudden onslaught of gunfire tore through it. Bullets ripped through the air, one nearly blowing his arm off, but in a strange twist of fate, likely saving him from a more severe injury by throwing him forcefully to the floor. Wellesby! Huganaga's scream pierced the air as his adjutant writhed in pain. Huganaga, acting on instinct, dove under his table, unholstered his colt sidearm and trained it toward the door. The barricaded entrance provided a momentary shield, but the danger was imminent. Wellesby, crawling away from the battered door, left a red trail in his wake. The sound of relentless banging on the door intensified. Huganaga, his heart pounding, opened fire in response. The deafening cracks of gunfire mingled with the muffled screams as the intruders on the other side faced the deadly retaliation. One of Amez's sergeants fell at his feet. The distant explosion from the basement had reached his ears, leaving him without contact with Amos, not only his brother in arms, but his brother in blood. 
Amez's grief transformed into a burning desire for vengeance against the perceived Antnean wrong believers. Another shot rang out, claiming another of Amez's men. Unwilling to endure further losses, Amez took matters into his own hands. Using the butt of his AK, he battered the hinges, determined to breach the barricade. His men, following his lead, charged toward the weakened door in unison, crashing through it with force. Amez's commandos collided with the makeshift barricade, crashing into the furniture that Huganagar and Wellsby had stacked against the door. In the ensuing confusion, gunfire erupted in all directions. Stanian commandos opened fire with their AKs, Huganaga unleashed rounds from his colt, and the one-handed Wellsby contributed to the chaos with blind fire from his Glock sidearm. The room became a cacophony of bullets, the only way to aim being to wait for the telltale muzzle flash of the enemy. Muffled screams echoed in the room, gradually fading as the tumult of gunfire waned with each successive shot. Huganaga, intimately familiar with the layout of his office, was confident that his shots had found their marks among the Stanian commandos. However, the ominous click of his empty pistol served as an unwelcome revelation. In the pivotal moment, Wellsby fired a shot that took down the last of the standing Stanians, plunging the room into a sudden and deceptive silence. Yet, something about the quietude felt pretentious to Huganaga. How right he was. Out of the darkness, the Stanian officer lunged at Huganaga over the table. An agile and athletic adversary compared to the aging colonel, Amez wrestler Huganaga to the floor with ease. Emez's punch landed with brutal force, striking Huganaga's jaw and leaving him questioning his ability to ever sip whiskey again. Wellsby, in a desperate attempt to intervene, fired blindly in their direction, only to have his own gun click empty. Huganaga tried to claw the man's eyes out, but he evaded every attempt. Huganaga tried to escape his clutches by leaning towards his table. In a desperate move, Huganaga used all his remaining strength, rose to his knees and seized a whiskey bottle from his table and smashed it over the assailant's head. Unyielding, the Stanian continued his assault, seizing Huganaga's throat and pushing him against the desk. He tried to claw at the man's face again, but the Stanian just turned his face. The grip tightened. Huganaga felt his last breath near, when suddenly in a flash he remembered something. He reached for the drawer in his desk, grabbed the pistol he had confiscated from Captain Rush earlier, and pushed it into the mouth of the Stanian officer. Amez didn't even realize the Antnean colonel had him dead to rights before his brains met the window of the fourth floor office. Huganaga collapsed onto the floor, the Stanian officer falling on top of him. Sir! Wellsby screamed in pain and concern. Are you okay? More so than he is, Huganaga sighed. Archer led Williamson, Carruthers and Michaels to the entrance of the basement. They had faced no resistance on the way, but Archer knew once he opened those doors, each of their last seconds could be at hand. This is it. We're going to the silo room. We're going to take them all out. And tomorrow we're all going home to our families. Got it? Archer asked. The others nodded, although Archer knew he was speaking to himself more than anyone else. Halaya's image flashed in his head. All doubts he had ever had about their relationship were gone. If he got out of this mess, he'd tell that girl everything about his life, past, present, and future. He'd tell her about every man he had killed, every mission he had taken, and if she still wanted anything to do with him, he'd marry the hell out of her. In that moment, it was more for her than the rest of the world that Archer decided he'd be the one to stop the Stanians, no matter the cost. With determination etched on their faces, Archer reached for the basement door handle, a palpable tension hanging in the air. Their weapons were poised, and a silent nod passed among them. Archer, the leader of this makeshift squad, reciprocated the nod and swiftly turned the handle. Pushing through, the four soldiers found themselves unexpectedly face to face with six Stanian commandos standing in the narrow hallway. The element of surprise was mutual. The ten men stood in silence for a good second, like a group of deer in the headlight of a speeding truck. 
The Stanians, raising their AKs in haste, were just as shocked as Archer and his team. In a heartbeat, the scene erupted into chaos. Archer, living up to his lightning-fast reputation, unleashed a single deadly shot from his H and K. The lead Stanian commando crumpled, his head exploding in a gruesome display that left his comrades splattered with gore. However, the unexpected turn of events took a dark turn. A shot from one of the commando's AKs found its mark with horrifying precision, hitting Sergeant Michaels squarely on the nose. In a spray of red mist, Michaels was sent flying, meeting a sudden and violent end. The shocking loss fueled Archer's rapid response. A burst of gunfire from his rifle turned the assailant's chest into a gruesome, unrecognizable mass as the other commandos sought cover behind a hollow in the wall. Amidst the chaos, Carruthers and Williamson sought cover behind a fallen locker, their training kicking in. The remaining Sternians retreated into the shadows of the corridor, firing single shots from their rifles as they backed away. Williamson, fueled by a mix of rage and adrenaline, trained his pistol into the hallway and fired blindly. One of his shots found its mark, striking a retreating Stanian directly below the belt. The wounded man screamed in unbearable agony, crumbling to his knees in sheer pain. Archer seized the opportunity, swiftly aiming his rifle and switching it to automatic. The two commandos attempting to aid their neutered comrade fell under the onslaught of gunfire. A merciful shot from Archer's rifle ended the suffering of the man writhing in agony. The last remaining Stanian, fueled by desperation, charged toward them with a blazing rifle but with an unmistakable intent for self-destruction. Carruthers, recognizing the futility of the Stanian's charge, allowed him to come closer before a single well-aimed shot from his rifle brought an end to the last vestiges of opposition. As the echoes of gunfire subsided, the men secured the now silent hallway. Carruthers knelt by Michaels, his eyes welling up with grief. Archer, though affected by the loss, allowed no room for sentimentality. There's nothing we can do for him, he declared, the coldness in his voice betraying the internal struggle. Carruthers nodded, closed his fallen comrade's eyes, and with a heavy heart, followed Archer and Williamson into the dimly lit corridors. In the distant reaches of the basement, the muffled echoes of gunfire reached Otto Claudius. His pulse quickened as he recognized that his plan B, the harbinger of destruction he had meticulously crafted, was nearing completion. However, the intrusive shots from an unseen adversary threatened to disrupt his malevolent delight in obliterating the island and exacting revenge on the Antnians who dared to occupy it. Amidst the tense atmosphere, Claudius's men worked frantically, installing C-4 onto the launching pads of the Hammerstone missiles. Each one of them understood the inevitable fate awaiting them, but the fear of failure outweighed the fear of death. Determined to see their mission through, they pressed on, driven by a grim resolve. Claudius, sensing the urgency, sprinted toward the massive silo doors, issuing a command to the two guards stationed nearby. Et fores! Claudere, he bellowed, ordering them to close the doors before the advancing Antnians could breach them. The fate of the island hung in the balance, a malevolent symphony of destruction and desperation playing out in the bowels of the nuclear facility. Around a corner, Archer, Williamson and Carruthers sprinted toward the looming silo room. The path they traversed was marred by unspeakable slaughter, the control and generator rooms bearing witness to the carnage. Dozens of fallen comrades lay in their wake, some beyond the reach of salvation. Those fortunate enough to still draw breath were directed to stay low and aid others if possible. The grim reality of their predicament intensified Archer's determination. The distant sounds of the silo doors beginning to close spurred Archer into action. He knew that if those colossal concrete barriers sealed shut, whatever nefarious scheme Claudius had concocted would proceed unimpeded. Archer refused to let that happen. Hurry! he shouted, urging his companions to quicken their pace. 
Rounding the final corner, they were met with the sight of the silo doors partially closed. Archer assessed the situation, realizing that with a determined sprint, he could slip through the narrowing gap. Running with unparalleled speed, Archer covered the distance. Twenty meters. Ten meters. The gap, though closing rapidly, was just wide enough for a man. Sliding to his knees, Archer propelled himself through, executing a swift roll on the other side. As he regained his footing, he noticed the two guards manipulating the doors. With ruthless efficiency, Archer dispatched them with four rapid shots from his rifle. Williamson, following suit, leapt through the gap sideways. However, a horrifying scream of agony pierced the air. Archer looked back to witness a heart-wrenching sight. Carothers had almost made it through but was caught by the closing doors, crushing his left foot from the ankle down. Automatic rifle fire erupted dangerously close, narrowly missing Archer. Swiftly eliminating the approaching commando with a shot to the head, Archer addressed Williamson. Get him out, he commanded as he loaded a fresh magazine. What are you going to do? Williamson asked amidst Carruthers' ear-deafening moans. Archer offered no reply, simply pushing the magazine into place before striding purposefully toward the shadows of the silo room. In his mind, there was no doubt. His sole purpose was clear. Whether it meant losing his own life, Archer was going to stop the Stanians. Springing through the next set of doors into the silo room, Archer confronted a perilous scene. Several Stanian commandos crouched next to the missiles, each holding C-4 in their hands. The realization struck Archer like a lightning bolt. They intended to detonate the missiles right where they stood. This posed a significant dilemma for him. One thing was for certain, though. He wasn't going to shoot at people holding explosives next to international ballistic nuclear missiles. The Stonian commandos, however, faced no such constraints. They could target Archer freely, and the imminent danger forced him to devise a strategy. To draw them away from the volatile missiles, Archer began backing away, all the while firing at the feet of the commandos. The shots landed far enough from the missiles to avoid triggering an explosion, but near enough to dissuade the commandos from taking accurate shots at him. Among the Stanian ranks, a formidable officer, presumably Major Otto Claudius, caught Archer's attention. The officer pointed menacingly in Archer's direction, barking orders in Latin. Archer didn't need to be as much of a polyglot as he was in order to comprehend Claudius's directive to kill Archer at all costs. Evading gunfire, Archer strategically retreated further into the rocky halls, luring the Stanian commandos away from the menacing missiles. As one of them took the bait and ventured into the shadows, Archer swiftly pulled the trigger, bringing the commando down. Another fell with a precise shot from a distance of 20 meters. However, the odds quickly turned against him as four more commandos emerged from behind machinery, unleashing automatic fire. He rolled into cover, but screamed in agony as something hot as a sauna stone burned through his calf. He had been shot before, but it wasn't one of those things you compare to riding a bike. It hurt like hell, but Archer clinched his teeth together and checked his magazine. Only three bullets left to contend with at least ten opponents. Frustration coursed through him, but amidst the chaos, a plan began to take shape. Crawling through a confined space under a water boiler-like machine, Archer pressed his hand into his bullet wound, coating it with blood. He then swept his bloodied hand onto the scalding hot surface of the machine. Rolling away into the shadows, he waited. Soon enough, two Stanian commandos approached the water boiler, AKs at the ready. Spotting the blood on the surface, one shouted for the other two to surround the area. With precision, Archer aimed and shot the boiler in a triangular pattern. Boiling hot water erupted, scalding the faces of the first two commandos. The others, affected by the splashes, became momentarily disoriented. Seizing the opportunity, Archer flipped his rifle and rushed towards the commandos. Using it as a makeshift baseball bat, he delivered a devastating home-run swing, smashing the first commando's skull in half. The second, already on the ground with his face nearly aflame, offered little resistance. 
The remaining two, nursing minor injuries, reached for their rifles hanging by their slings, but Archer was quicker with his sidearm. Six precise shots from his Glock echoed through the room, leaving both commandos crumpled on the floor, each with three more holes than seconds before. Clinging to his resilience, Archer again found himself in the line of sight from the menacing missiles. The Stanian commandos had temporarily abandoned their posts, likely either hunting him down or seeking ways to launch the missiles from the control panel. Two commandos by the large computer screen spotted him and opened fire. Reacting swiftly, Archer leaped to the ground, feeling a sharp pain as a ricochet struck the bottom of his right foot. Clenching his teeth once more, he crawled towards the fallen Stanians, using singular shots from his Glock to provide cover. Reaching the bodies, Archer grabbed an AK, rolled to a seated position, and unleashed an automatic burst towards the shooters. Both commandos took hits to the body and face, inadvertently dispatching the already jammed computer with stray bullets. Suddenly, a commando armed with a pistol emerged from behind the silos. He managed to fire one shot, but Archer, rising to a kneeling position, returned fire with deadly accuracy. The bullet struck the man's forehead in rapid succession, ending his threat. Archer was jealous. The man hadn't felt any pain. Archer winced in pain, two bullets lodged in his feet. However, he couldn't afford to dwell on it. Surveying the area with a quick glance, it appeared that the Stanians had been dealt with. Archer's first priority was to secure the missiles and get the sea four the hell away from them. Dragging himself towards the sea four on one foot without knowing which one he'd rather limp with, Archer quickly assessed the situation, confirming that none of the explosives had been set to detonate. Yet, anyway. A sigh of relief escaped him as he grabbed the first bunch off of the launching pad. However, before he could do so, a strong hand clamped onto the back of his neck and suddenly, Archer found himself airborne. In a flash, the concrete launching pad was far away and then very close. Way too close. The sensation of his front teeth and nose shattering overwhelmed him. As he lay there, wanting to cry out in pain, he turned onto his back and met the manic gaze of Otto Claudius, the Starnian officer who had evidently descended into madness. A long time ago, there was no grandiose speech or villainous monologue from Claudius who held Archer at gunpoint. Logic had long left Archer. Acting on sheer survival reflex, Archer kicked Claudius squarely in the groin, and in response, a gunshot echoed as the Jericho pistol discharged. A searing pain erupted in Archer's right shoulder, but he counted himself lucky to be alive. Despite the pain, Archer pressed on, grappling with Claudius over the stainless pistol. The struggle proved futile, so he resorted to kicking the firearm out of Claudius's grip. A third kick to Claudius's jaw followed, further aggravating the already excruciating pain in Archer's foot. The deranged Stanian, however, was undeterred, charging at Archer in a fit of madness. Anticipating the attack, Archer attempted to grapple with Claudius mid-air, partially softening the landing. However, Claudius retaliated by seizing Archer's lapel, attempting to choke him. Gasping for breath, Archer reached for his fallen pistol, but Claudius kicked it away. With no other option, Archer resorted to biting into Claudius's index finger, the taste of blood filling his mouth. Even as Archer bit harder, Claudius remained eerily silent, until Archer felt his broken teeth meet. Claudius gasped and backed away as his finger and hand separated. Seizing the opportunity, Archer spit out the finger, pushed Claudius away with a big kick, rolled to his feet, and launched a counterattack. Instead of lowering his head, he leapt towards Claudius, executing a sling blade like slam and bringing him to the ground. As they crashed to the floor, Archer secured a rear naked choke, squeezing with every ounce of strength he had left. Claudius fought back fiercely, clawing at Archer but determination fueled Archer's resolve. Claudius fought back less and less. Then he didn't fight back at all. To ensure the threat was eliminated, Archer snapped Claudius's neck in one direction, then the other. 
When he finally let go, Claudius's head had made a complete 180-degree turn. Exhausted, Archer lay on his back, pushing Claudius away, his breaths heavy and erratic. As if he hadn't been through enough, Archer suddenly heard Williamson's distressed voice. Archer, come here, quickly! The voice was filled with tears. Archer couldn't help but wonder if Williamson had finally cracked under the pressure. He himself was only starting to realize the Stanians had been defeated. He had been successful. But he couldn't celebrate as he realized Williamson's voice came from much closer than he thought. From somewhere by the computers and control panels instead of the direction of the room doors. Archer got to his knees, then to his feet, and started dragging himself towards Williamson's cries. What is it? Where's Carruthers? Is the door open? Archer asked, somewhat surprised at his own frustration. He saw Williamson's light head crouched over something, shaking it viciously. The door is open. Carruthers is okay. Ah, fuck no, baby, no, Williamson shouted. Archer stopped in his tracks. Baby? There could be only one person Williamson could be referring to. Archer jogged as fast as he could with two injured legs. Once he reached the control panel, he wished he never had. And there she was, Corporal Aisha Jennings, held in Williamson's arms on the floor by the control panel, with a utility knife in her chest. Her uniform was stained with blood. Archer crouched next to her. Those bright eyes of hers turned to him, shocking him. He thought she was gone. Archer? Yeah, it's me. Did you do it? Yeah, I did it. We did it. We won. I knew you would be successful. What happened? Archer didn't ask who did it. He already knew. Jennings looked back at him, understanding. There are two types of believers. Those who believe because of those they've lost, seeking solace, like me. And those who believe because of those they've wronged, seeking forgiveness, like him, Jennings said. The agony in her voice was unbearable. Who are you talking about? Williamson asked. He wasn't replied to. One day, at church, he told this to me, saying he was the first kind. But the way he said it, I knew he was the second kind. So today, when he came into work way before his shift, I felt something was off. I followed him down here, and here he met with the Stanians, and he did this to me. Jennings's voice cracked all the time. They could barely make out her words. She was in so much pain that she could barely feel it anymore. Archer felt his eyes filling up with tears from all kinds of pain. Promise me, Archer, Jennings whispered. Promise me that he won't get away with this, she continued. Archer nodded. I promise, Archer said, and nodded once more. Jennings smiled vaguely, her lips trembling slightly as if fighting against the pain that permeated every fibre of her being. She turned her head slowly towards Williamson, her eyes searching for solace and connection. I love you, Danny, she said, her voice barely above a whisper. The weight of those words hung in the air, carrying both the tenderness of affection and the inevitability of parting. Before Williamson could reply, she was gone. The room seemed to still, frozen in a moment of heart-wrenching finality. Williamson, overwhelmed by grief, grabbed her lifeless body, holding her as if trying to will life back into her. Uncontrollable sobs shook him, echoing the pain that gripped everyone in that dimly lit control room. Archer's eyes, normally sharp and vigilant, had turned to ice. He just stared. The pain in his feet had disappeared, replaced by an emptiness that seemed to extend beyond the physical. His mission to save the island, to save the world, had been completed. His purpose had been fulfilled. Now he had a different purpose. Vengeance. The spark of determination flickered in Archer's eyes as he rose. Archer's voice cut through the heavy silence of the control room, each word bearing the weight of command. Direct the Navy and our remaining personnel down here. Tell them to secure the missiles and C-4. Get Carruthers to medical and start organizing evacuation for all survivors. Get some power back in here. Find Huganaga and tell him what happened here. 
As Archer spoke, he crouched towards Jennings, his cold demeanor revealing the steel resolve that had replaced his previous mission-oriented determination. Williamson, still overwhelmed with grief, could only nod in acknowledgement, his voice betraying the pain that gripped his soul. Archer! It's an order, Archer interjected sternly as he grabbed the knife embedded in Jennings's chest. The room felt colder, the air heavy with the unspoken anguish of loss. Yes, sir, Williamson managed to utter, his voice shaking with emotion. Archer pulled the knife out of Jennings's chest. More blood rushed out, but it didn't make a difference at this point, although Archer would have spared Williamson from the sight if he felt he had a choice. He didn't. Archer examined the knife for a fleeting moment, the cold steel reflecting the stark reality of their situation. The amount of betrayal Archer felt was unbelievable. Everything that had happened, every life that had been lost, were thanks to the betrayal and greed of one man he had trusted. The puzzle pieces had fallen together. Without another word, Archer turned and walked away, leaving Williamson with his grief and the somber task of executing Archer's orders. Where are you going? Williamson's voice trembled with a mix of confusion and desperation. To return this knife, Archer replied. Chapter 19 Major Fulroy stood stoically at the edge of the cliffs, his figure outlined against the tumultuous backdrop of rain, darkness and a raging sea. The elements seemed to conspire against him, with rain pouring incessantly and the night swallowed by an impenetrable blackness. The waves below crashed against the rocks, echoing the tempest that brewed within Fulroy's mind. In his hand, he clutched a radio tightly, a lifeline to the elusive escape that seemed to be slipping away with each passing second. The path leading to the small dock below, a mere thirty metres away, was now submerged under the relentless assault of rising tide and stormy seas. Fulroy's raincoat, initially intended as a shield against the weather, had surrendered to the relentless downpour, leaving him soaked to the bone. His eyes, fixated on the churning sea, strained to discern any sign of the vessel that was supposed to whisk him away from this nightmare. Yet, the unforgiving darkness and driving rain concealed any hope of rescue. The sea roared in defiance, mirroring the turmoil that raged within Fulroy. Abruptly, the radio crackled to life, and a voice bearing a cold, detached tone cut through the storm symphony. Mr. Fulroy, we can't get to you. Fulroy's brows furrowed in disbelief and frustration. The hell you can't! I need to get the hell out of here, he retorted, his desperation evident in his voice. The storm is too wild, and besides, as far as we're concerned, our deal is off. You failed, Mr. Fulroy. Good day to you, the Stanian voice declared. The weight of those words settled on Fulroy like a leaden shroud. Betrayed and abandoned, he stood alone on the cliffs, rain-soaked and battered by the storm. The realization of the gravity of his failure and the treachery of his supposed allies sank in, leaving him to face the consequences of a plot gone awry in the unforgiving embrace of the tempest a taste of his own medicine. The storm raged on as Fulroy, consumed by rage and despair, flung the radio into the turbulent sea, its feeble signal devoured by the tempest. His scream reverberated through the storm, a futile expression of his frustration. Why? he shouted into the unforgiving night, a question cast into the wind with no expectation of an answer. However, a chillingly cold voice emerged from behind him, a voice he recognized all too well. You failed, Major. The words hung in the air, and Fulroy turned to face the speaker, his eyes locking onto the gaze of Romeo Archer. In Archer's hand gleamed a knife, a symbol of imminent reckoning. Fulroy greeted Archer with a twisted grin. Van Reek, this is a surprise. It was you all along, Fulroy, Archer said. You orchestrated the false alarms. You tried to have me killed. It was you who picked June Galleons to fix the facility's defences. God, it was right there and I missed it. 
You picked him, Archer shouted. You framed Gilroy as the traitor. No, you impersonated him and framed him and then murdered him. You kidnapped Rush's family and you stabbed him in the jail. Then you shot all the technicians, you let the Stanians in. You're responsible for all the dead, Archer tiraded. He glanced at the knife, then at the gravestone only a few meters away. You killed Aisha Jennings, he said. So now let me ask you, Fulroy. Archer put emphasis on the fact he called Fulroy a major no more. Why? Fulroy's grin persisted, but his eyes were full of logical guilt. Yet his demeanor hadn't changed. A poignant stillness settled over the graveyard as the storm raged on. Rain-soaked grass glistened under the tempest's fury, and the gravestones bore witness to the unfolding drama. The white church, a beacon of solemnity, stood stark against the enveloping darkness. Breaking the silence, Fulroy, his shoulders shaking, offered a wry smile. What can I say? He sighed, as if contemplating the weight of the years that had brought him to this moment. I served my country, year after year, taking orders from brass who wouldn't recognize dedication if it slapped them in the face. And where did it get me, sent to this godforsaken island, to rot away in obscurity? His gaze wandered over the rows of graves, the memories of countless lives lost, echoing the bitterness in his voice. Then came the divorce. She took whatever little reward I got from those years of service, Fulroy said. His tone had taken on a resentful edge, echoing the bitterness of a man who felt scorned by life. Fulroy's eyes, clouded with a mix of regret and defiance, met Archer's. So, when an opportunity for payback and a payday came my way, I seized it. I wasn't about to let the world keep kicking the shit out of me while I was down. The storm continued its relentless assault, a fitting backdrop to the turmoil within Fulroy's soul. And here we are, he concluded, the resignation evident in his tone. The graveyard, drenched in rain, bore witness to the clash of two men, both battered by life's hardships, standing at the precipice of a reckoning. In the aftermath of Fulroy's revelation, Archer found himself at a crossroads of emotions. The graveyard, a silent witness to the unfolding drama, echoed with the weight of the past and the present. Archer could have posed a dozen questions, delving into the intricate details of Fulroy's betrayal. Yet, he refrained. Everything that needed to be said had already been laid bare. In that moment, what lingered in the air was primal, an instinct that transcended words. The innate human drive to rectify wrongs, to confront the betrayals that had led them to this desolate graveyard. The storm continued to unleash its fury, a metaphorical reflection of the tempest within each man's soul. Without exchanging another word, Archer's gaze bore into Fulroy's eyes, a silent acknowledgement of the shared understanding that words could no longer mend the fractures between them. And here we are, Archer muttered. Fulroy's hand twitched towards his pocket, presumably reaching for his pistol. Archer, driven by an almost divine purpose, closed the distance with agility. Despite the searing pain in his feet, he pressed on a vessel of righteous retribution. Before Fulroy could draw his gun, Archer launched his knife towards him. However, Fulroy deftly evaded the blade, and with a swift motion, grabbed Archer's wrist, flipping him through the air. As they teetered dangerously close to the edge of the cliffs, Archer managed to avoid falling and retaliated by grabbing Fulroy's feet, pulling him to the ground. The knife remained in Archer's grip, and he attempted another strike, but Fulroy rolled away just in time. The knife, bouncing off Archer's weakened grasp, hit a nearby rock. Fulroy, seizing an opportunity, kicked Archer in the side of the face and grabbed a rock from the ground, attempting to deliver a lethal blow. Archer, though weakened, evaded the assault. Summoning the last of his strength, he charged at Fulroy, but his weakened state rendered the attempt feeble. Fulroy countered, bringing Archer down on his back and delivering a series of punishing blows to his jaw, dislocating it with a few brutal strikes. Once again, Archer found himself in a vulnerable position. 
Realizing the gun was in Fulroy's pocket, Archer reached for it, but Fulroy wisely backed away. In a desperate move, Archer kicked upwards, connecting with Fulroy's jaw. Fulroy, teetering on the edge of the cliff, managed to regain his balance. Archer contemplated charging and knocking Fulroy off the edge, but the risk of falling himself stayed his hand. In that moment of hesitation, Fulroy drew his pistol. Archer jumped and rolled into cover, and the first three shots found their mark on a nearby gravestone, sending fragments of rock flying that cut Archer's cheek. Archer, his face marred by rain, blood and determination, drew his pistol, fully aware that aiming in such conditions was near impossible. The silhouette of Fulroy vanished from his strained vision. A gunshot echoed through the storm, the bullet hitting a rock nearby, signalling that Fulroy too had lost sight of his prey. Moving as silently as the rain-soaked ground allowed, Archer crawled between gravestones, attempting to locate Fulroy. Blood and rain mixed, streaming into his eyes, forcing him to rub them frantically for even a semblance of visibility, like a windshield wiper at full speed. Suddenly, Fulroy's silhouette emerged from the dark, raising his pistol. Reacting instinctively, Archer rolled to his side and returned fire. The erratic shots from both men found their mark on gravestones, but a ricochet from Archer's shot seemed to graze Fulroy's arm, sending his weapon flying. Before Archer could capitalise on his advantage, his Glock malfunctioned, possibly due to the rain. Fulroy, seizing the opportunity, disappeared into the dense curtain of rain. Archer attempted to fire again, but the Glock failed him, uncharacteristically for the first time and in the worst possible moment. The storm raged on as Archer cursed, dropping his malfunctioning weapon and sprinting after Fulroy. As he reached the cliff's edge again, he heard rapid footsteps approaching from the side. Reacting swiftly, Archer sidestepped, narrowly avoiding Fulroy's attempt to throw him into the sea. However, Fulroy landed face first on the ground, conveniently next to the knife he had dropped earlier. Before Archer could capitalise on this advantage, Fulroy sprang back to his feet, confidently addressing his pursuer. It's been a long day for you, Van Rieg, Fulroy taunted. Just give up. I'll make it quick. You've proven yourself. Archer sighed, steadied his trembling feet, and raised his hand. Come on, Major, he said. You've got to prove yourself to me first, Archer grinned, turning the situation into a challenge. Fulroy snorted, but took Archer's words as an opportunity to redeem himself. Charging forward, he swung his knife frantically, and one of the swings cut the front of Archer's uniform, causing a burning sensation in his chest. Despite the pain, it wasn't enough to deter him. A brief pause for victory proved to be Fulroy's downfall. Changing his movement, Archer anticipated the hesitation and dodged Fulroy's attack. With a swift kick to Fulroy's knee, Archer forced the Major to crouch, and then, using his own knee, shattered Fulroy's nose. As Fulroy fell backward, Archer, feeble but determined, crashed on top of him. In the midst of the chaos, Fulroy attempted to raise the knife, but blood from his broken nose impaired his vision. Shocked and disoriented, Fulroy struggled to clear his eyes, providing Archer the opening he needed. In that critical moment, Archer decided he had had enough of this invasion. Seizing the knife from Fulroy's hand, he used both arms to drive the utility knife half-hilt deep into the treacherous Major's chest. And in that moment, it was over. For a moment, Archer simply gazed into the lifeless eyes of Fulroy. Then, exhaustion overwhelmed him. Rolling off the top of Fulroy, he crashed onto his back on the wet ground. Staring at the sky, Archer was indifferent to the fact that his eyes were filling with water and drops of blood. Above him, he saw the faces of those he had lost. Halaya's image stood out prominently. She wasn't lost, hopefully. He recalled the sensation of holding her in his arms. In that fleeting moment, adrenaline coursing through his veins, and fully aware that he was losing a considerable amount of blood, Archer found solace in the thought of Halaya's face being the last thing he would ever see. 
From a distance, the screech of tires reached his ears. Gradually, it transformed into Halaya's voice, urging him to come home safe. His eyes welled up. The world around him faded to black. Chapter 20 Two weeks after the Stanian invasion had devastated the island and the town of Finnis, signs of resilience and recovery were becoming evident. The rebuilding efforts were well underway, and the community, united under the makeshift roof of the newly reconstructed Tom's Bar, found solace and strength in each other's company. Tom, with a heartwarming smile, served beers to the villagers who had toiled throughout the day, creating an atmosphere of camaraderie that overshadowed the temporary appearance of the bar. The once shattered harbour, victim to relentless machine gun fire, was gradually emerging from the ruins as reconstruction efforts intensified. Additional army personnel from the mainland, along with Navy soldiers who had chosen to stay behind from aboard the ADS Nicholson, lent a helping hand. Nicholson itself, serving as a vessel of compassion, transported the wounded and the fallen back to the mainland. The island mourned the loss of 272 Antnian soldiers, including cherished figures like Corporals Jennings, Danvers and Carlson, Sergeants Gilroy and Michaels, and Captain Stiller. Over 700 were injured. Rush and Wellesby were likely to survive their injuries. Rush had been discharged. He had taken it gladly. Before he was loaded into the sick bay of the ADS Nicholson, he had vowed to take his family to the countryside and start farming pigs. Wellesby claimed he would eventually join them as he contemplated retirement. Sergeant Carruthers, despite having his left foot amputated, insisted on staying behind on the island. There he was, resiliently moving among the workers, directing the reconstruction efforts despite the challenges of navigating with only one leg. Building materials flowed in from the mainland, aiding in the transformation of the village into a semblance of its former self. World's Terminal was now under reconstruction. Colonel Huganaga stood in the midst of the parking lot and observed as workers reinforced the empty silos. The Hammerstone missiles, now relocated to prevent further threat, had served their lethal purpose, and the island's secret was no longer exclusive. The terminal was set to become a regular military base, with discussions even hinting at the establishment of an airfield. Huganaga, contrary to expectations, felt a sense of relief. The burden of being the one with the power to change the world with the push of a button was now someone else's responsibility. Basking in the warm embrace of the afternoon sun, he couldn't help but smile at the turn of events. It had been catastrophic. But oh, how much worse it would have been without the intervention of one extraordinary man. Colonel, sir, a voice called out from behind Huganaga. He turned to see Archer approaching on crutches, his collar freshly adorned. Lieutenant, Huganaga acknowledged, offering a nod of respect. Archer reciprocated with a nod and a courteous smile. Huganaga extended his hand, initiating a firm handshake. Congratulations on the promotion, Lieutenant, and of course the Medal of Honor. Archer's grin widened, his eyes expressing gratitude. All in a day's work, sir, quite literally. A chuckle escaped Huganaga. Well, it's a day's work worth celebrating. You've earned it. The moment lingered as the two officers shared a silent acknowledgement of the trials and triumphs that had brought them to this point. Stepping a bit closer, Huganaga adopted a more serious tone. Lieutenant Archer, I know World's Terminal is about to undergo a transformation into a rather mundane airbase, but I'd like you to stay on as my second in command. Archer's expression shifted, his gaze distant for a moment as he contemplated the weight of the proposition. I've grown fond of the island, sir, despite my initial, how would I put this, reluctance. But there's one more question I need to get an affirmative to before I can say yes. A raised eyebrow from Huganaga signalled curiosity. Well, Lieutenant, let's get moving then. I can't wait forever. With a nod exchanged between the two, Archer and Huganaga turned towards the cars. The sedan came to a halt at the edge of the harbour, the tyres crunching on the gravel. 
Huganagger cut the engine, and the two men sat in silence for a moment, gazing at the scene unfolding in front of them. The harbour, once a battleground, was now alive with activity. Workers bustled around, repairing boats and structures damaged during the invasion. Archer shifted uncomfortably in the passenger seat, eager to get out of the car. He might have been promoted to lieutenant and received a medal of honour, but his body still bore the scars of the recent event. He grabbed his crutches, steeling himself for the effort it would take to get out. As Archer swung the car door open, the salty sea breeze swept in, carrying with it the sounds of waves and distant construction. Huganaga stepped out as well, his eyes scanning the harbour for a familiar face. There, amidst the workers, stood Marjorie's, a grin forming on her face as she recognised his friend and superior officer. Archer hobbled toward the dock, determination visible in each step despite the evident pain. His crutches clicked rhythmically against the ground. Huganaga followed closely, a knowing smile on his face as he witnessed the reunion about to unfold. The small boat bobbed gently by the dock, its motor humming as a sailor skillfully guided it into place. As the boat settled, a figure emerged from within, catching Archer's eye. The woman was a vision in white, her dark hair cascading over her shoulders. She wore a summer dress and a hat that shaded her face. Anyone witnessing the scene would agree that she was the epitome of beauty. But to Archer, Halaya was more than just beautiful. She was everything. In that moment, the world faded away, leaving only the two of them. Forgetting his crutches, Archer broke into a limping run, a mixture of pain and excitement etched on his face. Halaya, equally eager, kicked off her slippers and met him halfway. She jumped into his open arms, her white dress fluttering around her as they embraced. Archer winced, the strain evident in his expression. Oh my God, am I hurting you? Halaya gasped with concern. No, no, Archer reassured her with pain in his voice. After the chaos two weeks earlier, Archer had opened up to her on the phone, revealing every dark secret and untold story, and she had listened without judgment, accepting him for who he was. Now, as they stood face to face, Archer could see the sincerity in her eyes. She had chosen him, flaws and all. The air around them seemed to still as they locked eyes, sharing a moment of profound connection. Archer, aware of the gravity of the question he was about to ask, couldn't help but feel a twinge of nervousness. He knew the pain he was about to endure, but he also knew it was a pain worth bearing. This is going to hurt like hell, Archer admitted, his tone sincere as he prepared to ask a question that held more weight than any battle. It's a little awkward asking you to help me with this, so bear with me, Archer added, lowering himself to one knee. The sudden hush that fell over the surrounding crowd indicated that everyone had become an inadvertent spectator. Halaya's eyes widened, her hand instinctively covering her mouth as realization dawned. Time seemed to stretch as Archer prepared to utter the words that would change their lives. Oh my God, Halaya gasped in astonishment, the emotion clear in her voice. Archer, despite the physical pain he felt, couldn't help but smile. Will you... he began, but his words were interrupted by Halaya's affirmative yes. Swiftly, she helped him rise to his feet, and the two shared a passionate kiss. The harbour erupted into applause, the sound echoing across the calm sea. The workers, soldiers and villagers who had witnessed the scene clapped and cheered, celebrating not only the joyous news of the engagement, but also their new folk hero and the resilience and rebuilding of the island. Among the onlookers, Colonel Huganaga stood, clapping slowly. I guess that's an affirmative on both fronts. A wry smile played on his lips as he muttered to himself. The joy of the newly engaged couple and the ongoing reconstruction echoed across the harbour, blending with the sounds of waves and the promise of a future that had weathered the storm. Everything Archer had gone through felt fine as he looked into the eyes of his lover. And in that moment, World's Terminal had another meaning. It was as if there was nothing but them. Forever, in that passing moment,
Afterward, and thanks. I've written a lot of shit, good and bad, but it's quite an experience writing a full-length novel. First of all, I want to thank my English and Finnish teachers for always encouraging me to write more and more. I want to thank Osiris Rangewood for always and forever inspiring me and always pushing me to be better. I want to thank Nathan Tarver, Paulie J.C. and Thomas Sandford for their amazing response times and never-relenting skill to say wow to anything I do. I want to thank fellow author, an amazing author at that, Richard Clemens for all the great discussions and ideas. I want to thank my family for always confirming my creative genius, especially my brother, Eddie Cole, who is and always has been my biggest fan, which is a little dumb because he's twice as good a writer as I am. And I want to thank everyone reading or listening. I'm glad you did, and I hope you're glad to know I'm not done, not by a long shot.